Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Mr. President. I move a call of the Senate. A call of the Senate has been moved and properly sustained. Will the sergeants please close the doors, allow no senators to leave, and return those who are absent from the chambers. Senators, Baisley, Bridges, Buckner, Coleman, Cutter, Danielson, Exum, Fields, Gardner, Janal, Gonzalez, Hansen, Henriksen, Jaquez Lewis, Kirkmeyer, Kolker, Liston, Lundin, Marchman, Moreno, Mullica, Pelton B, Pelton R, Priola, Rich, Roberts, Rodriguez, Simpson, Smallwood, Sullivan, Van Winkle, Will, Winter, Zenzinger, Coleman, Cutter, Gardner, Kirkmeyer, Lundin, Smallwood, Van Winkle, Will, Winter, Coleman, Gardner, Kirkmeyer, Lundin, Smallwood, Van Winkle, Winter, Coleman, Gardner, Kirkmeyer, Lundin, Smallwood, Van Winkle, Winter, Coleman, Gardner, Kirkmeyer, Lundin, Smallwood, Van Winkle, Winter, Coleman, Gardner, Kirkmeyer, Lundin, Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the call be raised. The motion is to raise the call. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the call is raised. Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate take up the following bills on special order second reading consent at the hour of 3.22 p.m. House bills 1135 and 1265. Will the, will the clerk please mark Kev, uh, Senator Van Winkle as excused? Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Mr. President. I withdraw the motion. Committee reports. 
May 4, 2023, the Committee on Finance, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1020 be amended as follows, and as so amended, be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. May 5, 2023, the Committee on Appropriations, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1065 be referred to the Committee of the Whole of Favorable Recommendation. House Bill 1069 be referred to the Committee of the Whole of Favorable Recommendation. House Bill 1112 be referred to the Committee of the Whole of Favorable Recommendation. House Bill 1135 be referred to the Committee of the Whole of Favorable Recommendation. With a recommendation, it be placed on the consent calendar. House Bill 1147 be amended as follows, and as so amended, be referred to the Committee of the Whole of Favorable Recommendation. House Bill 1189 be referred to the Committee of the Whole of Favorable Recommendation. House Bill 1198 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with Favorable Recommendation. House Bill 1253 be referred to the Committee of the Whole of Favorable Recommendation. House Bill 1257 be amended as follows, and as so amended, be referred to the Committee of the Whole of Favorable Recommendation. House Bill 1260 be amended as follows, and as so amended, be referred to the Committee of the Whole Favorable Recommendation. House Bill 1265 be referred to the Committee of the Whole Favorable Recommendation with a recommendation be placed on the consent calendar. House Bill 1273 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with Favorable Recommendation. House Bill 1277 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with Favorable Recommendation. House Bill 1281 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with Favorable Recommendation. In response to a request from the House for a conference committee on House Bill 1216, the Senate conferees are Senators Danielson as the chair, Hawkins Lewis, and Kirkmeyer on the first conference committee on House Bill 1216. Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate take up the following bills on special orders, second reading consent at the hour of 3.24 p.m. House Bills 1135 and 1265. The motion is that the Senate take up House Bill 1135 and 1265 on special orders consent at the hour of 3.24 p.m. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the motion is adopted. The Senate will take up House Bills 1135 and 1265 on special orders consent at the hour of 3.24 p.m. Special order, second reading of bills, consent calendar, Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. President. I request that the Senate resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for consideration of special order, second reading of bills, consent. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion is adopted, and the Senate will resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for the consideration of the special order, second reading of bills, consent, and Senator Gonzalez will take the chair. The committee will come to order and the coat rule is relaxed. Will the clerk please read the title of all of the bills on the special order, second reading of bills, consent calendar. House Bill 1135, Representatives Michelson, Janae, and Burt, Senators Zenzinger and Smallwood concerning the offense classification for indecent exposure in view of a minor and in connection therewith making an appropriation. House Bill 1265, Representatives Lukens and Belasco, Senators Marchman and Will concerning the creation of a born to be wild special license plate to raise funds for non-lethal means of mitigating conflict with gray wolves and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move for the passage of all the bills on the special orders, second reading consent calendar, which includes House Bills 1135 and 1265. There are no committee reports. Is there any discussion on any of the bills? Senator Rich. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before the body is the adoption of the bills on the special order, second reading of bills, consent cal calendar. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the bills are adopted. <laughs> Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move the committee rise and report. The motion is to rise and report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and we will rise and report.
The Senate will come to order. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. President. The committee met and considered a pair of bills. Ms. Cole, will you please read the report? Mr. President, your committee of the whole begs leave to report. It has had under consideration the following attached bills, being the second reading thereof, and makes the following recommendations are on. House Bill 1135, House Bill 1265, passed on second reading, and ordered, revised, and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the report. The motion uh, is for the adoption of the Committee of the Whole report. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 34 ayes, zero noes, zero absent, one excused, the Committee of the Whole report is adopted. <laughs> House bills 1135 and 1265 pass on second reading in order to revise and place on the calendar for third reading and final passage. And members, the coat rule is relaxed for the rest of the night and Ooh. even the wee hours of tomorrow morning, if we're still here. <laughs> Majority Leader Moreno. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. I move uh, the Senate take up the following bills on special orders, second reading, at the hour of 3.29 p.m. House bills 1065, 1069, 1112, 1147, 1189, 1198, 1253, 1257, 1260, 1273, 1277, and 1281. The motion is that the Senate take up the bills listed by the Majority Leader and on the special order second reading of the bill's calendar that has been distributed. This requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. The Senate will take up those bills on special orders at the hour of 3.29 p.m. Special orders. Second reading of bills. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for consideration of special orders second reading of bills. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. The Senate will resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for the purpose of uh, special orders second reading of bills. And Senator Gonzalez will take the chair. The committee will come to order. The coat rule is relaxed. Uh, Ms. Cole, will you please read the title to House Bill 1065. House Bill 1065, Representative Story and Prenti, Senator Marchman, concerning the scope of the Independent Ethics Commission's jurisdiction over ethics complaints against local government officials and employees, and in connection with expanding the Independent Ethics Commission's jurisdiction to include school districts and special districts and making an appropriation. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move um, HB 1065. To the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this bill is a bill that will add to our um, constitutionally defined Independent Ethics Commission oversight members of school boards as well as special districts and their first line of appointments. So the superintendent, the fire chief, that kind of um, a person. So, so what this bill will do is ensure that people who are covered by the code of ethics that we are all covered by, that's already in statute, um, are also covered by the IEC in, in case there's a violation of that code of conduct. Um, We've had a lot of conversation about um, whether a person should have standing in order to file a complaint. Standing being maybe you have a vested interest, maybe you are a citizen, a property tax payer, um, maybe your kid goes to a school district and so you have a vested interest. Um, 
At this point, we've decided not to go that path yet because um, that is not how the constitutional Article 29 is set out. It, it, it subjects every um, anybody can bring a complaint against us, and so we would do the same for others. So I know we're going to have some conversation, so I will um, end there, but um, looking forward to hearing what my colleagues have to say about this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Marchman. Senator Pelton B. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> so I heard this in committee. And this is my concern. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the sponsor for bringing it, and thank you for having discussions um, all during this time. But um, one of the things that are my concern is is that these school boards already follow a code of conduct that they're bound to. That when they then when they are when they become elected, they have a code of conduct that people can have ways to complain to their school board about certain codes of conduct that they have to follow, uh, uh, they have to follow as a school board member. The other thing that bothers me about this is that <clears throat> I know when you go to the IEC, it's supposed to be confidential. These are volunteers that are on the school board. These are volunteers that are on your special district boards. And sometimes these uh, n confidential, confidential um, complaints come in that aren't so confidential and sometimes they get out. And I don't want to trash the volunteers that get on these boards because they are volunteers. We, I mean, it's already hard enough to find people in your communities to run for a school board or uh, um, a non-paid position in a school board. It's like the most thankless job you can have, but these people really care about their students that they're running at that school. So I just, I'm concerned about this bill hurting that. Um, I'm also concerned about, and we talked about standing, I'm also concerned about maybe somebody in Logan County saying, oh, they're not doing something right over at Steamboat Springs, so we're gonna come put a complaint on that school from Logan County. I think you should have standing or, or have some sort of reason why you're doing that in your uh, communities. And I think that, that that is something that we have been discussing. And, and I know the good Senator from Loveland's been discussing that with me and I appreciate that. But I just, I just have, a, um, I have a bad feeling about this bill and I'm just asking for a no vote. So thank you. Sen Senator Baisley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I've, I have uh, terrific concerns about this uh, bill as being a, uh, yet another overreach by us, by this uh, body, into what is a local authority, and appropriately so. Um, quite a few years ago, Article 9 of the Colorado State Constitution that we're sworn to uphold um, was created, Article 9, which covers education, um, starts out very generally on the supervision of schools through the Board of Education and says that the general supervision of public schools of the state shall be vested in a Board of Education whose powers and duties shall be as now or hereafter prescribed by law. Said board shall consist of a member of each congressional district of the state and so on. Um, said the members of the board shall serve without compensation, shall be reimbursed, okay. Uh, the commissioner of education shall be appointed by uh, the Board of Education and not be included in the classified service of the state. Interesting as it starts to, to show a release right there of the centralized control, um, buzzing down to the bottom of, of Article 9, um, describes in school districts these two very key items that our duty as General Assembly shall, by law, provide for organization of school districts of convenient size, in each of which shall be established a Board of Education to consist of three or more directors to be elected by the qualified electors of the district, and then said director shall have control of the instruction in the public schools of their respective districts. And then the final section on, on textbooks says neither the General Assembly nor the State Board of Education shall have power to prescribe textbooks to be used in this public schools. Just the tenor of all this is 
we as a, as the general assembly we establish the the geographical boundaries of school districts across the state to serve the populations and then we step away because there are local sensibilities local cultures local communities of interest and so on local industries that are that are predominant in each of the areas and it is there those communities authority to elect amongst themselves the folks who run, who operate those school boards. Those school boards hire the superintendent. The superintendent uh, hires uh, principals, and, and principals hire the teachers, and, and that's how the hierarchy goes. That's the, the chain of command, but the chain of command ultimately stops with not us and not, not a, a, a code of ethics, a civil an ethics board in Denver, but it ultimately uh, stops with the people who live in the geographical boundaries of that school district. They hold that superintendent accountable, who, and they hold those the school boards uh, directors accountable. They are, of course, alternately elected uh, to four-year terms so they can be swapped out if they're not doing the job, if the citizens are not happy, and they have uh, school board meetings openly all the time, and as we hear constantly, they are, uh, those, those become very animated uh, events, those become very animated conversations between the citizens and the, uh, and the school board members, as it should be. We should not be reaching down and inserting ourselves from Denver into Woodland Park, into Chafee County, into uh, Leadville. We, that is not our role to do. That is an overreach, and I believe that it flies directly in the face of what's intended in, uh, in our state constitution. I believe for us to uphold our oath of office, we need to maintain that spirit within the, the state constitution and leave those folks to, to work things out on a local level and not believe that we are have, have some kind of superior judgment over them operating things at a local level. So I strongly urge uh, a no vote on this bill. Thank you. Senator Marcus. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to my colleagues from Woodland Park and Logan County, Sterling. Um, and you're right. I'm going to read what the I'm going to read what the Constitution says. It says any person from South Carolina, from Colorado, from Leadville, from Woodland Park may file a written complaint with the Independent Ethics Commission asking whether a blah 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 local government official or government employee has failed to comply with this article. The article being the Ethics Commission. You do have 12 months to do it. Um, so these people are certainly elected. Um, we've all been elected, so we know what that's like. There's a campaign to run. There are contributors to your campaign. Um, there's money involved. And then you take an oath of office and you decide that you're going to put yourself out there as a public official running big budgets across our state. And so you are held accountable to that same code of conduct and this ethics. So these are not volunteers. These are elected officials. They are the top employee only. We're not going to be talking about principals and directors and that type of a thing. Literally the only employee is the first in the chain of command. Um, and then in terms of standing, again, I just wanna say that any person may file. So they don't even have to be in our ethics commission. Um, if they get a complaint that is from another state, by law, they have to look at it to, to judge the merits of it. So um, I appreciate the conversation, and um, I urge an I vote on this important bill. Senator Baisley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question for the sponsor. Would this ethics commission be the same one that has been um, unconstitutionally picking on one of uh, Denver's uh, 
small business operators and fighting him all the way up to the uh, U.S. Supreme Court where our the, the Civil Rights Commission loses because they are violating his constitutional rights. Senator Marchman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I was on the phone yesterday with the head of the IEC, and he is not in a position to speak about any of the current processes and cases that are um, in place. But, um, you know, the Tina Peters, he was able to speak about, that already happened. There were three that um, came in. One of them he was able to speak to us about, but the other two we couldn't. So I, I'm sorry that that's not something I get to know about. Um, Senator uh, Baisley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, that's an example of, of uh, what I'm talking about. It, there's not some superior wisdom that comes from this building or from Denver superior to uh, what happens in, in uh, Senate District 4. So I take offense to the idea that we will have some kind of a commission that's structured here that's going to oversee the, the sensibilities, uh, the ethics of rural Colorado and, uh, and make judgment from afar, especially when the track record is so abysmal. Um, actually carrying something all the way to the Supreme Court and losing because they were trying to go for uh, an ethics violation when in fact they're uh, violating themselves, violating um, a small business operator's constitutional uh, First Amendment rights in the first place. So the wisdom is lacking. We should not be arrogantly putting together uh, in Colorado or in Denver a centralized power to oversee folks who do just fine on their own. Now, there, there's some, some messiness for sure, but the messiness is quickly overcome through uh, the subsequent election, and those local communities deal with their issues. They don't need to have us overriding them and telling them that, hey, we all know better than you, country bumpkins. So this is just not a good idea. It is, frankly, an un-American idea. Let's not do this. Senator Baisley. Un-American, please do not impugn the motives of any of the members in this body. If you disagree with the policy, that is one thing. Senator Baisley. Unconstitutional is un-American. That's where my opinion stems from. Thank you. Senator Marchman. Thank you, and I think that my colleague from Woodland Park maybe confusing the independent ethics commission that Colorado voted on with the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. They're different. So, okay, good. So I just, so I just wanted to impart some wisdom on that. Um, I'd urge an I vote. Leader Lundeen. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I rise in opposition to House Bill 1065. Um, I'm curious, question one is, I'm curious as to the motivations, the why um, we're doing this. Um, I didn't hear in the presentation of the bill, I heard an explanation of how it functions, and I appreciate that and agree that that is how it would function, but I, I don't, um, didn't hear a screaming need. And, and the reason why that's critically important in my mind is this, it is hard to find individuals who are willing to give up their time to run for instance, and this is critically important because one of the groups of individuals controlled by this would be school board members. It's hard to find individuals who are willing to give up of their time and talent and energy to serve on a local school board. And it's hard because um, Inevitably, in addition to the time you put in, you run into a neighbor in the grocery store who's frustrated with you for a policy decision you've made or a, a vote you took or, or an idea you had or, uh, quite frankly, a budget you voted for or voted against. And so recruiting and keeping individuals engaged in that first and I would argue most important um, tier of electoral politics in Colorado is already very, 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 very difficult. And you, for those of you that have been in the chamber with me for more than a year or two, you've heard me 
Every time we get a school board member sitting on the benches here in the Senate or up in the gallery praising them and saying, it is my considered opinion that the most important, the most honorable, the heroes of electoral politics in Colorado are the individuals on the local school boards. Well, I am troubled and concerned of why we're choosing to do this to create one more risk, if you will, one more threat. I would argue, ultimately, the weaponization of one more item against those people that it's already so hard to recruit them into the, to the job. Now, I'm going to guess any of you that have served in politics and demonstrated any leadership of any kind have probably encountered in one way or another, either as a party to, or as an observer, or someone who was supporting another individual through the process, have been engaged with or seen what the IEC, the Independent Ethics Commission process looks like. You heard from the sponsor just moments ago in the well. We reached out to talk with them, and they can't tell us anything about anything that's going on right now. Well, that's true. That's exactly the way the process works. And so what that does is it creates an environment where for political reasons, an individual can lodge an ethics complaint against a member of a school board or a member of a special district. And there's a newspaper story because inevitably when for political reasons, somebody and this could be somebody from North Carolina who works for an organizer, organization that is interested in influencing the way things go forward in, in school boards in Colorado. Or they could be from North Dakota or Virginia or California. doesn't matter. as drafted. Anybody who wants to put their thumb on the scale of the way school board elections look in Colorado, they can use this tool. It's easily weaponized. Many of those of you who've been in politics for more than a year or two have experienced exactly how this happens, one way or another, against those individuals. It's not even that neighbor that uh, you, the school board member encounters in the grocery store that's frustrated with them over the votes they took. It's somebody outside the state who thinks, you know, we, our organization, is going to meddle and one of the tools we're going to use to meddle as an independent expenditure committee trying to influence Colorado School Board elections is ethics investigations. We are going to put a dark cloud of suspicion over the head of one of those school board members. Well, that's what this bill does. Now, we all live with that potential, and I will be candid. For political reasons, I was exonerated. Never read about the exoneration in the newspaper. But for political reasons, an ethics complaint was dropped against me. I heard about it from a reporter. Because the second thing that happened after the ethics complaint was filed was the release of the information to the media upon the head of the accused. But the accused can't find out what's going on. Now, we all chose to get into this game of politics at this level. Um, someone once said, politics ain't beanbag. It can be a blood sport at times. And so we expect and are prepared for and deal with and navigate. And quite frankly, I navigated through that fine. I knew that it was false on the face. It had no merit. It was dismissed. But there was a dark cloud of suspicion that followed me for a period of time. And in some people's minds, I'm sure it still follows today. That's just plain wrong when you're talking about individuals who are volunteering to participate in their local school board because they care about their kids and their neighbor's kids and the kids across town. This bill has that potential. Now, you say, well, Lundeen, we got to do something. Well. Those school board members are already subject to the same codes of ethics that we are, the exact same codes of ethics. And if you don't like what they're doing, you can file civil, criminal. You can file any action you want. 
We don't need to add an additional easy to tap, easy to weaponize tool. That, in my estimation, is what this particular bill is about. So we all, it's easy to say, here's what the bill does. We all believe in ethics. Let's do this. That's the first order effect. Sure, agree with that. Completely agree with that. The dark side of this is an IEC out of North Carolina is seeking to influence the D, pick your number, 18, 22, 36 school board election and that IEC, Independent Expenditure Committee, out of North Carolina realizes as a strategy they can cast a dark cloud of suspicion over the head of their opponent candidate, their opponent board member they want to oust. And this is the tool they use to do it. So I think the policy is broadly mistaken. I think there are things that could be done to tune it up, to maybe make it a little bit more palatable. How about we say you have to actually at least live in Colorado? Better yet, you have to pay taxes in the jurisdiction of the particular school board that you want to file the complaint against. There is an amendment at the desk. Ms. Cole, will you please read L20 to 1065? Amendment L020 by Senator Pelton B. and Ryan Gross Bill, page 4, left at line 1, insert D to have standing to bring a complaint Senator against. Senator Lundin. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I move Amendment L020 to House Bill 1065. To the amendment. Amendment's pretty simple. It's as I just stated. It says to, to have standing, and you know, that's a legal term, to bring a complaint against special district official, special district employee, school district official, or school district employee. Those are the folks who would be captured up, swept up into this new law. The person asserting the complaint must be a property taxpayer or resident in the special district or school district or attend a school in the school district that is related to the subject of the complaint. Just bring it home. It's not the IEC in North Carolina that should be filing the complaint. It should be somebody who actually has meaningful, I would say, skin in the game. The lawyers use the word standing. You ought to be a participant in the conversation. If you want to upset what's going on in that board, boy, it ought to come home to roost in your front yard or in your child's classroom. You should actually have standing. I urge your support of Amendment L020. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, let me look at it. I urge a no vote on L020. And let me explain why. Um, when voters in November of 2006 voted on Article 41 and created the Independent <coughs> Ethics Commission, they did so specifically so that any person constitutionally can file a complaint with them asking where a public official is out of line with the ethics. So the intent of the ballot measure that passed by the citizens of Colorado um, are very clear that any person may file a written complaint. So I urge your no vote on L020. Minority Leader Lundin. Thank you very much. Again, a description of what the process is. Let's talk to the motivations the why. Let's answer the question why. All right? It's in the Constitution that way, permissive. It seems that we now, if we're going to pass this item which can be weaponized, are going to do that, perhaps we should tune it up. Make that political weapon smaller, if you're going to allow it. Make it specific. So I absolutely acknowledge and agree. Amendment 41, like it, love it, dislike it, hate it, whatever your relationship is with Amendment 41. Um, as a sidebar, I would say it's done more to break down the collegiality of the General Assembly than any other single instrument could have possibly done, but that's an entire different sidebar conversation. 
regardless of your perspective on Amendment 5041, the policy question before us right now is why would we choose to do things that have certain outcomes and certain effects? My urging of you is let's keep this narrow. If it's about hometown politics, let's let it be hometown politics. Let's not let, and I'm being relatively candid, there are big, moneyed, second most powerful political influence in, the, in democratic contributions in America, teachers unions. They seek to influence elections, not just in the hometown, but across the country. When they see something happening they don't like that could catch fire because parents love it, do what they can to shut it down. Best way to do that is control the governance structure to block it out. So providing permission for big national organizations, it's that independent expenditure committee, it's meaningless, it's, it's hypothetical, it doesn't exactly exist or doesn't actually exist anywhere except in our minds now since I've put it there to influence an election in Colorado, specifically a school board election in Colorado, it makes sense to local, keep it local, make it local. I'm giving you an actual argument as to why this amendment would make sense. I acknowledge that in fact the Constitution is permissive, but that's not an argument against making the standing a local matter. Um, I urge your support for an uncontested amendment. Senator Henriksen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, you know, I find a lot of the arguments that we just heard uh, pretty compelling. And if the good senator from Monument wants to work with me in the interim on IEC reform, I am happy to do so. But to this issue, I, I want to take this from another angle. I want to look not at a North Carolina-based IEC, but because we're talking, let's say we're talking about a school board, and school boards and school districts have, make a lot of contracts with external organizations and external companies, and because they're at the local level, I think that there is a certain ease of familiarity with a lot of the individuals or companies that you may be contract with. There might be more of an availability for there to be contracts where there might be personal interests involved. So what if, and this is purely hypothetical, as there's, there's you know, in, in movie sense, you know, all characters are fiction, but what if I, as somebody who lives in Pueblo, I'm aware of a, the actions of a board member in District 70, not the district that I reside in, not a district that I own property and pay taxes in, but a district very nearby and where I have several friends in and know a lot of people. And what if I know that a member of that board is pushing the board in the direction of giving contracts to a business that he might have undisclosed financial stake in. Under this amendment, that very, very legitimate ethics complaint would be automatically dismissed. And that's exactly what we're trying to get at with the bill. So I ask for a no on this amendment. Leader Lundin. She did recognize, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. I was fumbling with my paper and with my hearing loss, I didn't hear you. Um, so the question was posed, what if, what if you knew about somebody who's doing something bad 
um, and, and you're in a neighboring district and, and you, can't, you don't have standing based on what this amendment would require, well, then I would say you, you, you can file a complaint. You could take direct personal action because that individual is subject to the code of ethics already. That's one pathway. Second pathway, you could contact and interact with somebody in the district who has standing. Say, hey, look, here's the evidence I have. It's probably important to you. Why don't you investigate this a little bit? Become familiar with it yourself. Since you have standing, if you think it's got merit, then bring it. You can just take it forward. So again, two simple answers to one reasonable question. Again, no argument to oppose Amendment 020. I urge your support based on logic, reasoning, good policy making. I urge your support of the uncontested Amendment 20. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before the body is the adoption of L20. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. The noes have it. L20 fails. <laughs> Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, here we go. Since everybody likes to quote the Constitution, I thought I would call up Article 29 of the Constitution because you know, I have the same questions. People who are on school boards, rec boards, library boards, fire boards, sanitation boards, water district boards, they're not bored. They, they go to these boards, they volunteer their time, they spend a lot of time, especially on a school board. Man, that, that could be a full-time job. They spend a lot of time, they volunteer, they don't receive compensation. They don't receive compensation. And for that, we're gonna run a bill that says someone can go file a frivolous lawsuit against you. And you don't even know about it. You don't even know that a frivolous lawsuit or that a lawsuit, or that a, I'm not lawsuit, I'm sorry, a complaint, that a complaint has been filed against you. You don't know. The only time you find out if you're the person who is subject of the complaint is if they decide, the Ethics Commission decides that it's not frivolous. Then you find out. But as already stated by the good senator from Monument, you know who does know? The person who filed the complaint. Do you know who's not subject to confidentiality? The person who filed the complaint. Do you know when a lot of these complaints are filed? Right before election time. Or if you're having a situation where you're not getting along with maybe your fellow board of county commissioner and they wanna figure out a way to get you either recalled or off the board of county commissioners, make sure that you don't get reelected even though maybe that's a couple years out but they know that what's at heart to you is your ethics and your integrity, gosh, they'll go file one. And it's happened. So the same thing could happen with school board members or during an election. So we've had that, we've had that discussion and I could go on more on that because it, again, it just doesn't make sense that you know, and this is where I started going to the Constitution, but it doesn't make sense that people who serve on these water boards and on these school boards, park boards, recreational boards, hospital boards, cemetery district boards, they self-nominate. They actually stand up and say, yes, pick me, vote for me. I wanna be on this board and spend all this time and volunteer and not receive any compensation Sometimes, sure, sometimes they might get a per diem. Sometimes they might get travel expenditures, you know, depending on how big the county is or how big the district is, how far people have to go. So they might get mileage. But basically, they're not being compensated. <coughs> they're volunteers. They volunteer to be part of their community. So this would be a really good way to make sure you don't get enough volunteers. 
some of you probably weren't around back, I think it was like 1993, 1994, in that time frame, there was a um, ballot initiative that passed that put in term limits. And wow, the Special Districts Association was up in arms because their board members are volunteers and they were already having a hard time, a difficult time, getting enough people to be on the board. And then all of a sudden they put in term limits? I mean, the only saving grace in that ballot initiative was is that the district could alleviate, could eliminate the term limits by another vote. But you had to go spend money on an election to vote to say, yes, these people who have volunteered, we can't find anybody else to volunteer. Because a lot of times, um, there's nobody running against them. I mean, we have to think statewide here, not just in some of these front range counties where you've got these huge populations. I want you to start thinking about school districts that are out on the Eastern Plains or down in the San Luis Valley or, you know, over in Dove Creek. Most of you probably don't know where that is. I'm sure there are a couple of you in here who do, but it's over on the Western Slope. And they don't have a lot of people who want to volunteer because they don't want to have their neighbors ticked off at them. They don't want to have their neighbors yelling at them. They don't, they don't want to volunteer. So we couldn't, they couldn't find people to sit on their boards. So at least that amendment had where you could get out of it. But this, this says everybody, everybody who wants to volunteer, man, you are subject to an ethics violation, to a filing complaint. I mean, start thinking where, where you live. And some of these school boards, or how about the water board, or the sewer board, the sanitation board, when they raise fees, and their neighbors get really upset, especially after you repealed Gallagher and now their property taxes are going up. <laughs> I mean, seriously. They get extremely upset over water fees going up. And you end up losing a lot of friends when you're on some of these boards. As you all know, as elected officials, you don't get elected to make friends. You get elected and you lose friends. And you get a lot of ugly complaints and a lot of ugly things said about you and your kids are subject to it and grandkids. And yet here we are opening them up, a volunteer on a board receives no compensation to anyone in the world can file an ethics complaint on them, anybody. I mean, think about the internet and think about all the stuff that gets tweeted out. So somebody sitting someplace at home in their pajamas going through their tweets could decide, hey, I don't like what that person did in that, in that district, in that school board, and go file a complaint on them. And then they can start making news about it all over the internet, all over the Twitter account, all over Facebook, all over any social media platform. Good thing we had that other bill passed. But anyway. So here's the thing, since we're quoting the Constitution, let's be clear what the Constitution says with regard to who can and cannot have an ethics complaint filed on them. Now, you know, when you read through the Constitution, you think, wow, and I'm reading definitions. Well, let me just read the preamble or pre section one, purposes and findings. People of the state of Colorado hereby find and declare that the conduct of public officers Members of the General Assembly, local government officials, and government employees must hold the respect and confidence of the people. And so I'm sure you're all sitting there thinking, okay, local, local government officials means school boards, means the fire district board. A public officer, well, that could be pretty much anybody in public office, right? That's what we're thinking. Or at least that's what the sponsor's thinking. And then it talks about how government employees, all these folks, local government officials, members of the General Assembly, public officers, that they shall carry out the duties for the benefit of the people of the state. They therefore shall avoid conduct that is in violation of their public trust or that creates a justifiable impression among members of the public that such trust is being violated great words to live by. 
any effort to realize personal financial gain through public office or other than compensation provided by law is a violation of that trust. To ensure the propriety and to preserve public confidence, they must have the benefit of specific standards to guide their conduct and of a, and of a penalty mechanism to enforce those standards. Well, then you're thinking, okay, that must mean school boards, school board members. That must mean, I mean, after all, it did say the conduct of public officers, members of the General Assembly, so all of us, local government officials and government employees. So you think that, you would almost think that means everyone. Until you get to definitions. And here's what's in the Constitution. Government employee means any employee, including independent contractors of the state executive branch, the state legislative branch, a state agency, a public institution of higher education, or any local government, except a member of the General Assembly. So a government employee of the member of the General Assembly, the Constitution does not apply to you or a public officer. And here's what's meant by local government. Gosh, that constitution actually defines what's meant by a local government. Local government means county or municipality. It doesn't mean any special district or a school board. The constitution does not say local government means county or municipality. And you're probably thinking, because I know you're all paying attention closely, you're probably thinking, but yes, the Constitution still said public officer. Obviously, when it says local government official, it's referring to a local government official in a city or a county. Not in a school district, not in a special district. Even though we're all used to calling them local governments, because in other definitions in the statute, they're called local governments, political subdivisions of the state. But in the Constitution, it's very clear. Local government is only city and county, not school districts, not special districts, not Title 32 districts. Goes on to say what a person means. That looks pretty much like most definitions that we have. Talks about what a who a professional lobbyist is, definition there. And then it gets down to public officer. Public officer means any elected officer, including all statewide elected officers, the head of any department of the executive branch, and elected and appointed members of state, state, I'm emphasizing state, of state boards and commissions. So if you are on the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, you're soon getting a new name. But if you're on the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, this constitutional provision applies to you. You are defined as a public officer. If you're on the State Board of Education, this constitutional amendment provides to you. You're considered a public officer and commissions. So even if you're on a commission, even if you volunteered to be on a state commission, you are defined as a public officer under this constitutional amendment. But here's who's not a public officer. And remember, this constitutional amendment applies to public officers. But here's who's not considered a public officer for purposes of Article 29, which I think you're all familiar with was Amendment 41, but for purposes of the Constitution, a public officer does not include a member of the General Assembly. So uh, not us. A member of the judiciary. It doesn't include any local government official. And local government as termed here is city or county. So it doesn't include any local government official. Or here we go. Or any member of a board, commission, council, or committee who receives no compensation other than possibly per diem or necessary or reasonable expenditures. So I'm wondering, 
And I would like to hear the argument for, the legal argument for, how this amendment, how this, how this law meets constitutional muster. Because the Constitution, Amendment 41, when it was passed, was very explicit, very explicit. It didn't imply, it was very explicit who was covered under this Constitution, this constitutional amendment. And when it says public officer does not include a member of any board, commission, council, or committee who receives no compensation, I think it's talking about school boards and special district boards because they don't receive compensation. So I would like to know how, I understand that this is a, we're trying to make a statutory change to the Constitution and I understand that's typically allowed that we can define how the Constitution is supposed to be implemented through statute. And in fact, after this passed, the General Assembly went wild and passed bills that said, here's, here's how this applies. And that's why we have this whole body of law and statute. But I'm not under the impression that a statute can change a constitutional provision. The statute does not supersede the Constitution. So when the Constitution says that a public officer does not include any member, well, first of all, it says any local government official. A public officer is not any local government official, and it defined local government official being those from cities and counties. But it says very specifically in here, a public officer does not include any member of a board, commission, council, or committee who receives no compensation other than a per diem allowance or necessary and reasonable expenditures. It has specifically said in the Constitution that you cannot include school board members. In Section 5, Independent Ethics Commission, tells you who, can, who you can file on. And it does say in here. You know, here's the thing, you ought to know that the Ethics Commission, they're a voluntary board, but you can't file a complaint on them. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> so you can't file a complaint on the Ethics Commission in case maybe they messed up, did something wrong. Um, but it, because members of the commission receive no compensation for their services on the commission. So you can't file, can't file against them. And then it goes on under section five to talk about the membership. And it says any person may file a written complaint. And the good, good senator from Lumberland was correct. It does say any person. It doesn't limit it in the constitution. So her argument about the Constitution says any person is why we needed to vote no to the good senator from Monuments Amendment because he was trying to narrow what the Constitution said. So we had to vote no on that one because you can't narrow the Constitution. You have to follow the Constitution. The Constitution is not subservient to state law. It's the other way around. So it says any person may file a written complaint <coughs> with the Ethics Commission, Independent Ex Eth Ethics Commission, asking whether a public officer, and then it goes on, member of the General Assembly, which a school board is not, or special district board is not. So again, you can file a complaint asking whether a public officer, so remember, Definition says a public officer is not any member of a board, commission, or committee that doesn't receive compensation. Now, I don't know how it works in all your school boards, but I know in the school boards that are in within my district, they are not receiving compensation. So it says very clear here, you may file a written complaint with the Ethics Commission asking whether a public officer, which does not include a school board member, by definition in the Constitution. 
Or you can ask about a local government official. Definition in the Constitution says that's cities and counties, not school districts or special districts. Or a government employee failed to comply with the article or any standards of conduct or reporting requirements of provided within the proceed, with, by law within the preceding 12 months. <clears throat> so if the argument was on a previous amendment that you cannot narrow it, that you cannot include, that it can only be people who live in that taxing entity. So for example, only people who live within the school district boundaries can file a complaint on a school board member. So the argument was you can't do that because the Constitution says any person can file. So yes, someone from South Carolina, Alaska, or even Japan could file an ethics complaint on only certain people, though. Because the Constitution is very clear, school board members, special district board members, because they don't receive compensation, are not considered public officers. So they are not local government people under the Constitution, for purposes of this Constitution, nor are they public officers. So I would like to hear the explanation how this statute, this bill, this bill hoping to be a statute, meets constitutional muster. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to my good colleague from Brighton for your comments on this topic. Um, so we're not changing a constitutional provision with this. We're um, just making the statutory change. We're not narrowing the Constitution. We're saying that in addition <clears throat> to the people who are already covered, um, called out by Article 29, um, we're just adding the school and special district officers. So in terms of volunteers, <clears throat> we do have a provision for some districts to um, get paid and some to not. Um, but just because an elected official isn't paid does not mean that they wouldn't occasionally abuse their power for unethical reasons. Um, so when they do, even though it's pretty infrequent, they should be held accountable by an independent ethics commission. And that's what this bill does. I urge and I vote. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I, maybe I misunderstood, but I thought I just heard the bill sponsor say that we were not, that this bill is not covering members of a board. I'm sorry, was that, what, was that correct? No. That, so this statute, and I know this is probably inappropriate for me to be asking a question this way. So correct. I just would like clarification. So this statute does cover special district board members and it does cover school board district members. Yes. Senator Marchman. Ma Madam Chair, thank you. And, and yes, that is correct. This statute will cover special district and school board members, as well as their first line employee. So superintendents, fire chiefs, and that kind of thing. Senator Gardner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Members, uh, I will have a fair amount to say about this bill later, but on the particular topic that the senator from Brighton has raised, um, which permeates the entire discussion, really, which is this statute is going to extend the jurisdiction of the Independent Ethics Commission to school board members, special district board members, and their, for lack of a better term, their direct hire superintendents, maybe deputy superintendents, um, general managers of, uh, that if they're employees, not contractors, of special districts. Um, has anybody, has anybody ever had a case in front of the Independent Ethics Commission that you don't have to? Um, 
Anybody? Anybody? Has anybody handled a case in the Special Ethics Commission for, on behalf of a client that you don't up to? I have. And you need to understand that the jurisdiction of the Independent Ethics Commission does not make for the rules regarding um, conflicts of interest and so forth. That's actually in uh, 24, and I don't have the books here, I'll, I'll get them in a bit, um, 24, 18, I think, and so forth. Uh, and, and it requires, and this is different, uh, and, and this was a judgment by the General Assembly, um, those statutes require proof beyond a reasonable doubt that someone has breached their fiduciary duty as a, as a board member. And then there are penalties for that. There are penalties in Title 18 for that. There are, are fines and penalties that already exist at the courthouse. Um, the Independent Ethics Commission operates on a preponderance of the evidence standard, which is a much lower burden, and creates uh, its own, there, there are its own set of penalties uh, pursuant to statute. Um, there are 17 pages of rules for the Independent Ethics Commission. Uh, they're not they're not overly extensive. 17 pages as these things go are not very much. That's both good and problematic if you're a lawyer representing someone because you're looking for more process than, than is there. Now, in my experience, um, the Independent Ethics Commission does certainly provide a lot of process. One of the things that's curious to me about the Independent Ethics Commission is that when a complaint is filed, the Independent Ethics Commission treats that complaint as confidential uh, until it has had a determination of whether it's frivolous or not, um, and conducting a preliminary investigation, and I'm doing this in broad strokes. There are some um, what if and but if uh, in there. Uh, but what's problematic is you may have a complaint filed with the Independent Ethics Commission against you, and it may be pending there for weeks and months, and you have no idea. By the way, you'll find out. You'll find out because the person who filed the complaint is likely to tell you and the world and go call a reporter and say, I've filed an Independent Ethics Commission complaint against school board member, whoever, special district board member, whoever. Um, for that reason, it seems, and it is certainly within our jurisdiction, our power as a General Assembly to remedy that, and I would suggest we remedy that problem uh, for these new officials who are being added to the list. There's an amendment at the desk. Ms. Cole, will you please read L25 to 1065? Amendment L025 by Senator Lynn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members, as I was saying, I move L025. To the amendment. Um, as I was saying, the rules of the Independent Ethics Commission um, may allow the complaint to be pending for some time while it's determined whether or not it's frivolous. And the Independent Ethics Commission meets with some frequency, but, but not, it's, it's not like a court. It doesn't meet every, every week. Um, I, I haven't really looked to see, maybe it's once a month. Uh, there are five members. Um, but again, 
you may learn about a complaint against you by a reporter calling you up and saying, uh, John Doe, who's a disgruntled uh, parent in your school district, thinks that you've violated the ethics laws and is going around telling people you have an ethics complaint pending against you. You're under investigation. I've been on the receiving end of that kind of activity where someone files a complaint and it is the it is the process that when a complaint is filed it will be investigated and then the person who files a complaint which subsequently is found to be frivolous groundless uh, is going around telling the press Gardner is under investigation under investigation you ever read that in the newspaper? Someone's under investigation. It's very pejorative. At the very least, the respondent, the subject of this complaint, ought to have notice within a reasonable time. What L025 says is that upon the filing of a complaint against a volunteer, special district official or volunteer school district official, the commission shall provide information about the complaint, the commission's adjudicatory process, and the potential penalties to the volunteer special district official or volunteer school district official within 10 days of the filing of the complaint. You know, when I file a complaint, unless it's under seal, um, generally, I'm required within a reasonable time to uh, serve that complaint on the other party. There's a lot of what if and but if, but if there. You wouldn't necessarily, but if it's filed, that party can go and read the complaint. They aren't served if they do that, but they can go and read that complaint and they'll know what that complaint is about. It's only if it's filed under seal and that is court order that it wouldn't be released. Um, and that would only be in uh, serious criminal, criminal and, and civil actions. So we've got school board members out there that are gonna be the subject of complaints and I'll talk to you about that. Um, we need to, uh, I'm shocked that the fiscal note's not larger than it is because IEC is going to need a lot more staff. A lot more staff. And I don't know if these five members who meet on a periodic basis are going to be, I mean, the, the membership is set constitutionally, but I don't, I don't know what we're going to do and how they're going to handle the, the workload. That's crazy. I'll explain to you why that is so a little later. Uh, at this time, I ask you simply to agree with me that when a complaint is filed, the subject of the complaint has a right to notice within 10 days that a complaint has been filed against them. That's all that L025 um, says, in essence. I ask for an I vote on L025. Further discussion on L025. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I urge a no vote on L025, and I'm going to explain why. Um, the process by which um, the Commission receives complaints is spelled out in the Constitution. Um, and we would not want an IEC to be working under different rules for different complaints. Um, it says the commission may dismiss frivolous complaints without conducting a public hearing. Complaints dismissed as frivolous shall be maintained confidential by the commission. So they would not be reached out to, whether it's a volunteer or a paid school board member, whether it's a... Um, a top employee or um, a fire chief, for instance, if it's found to be frivolous. Um, and it says, too, that the commission shall conduct an investigation, hold a public hearing, render findings on non-frivolous complaints, 
and then assess penalties as such. So murking around with the process would not make a lot of sense. Um, I urge a no vote on this, but I'm also going to talk about the numbers of the people who are currently and will be subject to the IEC if this bill were to pass. Currently, there are 125,000 people who are subject to the IEC. We anticipate there will be about a 27% increase of people who might be subject to the IEC under this. In the fiscal note, it's clear to see that they plan on no more than 0.5 FTE to manage the complaints as a part of this. So I urge a no vote on L025. Senator Gardner. Thank you. Well, with respect, let me explain why that's all wrong. Um, yes, it is true that um, Amendment 41, found at Article 29 and uh, Section 5, has discussion of the Independent Ethics Commission uh, uh, process. But it also, there is also a provision that says the Commission's authorized to adopt such reasonable rules as may be necessary for the purpose of administering and enforcing the provisions of Article 29 of the Colorado Constitution, and they do. 17 pages worth. And there's nothing in the Constitution about when the respondent receives notice. It says when the complaint's investigated, it says there's a determination of whether it's frivolous or non-frivolous about investigation. It doesn't say when you get notice. And let me say this one more time. And this is a matter of free speech, but it can be, free speech can be annoying sometimes. I, I'm, I'm getting universal agreement. Uh, and, and the constitutional protection that no, no member may be questioned uh, outside of the, the chamber for anything that they say in the chamber uh, at the well also can be annoying as well. But, there are good public policy reasons for it. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that a frivolous complaint can be pending for weeks, and the filer of that complaint can be running from one end of the school district, one end of the special district, and I can tell you, because municipal officials are already subject to this, one end to the other of those jurisdictions, telling everybody that the mayor is under investigation. Councilman, whoever, is under investigation. And the person under investigation has no clue as to what the substance of that is. And will, can be stuck in the situation of saying, I don't even know. And by the way, it's confidential. You can't know what the, what the charges against you are, the complaint by some disgruntled citizen, or maybe someone with a valid complaint. But by the way, there is a process for those valid contra, uh, conflicts of interest and breaches of fiduciary duty in Title 18. So, all we're asking for is allow the person who has a complaint filed against them and is having everybody in the world ask them about it, allow them to have notice of what the complaint is. I ask for an I vote on L025. And I look forward to educating uh, everyone about the legalities of the Independent Ethics Commission this afternoon and into this evening. Senator Lundeen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I rise in support of Amendment L025. Um, the uh, defense of this proposed policy um, by citing the Constitution broadly 
is interesting. It's it, certainly the Constitution does frame the foundation for this conversation, but it, it doesn't um, articulate the detail. In fact, when the public considered Amendment 41, which later became Article 29, Section 5, I believe, of the Constitution, it considered, hmm, do we want school boards in there? What about other local districts? And they decided, the voters, to give us a constitution that did not include school board members, nor employees, which is a question yet to be considered more thoroughly, or special districts, nor employees, which is, again, another related question to be considered thoroughly. But it does provide permission for articulation of details such as Amendment 25. The inherent fairness in this, and it's, I, I would say it's incredibly reasonable. I, I, quite frankly, would have drafted it probably for more prompt notice. Um, the media calls when a complaint is filed um, come within hours, not days, to say, hey, just wanted to get your perspective on this complaint that's been filed. Um, I'm, please tell me about the complaint is kind of the perspective that one would have in that moment. And I will tell you, as an exonerated member or individual of a frivolous claim filed in the IEC, that in fact, that was exactly my experience. Now, this amendment doesn't say, we'll notify you within 10 hours so that you can have some idea of being prepared for the second day of media calls if you get those. Instead, it says within 10 days, the potential or the uh, complaint will be revealed to the volunteer special district officer or volunteer school district official or the commission. The commission shall provide also, this is kind of nice also, it is kind of a gray cloud. You don't quite know what's going on. You need to spin up and understand what the process looks like so you can begin to understand what, what you'll be walking through. This amendment also says in, you will, within 10 days, provide information about the complaint, the commission's process, that's very useful, and the potential penalties to the volunteer special district official or volunteer school district official within 10 days of filing the complaint. So it does require notice, information about the complaint, information about the process within 10 days. Um, as I was mentioning, my preference would be that it be much more prompt than 10 days. 10 hours would be a, a, a substantial period of time. 10 minutes would be much more useful because then you would actually be prepared for the inevitable media calls that, that would be coming. Um, but it does, this 10-day window, provide a little bit of protection for the individual um, to be prepared for the exact case of an individual who's filed the complaint for potentially nefarious reasons, and, and that does happen, um, to, you, you know, they get a running head start. They've got a day or two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight of making mischief. But then by day 10, at least the individual who has been complained against um, has the information they would need. So to the, to the um, argument that the Constitution exists and therefore this is a bad amendment, I would say the Constitution is permissive and allows for, within the rules, to adopt exactly this, some clarification around what you would do. Now, I urge rejection, as the voters did when they put Amendment 41 in the Constitution. They chose to carve out school districts. They chose to car carve out the, the special districts. So I would urge that we, in fact, excise um, House Bill 1065 from the conversation and vote the bill down. But if you're going to press it through, then in at least tune up the policy to make it a little bit more even-handed. I urge your support of Amendment L025. Thank you, Madam Chair. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before the body is the adoption of LO25 to 1065. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The noes have it. LO25 fails. <laughs> Seeing no further, Senator Gardner. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, let me start before I educate you on the jurisdiction of the Independent Ethics Commission and its birth, all of which are relevant to this bill, because we are, we are looking at a proposal to add a significant number of elected officials of particular types to the jurisdiction of the uh, Independent Ethics Commission. Now, I don't question the number that there are some 125,000 people subject to the Independent Ethics Commission jurisdiction, but I have to tell you, the groups that you're adding when you vote yes on this bill are a group of people that are in the thick of conflict most of the time. And if you think for a moment that this is not going to be weaponized, in fact, I would submit to you if you go to the Independent Ethics Commission website, and of course the problem is you'll see like um, in their report, something like the last, the last report I noticed there, and I'm not sure why this is, the last report on the website filed was for 2020. Um, and uh, indulge me a moment. I'll have to find uh, I'll have to find it in a bit, but there was something like 80 complaints in um, in 2020. Uh, of those complaints, probably uh, 75 of them were frivolous. You'll never find it, Senator from Monument. Uh, I know exactly where I put it, but uh, but if I did know, I'd, I'd be able to lay hands on it. Um, We'll, we'll visit that in, a, in another time to the well. Um, what happens in these cases? There's a dispute. There's ill feeling. Now, I think it's significant that we want to, uh, in, in this bill, we want to consider school board members. There are 178 school districts in Colorado. Uh, each of them having five to seven, maybe more, but, you know, say on average six board members, you're going to add about 600 people. I don't even know how many special district boards we have. Uh, I'm sure the association will, can text me and tell me, but those boards will have three, five, seven people on them. And I don't know, have you ever... Ever been involved in school board politics? Anybody ever been involved in school board politics? You know? We've seen a lot of that this past couple of years, both sides. Both sides. Now, I have said frequently and over and over again, the most thankless elected position in America, school board member, town council member of a small municipality. And I would add to that special district board members. The most thankless jobs. And they are typically uncompensated. The people are, contrary to what's been said, that they're, they're not volunteers. I don't know what you call someone who takes a job for which all they might hope to collect would be their expenses for driving to Denver to stand in the lobby and ask for more K-12 funding um, other than a volunteer. I had a occasion to... Uh, deal with a colleague some years ago, another simple country lawyer, 
um, he was probably a good deal more sophisticated than, than I, um, who served on my local school board. And I asked him, uh, hey, how much time do you think you spend uh, away from your law practice on school board matters? And he said, I hate to tell you, Bob. I said, really, what? And he said, sometimes it's 40 hours a week. I'm losing 40 hours of billable time. Or if he were, if he were a, a person who had his own business, he was having to hire a manager. I can think of another school board member who had to hire a manager to do the work that he normally would have done in order to serve on the school board. Now, the suggestion has been made that some of them misbehave. I have no doubt about that. I mean, I, I don't. I, I've advised board members from time to time, and I've advised boards from time to time about issues with respect to conflicts of interest, because small communities have a tendency to present those kinds of conflicts. It, you know, somebody's wife, somebody's wife works for the company that provides all of the meat to the school cafeteria. There's a case roughly along those lines in the Independent Ethics Commission's rules. And if you get one of these things filed against you, recall that I said in 2020 there were like 80 and I think 70-some-odd of those were deemed frivolous. But believe me, the people who had them filed against them knew pretty well that they were there and they lost sleep over it. You know, if you have not been the subject of an ethics complaint, however groundless, however inappropriate, you can tell yourself it'll be okay because you didn't do anything wrong, but you don't sleep well till it's done. You don't sleep well till it's done. You know, we want the very best people to run for public office. And we want the very best people to serve as our school board members and our special district board members, we want the best and most ethical people possible. And you know what, you know what about those people? They value their integrity and reputation. I, I, I hesitate to say above all, but at the highest levels. But if you want to have your, if you want to have your reputation smeared, just run for public office, even school board. Yeah, especially school board. So as a former school board member, especially school board. Now look, in, in opposing this bill, I, I don't know that I'd said that I was opposing, but you might have gathered that. Um, in opposing this bill, I'm not standing in defense of unethical conduct. We have statutes on the books to deal with that. I'm not standing in defense of unethical conduct because school boards and special district boards are required to have policies regarding conflict of interest and unethical conduct. And those policies um, can lead in various ways to their sanctioning, censuring, or even ultimately removal by their constituencies. As well as, if it is serious enough, criminal charges. As well as civil penalties for breach of fiduciary duty. I am not suggesting that 
we should give a free pass to these folks. But here's the problem. When you create a system like this, and when there is no cost to the filing of a complaint, when we make it easy for any citizen to do, even a citizen that's not a citizen of that school district or special district. The bar is very low. You say, oh, 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 they're required, they're required to swear that the facts in there are true to the best of knowledge and belief. Well, people know about half and they believe everything. And so all they have to do is swear or affirm that what they put down on paper was what they knew and what they believed. And that might lead, by the way, to a frivolous filing, but in the meantime, in the meantime, they're running around telling everybody, I filed a complaint against board member Jones and she is under investigation. By the Independent Ethics Commission, she's under investigation. First Amendment right to run around and say that. You say, well, somebody says that, you can sue them for defamation. Well, here's an interesting thing as well. If you are an elected official of, of an office, and in fact, if you're a school superintendent or a town manager, uh, like Mr. Freed from Port Huron, Michigan, who found himself trolled. We discussed him just last night, I guess it was, maybe yesterday before. You're a public official. What does that mean? That means there's, there's pretty much an open season on slandering and defaming you. People can't say things that are obviously, obviously factually wrong. They can't defame you uh, with malice and reckless disregard of the truth. But they can say all sorts of things about you otherwise. They can say, Senator Gardner's a crook. He's bought and paid for it been said about me. I know nothing like that's ever been said about you. Your constituents all love you and um, even the people of the other party that you represent and uh, supported your opponent, they, they would never say things like that. We expose our elected officials to one more misuse, one more weaponization. This is not unlike, and I compare it to the campaign finance system that we had under Article 28, Amendment 27, uh, that was held unconstitutional by the uh, federal district court here in Colorado because it was a, um, it was a citizen enforcement system. And so people could come through your campaign finance complaints or your campaign finances and find little things wrong and play gotcha. And the reason I bring it up, it's a different rule structure, but it has similar aspects for people who run for office and hold office. Because those things always get printed and even if you're cleared later, the amputation is out there. We, we want people to run. I'll tell you what's amazing to me. It's amazing to me that any person in their right mind in America today would run for public office, particularly one that pays nothing. It is amazing to me. 
Now, I can tell you that people do it because they care about their children, they care about their community, they care about their neighborhood, and they care deeply and they think they can make a difference. And I think under the right circumstances and with the right skill set, I think citizens do every day make a difference. But we should not put them in a category where they're exposed to one more, one more weaponization of a system that they have to respond to. Uh, let me, I'm going to go to my, my desk here a moment. I printed up two cases that were deemed non-frivolous. Uh, these cases are extensive. There's a lot of paper. Now, One case is, these are public, so anything I say here, anything I observe here, will be to the public record as posted on the Independent Ethics Commission worksite. I have, I have one complaint here uh, filed against an official, not an elected official, but an official uh, of the executive branch. The complainant is something called Defend Colorado. It's a public interest group. They have a particular viewpoint. It's filed against one Rick Palacio. It was filed in December 1 of 2020, nearly three years ago. It's uh, as it goes, I'm looking for the last pages of it. I'll spare you the reading of it all. Actually, what I have here is a challenge of the finding that it was non-frivolous complaint against this gentleman. I don't know what kind of attorney's fees he's paid. Um, but it would have made my month last month. And yet, this is, this is a person who was engaged in public service, who asserts that he is of the highest ethics and integrity. There's one in here against someone named Hickenlooper. Oh. Someone subject to a different set of ethics rules now. Deemed non-frivolous. I would suggest to you that if you look at these cases, um, I, I don't want to go into the, the details of them all. You can read them all. You, you'll find that 2022 was dominated by someone by the name of Peters. And you, then you're going to go, aha, see, we need that system. Well, I think the criminal justice system and the civil justice system are dealing with that quite well. And it's probably a waste of the Independent Ethics Commission time. But in the meantime, surrounding all of those are 75 and 80 and 90 complaints 
complaints against people who didn't do anything wrong. Lots of these cases are, are regarded as frivolous. And yet, I can tell you that, maybe not to a person, but the vast majority of those people knew about the complaints, had been asked about the complaints, the complainant told people about the complaints, the complainant told people they were under investigation, How does this system work? Well, in 2007, actually 2006, uh, several things on, were on the ballot that year. One of them was Bob Gardner for the first time, and the other was Amendment 41. And Amendment 41, Section 5, had a provision for the Independent Ethics Commission. And you're all familiar, I hope you're familiar with Amendment 41. Amendment 41 is the thing that says, don't take a ride, it doesn't say this directly, but Amendment 41 says, don't take a ride from a lobbyist if you're downtown at a meeting and they offer it to you. Don't take it. Or if you do, hand them, hand them a few bucks when you get out of the car. If you go across the street to one of the lobbyist offices uh, to visit with them because you need to get out of the building or you're going to meet with somebody else over there, and they offer you a bottle of water, if you take it, leave a buck or else you will have violated Amendment 41. Amendment 41 is a very rational, rational uh, piece of work. One of the things that Amendment 41 carried was the Independent, Independent Ethics Commission. It says, there is hereby created an Independent Ethics Commission to be composed of five members. So no matter what happens and no matter how big it is and no matter how much work though it is, it's always only five members. The purpose of the Independent Ethics Commission shall be to hear complaints, issue findings, and assess penalties, and also to issue advisory opinions on ethics issues arising under this article and under any other standards of conduct and reporting requirements as provided by law. The Independent Ethics Commission shall have authority to adopt such reasonable rules, remember 17 pages, such reasonable rules as may be necessary for the purpose of administering and enforcing the provisions of this article and any other standards of conduct and reporting requirements as provided by law. A lot tied up in that phrase because that's the phrase that extends things beyond the text of Amendment 41 and goes into Title 18 and Title 24. The General Assembly shall appropriate reasonable and necessary funds to cover staff and administrative expenses to allow the Independent Ethics Commission to carry out its duties pursuant to this article. Members of the Commission shall, this is important because it requires a lot of work. Members of the Commission shall receive no compensation for their services on the Commission. Query this. Are members of the Independent Ethics Commission subject to the jurisdiction of the Independent Ethics Commission if a complaint is filed against them? Hmm. I hadn't really thought about that till just now. And if they have to recuse themselves, does everybody else, because we had this case at the Supreme Court where the position was taken by the Commission on Judicial Discipline that if it involved any of your members because you were all kind of so collegial, you'd have to do that. So question for another day. Members of the Independent 
Ethics Commission shall be appointed in the following manner and order. So these are people who receive no compensation. This is, this is freebie, like school board members and special district members. One member shall be appointed by the Colorado Senate. That's been controversial. One member shall be appointed by the Colorado House of Representatives. That appointment has been controversial. Have to do a resolution, I think. One member shall be appointed by the governor of the state of Colorado. That's easier. There's only one of those. He, 33, 18, and one. He's the one. He can, he can vote his own. One member shall be appointed by the Chief Justice of the Colorado Supreme Court. Again, Chief Justice won't have any problem. And one member shall be either a local government official or a local government employee appointed by the affirmative vote of at least three of the four members appointed pursuant to subparagraphs one to four of this paragraph A. Now, this is interesting. Why is it interesting? When the Independent Ethics Commission was constituted with five members, it applied to local government officials, town councils, county commissioners, and so forth. And so the writers, drafters of Amendment 41 provided that they would at least have representation on the commission. One member shall be either a local government official or a local government employee appointed by affirmative vote. We don't have a representative of school boards or special districts on the Independent uh, Ethics Commission, and we can't statutorily change that either. It's a constitutional matter. But Clearly, this Independent Ethics Commission was not designed to apply and to have jurisdiction over school board members and special district members. It was not contemplated. Can you add them, can you add them to the jurisdiction of the board? I think the proponents of the bill would argue you could. I think there's probably a pro and a con to that. Um, no more than two members shall be affiliated with the same political party. Okay. There's that. Each of the five members shall be registered Colorado voters and shall have been continuously registered with the same political party or continuously unaffiliated with any political party for at least two years prior to the appointment to the commission. Well, that's at least to make sure that you never have a majority R or majority D representation on the commission. And you know, that has shown in the decisions of the commission in, in terms of balance. Uh, wonder if our Constitution said no more than some member, less than a majority, could be from a single party uh, in the General Assembly. Well, that's a different thing. Um, so, members of the Independent Ethics Commission shall be appointed to terms of four years, except that, and they're staggering here, this is good language if you ever have to write a board stagger kind of uh, uh, provision. Except the first member appointed by the Colorado Senate and the first member appointed by the governor of the state of Colorado shall initially serve two-year terms to achieve staggered ending dates. If a member is appointed to fill an unexpired term, that member's term shall end at the same time as the term of the person being replaced. So somebody Gets a, has enough of going to meetings for which they don't get paid and they need to make a living. Uh, the person appointed to replace them only serves to the end of their term. 
Each member shall continue to serve until the successor has been appointed, except that if a member is unable or unwilling to continue to serve until the successor has been appointed, the original appointing authority as described in this subsection shall fill the vacancy promptly. Although we've had a vacancy sit and sit and sit because we just had a problem with one or the other chambers. Um, any person, now here we get to the point, this is, this is the core of the problem. Any person may file a written complaint with the Independent Ethics Commission asking whether a public officer, member of the General Assembly, local government official, or government employee has failed to comply with this article or any other standards of conduct or reporting requirements as provided by law within the preceding 12 months. Well, that's reassuring. There is at least a 12-month statute of limitation. So somebody that gets mad at you for the way you voted on the school board this year can't dredge something up from 14 months ago that they thought was a problem or some reimbursement that you took for traveling on behalf of the school board or some contract that was let and they thought that you should have recused yourself or maybe you did and they just don't know about it. The commission may dismiss frivolous complaints, thank goodness, That's, those words aren't in there, um, without conducting a public hearing. Complaints dismissed as frivolous shall be maintained confidential by the commission. But that doesn't prevent the complainant from running from one end of the county to the other and telling everybody you were under investigation or that you are under investigation. Nothing's stopping that. And by the way, if you ask the commission about that and say, well, can they do that? Shouldn't that be considered? When you consider the complaint against me, shouldn't you consider that? And the answer is, well, that's not relevant to whether or not you violated ethics standards or not. The commission shall conduct an investigation hold a public hearing, and render findings on each non-frivolous complaint pursuant to written rules adopted by the Commission. This process looks an awful lot like the courthouse to me. Complaints filed, uh, there's an investigation, just like the sheriff would investigate if someone filed criminal charges, you get investigated. Maybe they say, well, there's nothing to that. Or they say, well, there might be something. But here's an important thing. Well, let me, let me finish here. The commission may assess penalties for violations as prescribed by this article and provided by law. OK? There is here, this is the important thing to, to consider. Recall that I told you a moment ago that the ethics statutes, um, 24, 18.5, I think, um, yeah, well, 24, 18, actually. Um, 2418.104 is rules of conduct for all public officers, members of the General Assembly, local government officials, and employees. Now, 2418.104 is one of the statutes that the Independent Ethics Commission has authority to look into if there's an allegation that you did it. But 
2418104 starts with the words, proof beyond a reasonable doubt of commission of any act enumerated in this section is proof that the actor has breached his fiduciary duty and the public trust. So the General Assembly and presumably the governor by his signature at the time in 1988, would have been Roy Romer, determined that in order to say that someone breached their fiduciary duty, you needed proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Very high standard of proof. So right now, a special district board member or a school board member, in order to find that they had violated ethics regulations, would the person asserting that would need to find proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I think that choice reflected the fact that these are cases that go to people's honesty and integrity and have severe penalties for them in instances where there are always going to be charges and counter charges. But that's not what Amendment 41 says. It says, there is hereby established a presumption that the findings shall be based on a preponderance of the evidence unless the commission determines that the circumstances warrant a heightened standard. So the commission operates on a preponderance of the evidence standard to find a violation. We, the General Assembly, made a, made a determination that that standard for those officials ought to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt, but preponderance, that's just a little bit more, little bit more proof that it is than it isn't. Just a little. And, you know, a jury of six or 12 can sit around all evening and argue about that all day and all the next day. Juries can be out a long time arguing over whether something's a little bit more or whether it's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Members of the Independent Ethics Commission, this is not a court, by the way. These are not judges. But they have the power to subpoena your records and to subpoena witnesses to make statements and produce documents. Not judges, but they have the right to issue a subpoena. You say, well, so what? That's to compel you at your expense to go through your records. For those of you who have ever received a CORA request, anybody ever received a CORA request? It's a pain. And it's time consuming. Any public officer, member of the General Assembly, local government official, or government employee may submit a written request to the Independent Ethics Commission for an advisory opinion on whether any conduct by that person would constitute a violation of this article. You know, um, that makes me wonder, and I haven't had time to look into this, whether when we have a statute that will include school board members and special district uh, directors in the jurisdiction, have we put sufficient language in to ensure that they also are people who can request an advisory opinion from the Independence Ethics Commission. Any of you ever requested an advisory opinion? No? Uh, I 
have not personally requested one, but I have assisted in requesting them and have read several advisory opinions as a gen member of the General Assembly. And you will, from time to time, find the Office of Legislative Legal Services directing you to one of the advisory opinions when you ask them. And I, I, I suspect all of you have at one time or another asked, and if you haven't, you should. Um, can I accept this particular thing? Uh, is it okay by Amendment 41, or am I violating Amendment 41? Uh, that's all of the Article 29, Section 5. It's considered, by the way, to be by the State Supreme Court to be self-executing. Um, what does that mean? That means it, it didn't require any legislation to be effective. Didn't prevent there from being legislation, but it did not require any legislation. Um, by the way, um, Section 6 does set up something that the Independent Ethics Commission could do. And I, and I guess the Independent Ethics Commission would try to avail itself of this remedy. I mean, this, this is interesting as well. Um, Amendment 41, Independent Ethics Commission jurisdiction constitutionally does not apply to school board members or special district members. And they're not included in the ambit of Amendment 41. Amendment 41, I, I think it's accurate to say, does not apply to them. If it did, then they'd already be part of this. There's a penalty provision here in Amendment 41, Article 29, says any public officer, member of the General Assembly, local government official, or other government employee who breaches the public trust for private gain, and any person or entity inducing such breach shall be liable to the state uh, or local jurisdiction for double the amount of the financial equivalent of any benefits obtained. Um, I, I think you have to go back I mean, if those people are not considered to be, those people being the, the ones addressed in the bill, are not considered to be part of Amendment 41, you have to go back. I, I, I guess, you know, usually when we say local government official, I always say, does that include school board members? Amendment 41 says local government means county or municipality. Uh, local government official means an elected or appointed official of a local government, but does not include an employee of a local government. So, um, by that, the penalty provisions, this is really fascinating, the penalty provisions of Amendment 41 don't apply to school board members, and they don't apply to special district board members. I probably, I probably should not say any more because I don't really want those penalty provisions to apply, and constitutionally they don't apply. One more issue of things that people didn't think very hard about. Um, well, recall that I said this is self-executing, and so then we have to figure out, did the General Assembly pass other laws? And I'm going to yield the floor while I review 
whether there might be other laws that we should be aware of before we vote on this bill. Talk for a little bit. I'm only going to talk for a little bit. I, I promise. As soon as they say like this, I'll cut. Okay, cool. Then we can do this. Okay. Senator Kirkmeyer. I haven't seen you up there before. Have I? Hi. Thank you, Good Mr. Afternoon. Chair. <laughs> there he is. So just sort of picking up on where the good senator from El Paso County was talking, and I kind of brought this up before with regard to the Colorado Constitution, Article 29. That's where Amendment 41 landed. Um, and so it's important that we read all of it. And as I mentioned, and where uh, the good senator from El Paso County was speaking, local government means city or municipality or county. It doesn't mean school boards, school districts, or special districts. And then when you get in here, and I know that the good senator from El Paso County was talking about are there other laws that are at issue with Article 29. And I would say this. And it's a question that I've posed to others. If the Constitution, the Article of Constitution says that, you know, as public officers, members of the General Assembly, us, we're charged with carrying out our duties for the benefit of the people of the state of Colorado. And then there's the definitions, as I talked about once, definitions in Section 2 of Article 29, local government means county or municipality. And then it talks about in section two, paren six, public officer, says who a public officer is, and then it says who a public officer is not. And this was put into our constitution explicitly. They carved out a public officer does not include a member of the General Assembly, a member of the judiciary, any local government official, or any member of a board, commission, council, or committee who receives no compensation other than per diem. So, that's what a public officer is. So the good senator from El Paso was speaking to, are there other statutes? And here's why. Section eight of this article in our constitution says, any provisions in the statutes of this state in conflict or inconsistent with this article are hereby declared to be preempted by this article and inapplicable to the matters covered by and provided by and provided for in this article. And you can't legislate to do anything that restricts the provisions of this article or the powers herein. That is the Constitution. So I would urge a no vote on this bill, 1065. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1065 lay over to the end of the calendar. The motion is to lay over House Bill 1065 to the end of the calendar. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1065 will lay over to the end of the calendar. Will the clerk please read the title of the House Bill 1069? House Bill 1069, Representatives McCormick and Amabile, Senator Cutter, concerning the creation of the biochar and oil and gas well plugging working advisory group to make recommendations for the development of a pilot program to study the use of biochar and the plugging of oil and gas wells and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Cutter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move House Bill 23-1069 on second reading. To the bill. Um, so biochar is really a cool new thing that um, is a growing industry. It takes woody biomass and converts it into carbon dense solid with a lots of really interesting applications. It could be beneficial to efforts um, by the oil and gas industry to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Colorado. And so for one, that is one um, example of a good use. And so this bill sets up an advisory group of experts and community members who will um, study the possibilities of using biochar to um, plug orphan oil wells. So I ask for your support. Further discussion on 1069, Senator Pelton B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I got to hear this in committee and um, I appreciate the sponsors for bringing this. And we had several discussions. It's kind of a fascinating thing with biochar. Um, biochar means, what it means is it's a solid carbon rich, rich product made when woody biomass, so they're talking like trees and um, mulch and that sort of thing, undergoes a, um, a process 
in an oxygen depleted atmosphere that at approximately uh, 800 degrees Celsius and they add that to plugging wells. It's, it was just a really, a really um, fascinating um, conversation that we had and it just intrigued me. I actually did a little bit more re research later on about this. Um, <clears throat> I was just a little taken back by, um, cause this is a, 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 to study the biochar and to really use it in an oil and gas plugging operation in the orphan wells. And we heard about the several orphan wells across the state of Colorado. Um, I just, I was just concerned about using, um, cause I, I wanted to ask the sponsor and I don't know if I asked the sponsor this in committee, but were we, I know, but yeah, thank you, thank you, Senator. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask the sponsor when I was in committee is that we're not going to be, are we going to be taking down some trees to do this or is it just a, is it just um, what we already have on the ground and we're going to chop up or make into mulch? Senator Cutter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is um, just a study. Um, but I would imagine no one is chopping trees down specifically for this use. There's plenty of biomass in the forest after fire, for example. So that's why this is appealing to me. It kind of combines um, fire and some beneficial methods for uh, me beneficial um, applications for reducing carbon. Um, so it's got lots of different uses. Senator Pelton. Thank you. And thank you. Um, to the good senator from Jefferson County. We, we had lots of uh, um, discussion about this in the committee and I apologize I didn't ask that question when we were there. Because um, there is, I mean, quite a bit of down timber in, in the Western Slope and, and especially where I hunt. Um, and there is some, some, um, some places where the fire had, uh, had been and some other places that where fires have been, especially where the uh, Lake Christine fire was on Basalt Mountain where I hunt quite a bit. And um, this would work perfectly for it. And, and I was just very intrigued and um, I think this is gonna be a um, all right bill. So I uh, thank the sponsor for bringing it and, uh, and I ask for an aye vote. Senator Pelton R. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I didn't hear this bill, but uh, I have a couple questions. One of them, uh, what's wrong with the, the cement method that we use currently? Uh, because if we're going into these forests to recover all this down timber and stuff, there's going to be quite an environmental impact uh, with doing that with all the, you know, the industrial equipment and trucks it takes to haul all that stuff out. And I'm just wondering, you know, what we've got is working and, and sometimes why mess with something that's working? Senator Cutter. Thank you, Mr. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this creates a stronger, more flexible um, kind of cement that sequesters carbon. And as I said, um, nobody is going to be. Uh, I don't think anyone's deliberately going to be going to extra effort to go into the forests and. Um, get this stuff, but some of that biomass needs to be removed from the forest anyway. So this is just a beneficial use. There's there's lots of implications for biochar, and um, this industry ha has real potential in Colorado. And I do say industry because there's lots of um, economic upside to this, and this is only one way. But there's lots of biomass in the forest that can't stay there because of um, wildfire and stuff. So I hope that answers your question. Senator Pelton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and another uh, concern I had about uh, the initial fiscal note was very small, like $11,000. And then in the revised, it's grown to 370 with three FTE on the first year, 175,000 with one and a half to FTE. And I'm just wondering for a study for a work group, uh, why such, uh, in my opinion, enormous costs for three FTE for just a working group to to study this uh, different way of plugging wells. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 1069? Senator Gardner. So members, 
One of the great joys of serving in the General Assembly is you learn about things that you never heard of before. And biochar is one of them for me. The bill creates the biochar in oil and gas well plugging. I thank the senator from Denver. Uh, it, it creates the biochar in oil and gas well plugging working advisory group. Um, that in itself is a great ac must be a great acronym in there. Um, that's going to be in the uh, Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and in the Department of Natural Resources. Now, you have to read two or three lines in to know what biochar is. Uh, biochar is a type of charcoal produced by burning organic material in a form that resists decay in order to sequester its carbon content. I'm not sure I fully understand that. But the group is going to have representatives of the COGCC, other state agencies, federal government, local government, private industry, academia, environmental advocates as well. So it's going to be a broad-based group. Um, and the expenditures are not incredible. You know, it is interesting to note, though, that when the bill came out of the House, uh, the reimbursed version has extensive, extensive amendments. Which makes you wonder, what's the difference? And so I look at the introduced bill, and I, uh, I see that we have a legislative declaration that starts And, and it looks like we just struck the entire legislative declaration. Um, but it declares that it's important to focus on finding innovation, innovative solutions to mitigate the effects of climate change, further protect human and animal health, and lower the carbon footprint of current methods of plugging oil and gas wells. I think I began to get the sense that this is about plugging oil and gas wells. Um, and this, the state recognizes the importance of regulating the oil and gas industry and supports the implementation of practices uh, and technologies to address emission reduction goals and research to develop the practices and technologies. Um, There's sort of a resolution here by way of declaration that the state needs to continue to regulate the plugging of oil and gas wells by both state agencies and the oil and gas industry. Uh, it's important to create opportunities for the oil and gas industry to permanently sequester carbon from the atmosphere. So uh, we've got to keep the carbon out of the atmosphere. We want to sequester it. We want to see to it that there are opportunities for the industry to do that. And biochar is the way to do that. The use of biochar and oil and gas well plugging operations can, uh, there seems to be a lot of potential here, may potentially open up economic opportunities for Colorado to become a leader in the use of biochar and oil and gas well plugging in operations. That's exciting. That's exciting that we would become a leader in the use of uh, biochar and oil gas well plugging. Uh, I can imagine traveling somewhere uh, and saying I'm from Colorado and they're, they're saying to me, you know, your state's a leader in biochar 
well plugging. And I would know about that. Um, so it is interesting always when you look at bills. Uh, recall that I say in these definitions you can call an apple an orange. Uh, you can call a horse a cow. In this case, they call biochar what I guess you'd expect it to mean, the solid carbon-rich product made when woody biomass undergoes pyrolysis in an oxygen-depleted atmosphere. I think, that's, I think that's burning without a lot of oxygen. Um, at a very high temperature, 800 degrees Celsius, that's pretty hot. That's, you know, like eight times boiling or something. Um, it is just interesting to me the many numbers of things and bills that we uh, encounter. And we have to rely uh, many times on our colleagues and experts as to whether or not the use of uh, biochar well plugging is going to have opportunity or not for the state of Colorado. Uh, I thank you for your attention and uh, encourage you to study the use of biochar well plugging as Colorado may one day be a leader. Any further discussion on House Bill 1069? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the passage of House Bill 1069. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1069 passes. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1112 lay over to the end of the calendar. Motion before the body is that House Bill 1112 lay uh, over until the end of the calendar. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1112 will lay over to the end of the calendar. Will the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1147. House Bill 1147, Representative Kip, Senator Winter, F, concerning provisions relating to the adequate training of motor vehicle drivers and, drivers and in connection therewith, creating an enterprise to educate potential drivers and reimburse third-party providers and counties for a portion of the cost of administering driving examinations, setting limits on the fees third-party providers may charge, providing translation services for driving examinations, imposing a fee on instruction permits and driver's licenses, and making an appropriation. Senator Winter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move uh, for passage 1147 in the Associated Appropriations Committee report. To the Appropriations Committee report. Uh, members, we actually made some pretty significant changes. Uh, we started talking about the level of education that new young drivers should have in the state of Colorado. We've seen a record number of deaths and accidents throughout Colorado. Um, and we know one of the ways to reduce those deaths is through training. The Transportation Legislative Review Committee came forward with Senate Bill 11. Uh, then the House came forward with this bill. Now you see it combined to increase training, make sure that we have a very, very small fee on driver's licenses to make it affordable for all people um, and make our roads safer. And I encourage a yes vote. Is there any further discussion on the Appropriations Committee report? Seeing none, the question before the body is the adoption of the Appropriations Committee report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the Appropriations Committee report is adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read the title of L021? Amendment L021 by Senator Winter F. Amendment Senator Winter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L021. To the amendment. Uh, this is a cleanup amendment making some technical changes and date changes to ensure that this is drafted appropriately, and I ask for a yes vote. Any further discussion of L021? Seeing none, the question before the body is the passage of Amendment L021. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. L021 is adopted to the bill. Senator Winter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I encourage for the passage of House Bill 1147. Uh, it'll make our roads safer. Seeing no further discussion, the question before the body is the passage of House Bill 1147. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1147 is adopted. The clerk please read the title of House Bill 1189. House Bill 1189, Representatives Byrd and Weinberg, Senator Zenzinger, concerning an income tax credit for employer assistance to employees in making a home purchase. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1189. Uh, 
in the Finance Committee report? And the Finance Committee report. To the Finance Committee report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We made an amendment to restore uh, the cap on employee and employers who can utilize the program. Is there any further discussion on the committee report? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the Finance Committee report. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the Finance Committee report is adopted. To the bill, Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, what this is is a voluntary program that uh, if businesses would like to adopt, could create a program very similar to a health savings account program, but it would instead be for uh, assistance, for uh, down payment assistance on a home. It would allow an employee who was interested in owning a home uh, to have a certain amount taken from their paycheck and put into this uh, account, very similar to a health savings account, uh, that would then be matched by the employer. Uh, and then the employer would have an opportunity to receive a tax credit for the purposes of uh, matching this uh, amount. Um, we uh, would then um, allow uh, employees who are interested in participating in this program an opportunity to save up for a down payment on a, a home. Uh, again, I will emphasize that this is um, uh, not mandatory. This would be optional, and it pays for itself in, um, in that way, and it would help uh, with um, our employers who are trying to attract uh, employees uh, to come and work for them, uh, but it's very difficult finding uh, housing uh, that is near where you work. And so for those reasons, I ask for an I vote. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 1189? Seeing none, the question for us is the adoption of House Bill 1189. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1189 is adopted. Will the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1198? House Bill 1198, Representative Titone, Representatives Titone and Lucan, Senator Rich, concerning a statewide teacher externship program to provide kindergarten through 12th grade teachers work-based learning opportunities in specified disciplines and a connection therewith, making an appropriation. Senator Rich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 23-1198. Uh, we were in finance, and I've also been in appropriations, but I don't have a report. Yes, I don't see any committee reports, so to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, House Bill 231198, it's a teacher externship program. It uh, creates equal opportunities for teachers to participate in work-based learning and improve classrooms curriculums within the STEM disciplines. That would be science, technology, engineering, and math. And the work-based learning can provide youth and adults, including teachers, with hands-on real-world experience. And I ask for an I vote. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 1198? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1198. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1198 is adopted. Will the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1253. House Bill 1253, Representative Sharbini and Lindsay, Senator Hendrickson, concerning a task force to study corporate ownership of housing in Colorado and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Senator Hendrickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1253 and ask for an aye vote. Is there any further discussion? Senator Kirkmeyer. Oh, yes. Mr. Speedy up there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So, uh, members, we had this bill up in committee last night in local government, a committee that I volunteered, apparently, sort of voluntold to stay, stay on last night. And it was getting pretty late, about at, uh, I don't know, I don't know what time I got home, but I know it was late because I could barely keep my eyes open. And so when this bill came up, we did a super vote. What's it called? Super motion? Super motion. We did a super motion. We did a super motion to just move this bill to seconds. And we didn't really have a whole lot of discussion about it. And I think this bill warrants some discussion. So for those of you who don't know and weren't paying attention to it, I'm going to walk you through it real quick here. Because this bill, and here's what caught my eye to begin with. This bill, you think it's just an easy little task force on corporate housing ownership, 
right? Task force, seems really harmless, seems like no big deal, until when I was reading in the fiscal note <coughs> last night, <coughs> excuse me, I'm looking at it, and it says a task force may consider recommending a fee, which you know what that means. It means they're gonna recommend a fee. Because we're telling them you may consider it, so they're like, well, what the heck, we might as well just consider it and recommend a fee on corporations to fund a grant program to award money to organizations addressing housing issues. When are we gonna stop the fee business? So we're gonna give, we're gonna, we're gonna have a task force. So you know what's coming next. A task force is gonna recommend a fee, because that's essentially the purpose of it. A task force, and here's who's on that task force. The task force on corporate housing ownership is created in the state demography office in the Department of Local Affairs. Now, I think you've heard me say this before, but I like the state demographer, mostly because I hired her, and she's really good. That's the second thing. But the state demography office in the Department of Local Affairs, and the task force will consist of the following members. So the Speaker of the House shall appoint one member from the House of Representatives. Okay, right there is our first tip. So we're gonna have a task force who's gonna consider recommending a fee on corporations to fund a grant program to award money to organizations addressing housing issues. Not specific organizations, but any organizations addressing any housing issue. That could be anything, because uh, I heard it, and I think it was in the governor's state of the state. Transportation is a housing issue. Economic development is a housing issue. Climate change is a housing issue. Didn't he say something like that? I don't know, but anyways, so when you have a task force that may recommend a fee, and you put a member of the House of Representatives on there, you can just, I would bank this. I would go to the bank on this. There will be a, ne a bill next year that has a fee in it on corporations to fund a grant program, yet one more grant program over in the Department of Local Affairs, probably in the Division of Housing. And I'm just gonna remind you, the other night, I had an amendment, the I Love Renters Amendment, that would have put lots of money into a program to ensure that people get to have their affordable housing and get to keep their rents and have money for rental assistance and tenancy assistance, and the majority of you voted no. So here we are talking about a bill that's gonna have a task force, which seems again like that shouldn't be a big issue. Shouldn't be anything sneaky about this at all until you get to the point where it says the task force may consider recommending a fee on corporations to fund a grant program to award money to organizations addressing housing issues. And then the first member up, one member of the House of Representatives. And then the Speaker of the House gets to appoint a member who is a member of a statewide association of real estate professionals. Well, that's a good idea because we also had a task force I did go through here. Oh wait, that was on Senate Bill 213, another amendment that went on that bill that said we were gonna create a task force about housing with no real estate people on it. I mean, things are just kind of crazy down here in the last few weeks of session, but in these last few days, it seems like they just get even crazier. So, but at least on this one, at least on this one, we're talking about a task force Who's member, who's, has a member of a statewide association of real estate professionals. Okay, then the Speaker of the House will appoint one member and one rep, and a member who represents, oh wait, I'm sorry, I missed one, C. One member who has significant professional experience with labor and workforce issues. So is that someone from a union? Who is that? One member who has significant professional experience with labor and workforce issues. That probably could be any of us, or maybe most of us. Probably won't be, because you already get your, the house <coughs> already gets a member. <coughs> so, one member who has significant professional experience with labor and workforce issues. Well, I'm kind of thinking that might be a union member. Then, D, one member who represents a statewide trade association of banks and other lenders, good idea. One member who has significant professional experience as a county clerk and recorder. On a task force about corporate housing ownership, who 
who must examine home sales since January 2008, so 15 years back, report the total number of home sales within specified sell price ranges and the number of home sales for occupied and unoccupied homes that resulted in partial or exclusive ownership by a corporation. Huh. So we're picking somebody from the county clerk and recorder's office. Oh, I'm sitting here thinking to myself there should be an assessor on it. And keep in mind, I didn't really have a lot of time to read this bill last night, and I was extremely tired. So there is going to be an assessor on it. So, Speaker of the House, member of the House of Representatives, a member who is a, from a statewide association of real estate professionals, a member who has significant professional experience with labor and workforce issues, a member who represents a statewide trade association of banks and other lenders, and a member who has significant professional experience as a county clerk and recorder. So that can only be a county clerk and recorder or a retired county clerk and recorder. And then the president of the Senate, our very own president of the Senate, gets to appoint one member of the Senate. So we're going to have a task force with a state representative on it and a state senator on it. My guess is they're both going to be Democrats because the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate. I'm thinking maybe they're not going to appoint a Republican. So we're going to have two Democrat legislators on it who are on a task force that's going to consider recommending a fee on corporations to fund a grant program to award money to organizations addressing housing issues. <coughs> Great. And then the President of the Senate gets to provide one member who has significant professional experience as a mortgage broker. Good idea. One member who has significant professional experience advocating for housing rights. Because I guess I'm we're supposed to assume that if you advocate for housing rights, professional experience, uh, so you get paid to advocate for housing rights, that you're going to know a lot about corporate housing ownership. Sounds like we're stacking the board. And then there's D, one member who has significant professional experience as a county assessor. So great, we're putting a county assessor on or a county clerk on. <clears throat> Two members, one from the House, one from the Senate. Again, probably both going to be Democrats. What I'm wondering here, though, is how come the president of the Senate is slighted? He only gets four appointments. How is that fair? The Speaker of the House gets five, A, B, C, D, and E, and the President of the Senate only gets A, B, C, and D. I guess, I guess that's because it's a House bill, but you would think that they would have at least made that fair. Why would they think we would support something where we're getting shorted one, even if it is the President of the Senate? That's not right. We don't even have an opportunity to get fair. fair. In fact, why isn't it the Minority Leader of the Senate? This doesn't sound very fair. I might have to go get an amendment ready. And then it says, and here's who's else on the task force. The executive director of the Department of Local Affairs shall appoint one member who represents the department. So the minority leader doesn't get an appointment, but the director of the Department of Local Affairs does. <laughs> who's appointed by the governor. Not sounding really fair here. Not equal representation. Okay, so they have to make their appointments in this section no later than 30 days after the effective date of this section. Well, let me see here. And it's subject to a petition clause, so that's going to be a while. So, any vacancy occurs, gets to be appointed by the task force. Members of the task force shall be filled by the appropriate appointing authority as soon as practical. I hope that means right away. So in making appointments to the task force, the appointing authority shall ensure that membership of the task force <clears throat> reflects the ethical, cultural, and gender diversity of the state. It doesn't say political in there. It just says ethical, culture, and gender diversity. So we have to have equal people, equal uh, gender on there of the state. Huh. Out of the, what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Out of the ten members, that means five women, five men. All right. 
So that means they'll probably maybe get something done because they're going to have at least five women on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to crack myself up. <laughs> Can you tell we're getting tired? But anyways, here's the issues that the task force is supposed to study. Examine housing ownership by corporate entities and residential real estate transaction by corporate entities in Colorado since 2008, including purchases resulting from foreclosures. Determine a methodology by which to examine the impacts of the corporate acquisition and ownership of residential property with a focus on single family homes, condominiums, and townhomes. <coughs> Gather and analyze reports and public records related to corporate ownership of housing. Make legislative recommendations. So we're going to have a task force, 10 people, only two of whom are legislators. But the task force is going to make legislative recommendations. Well, they're not legislators. But they're going to make le legislative recommendations to mitigate any negative impacts related to corporate ownership of housing that are identified by the task force. Great. And then they're going to report to the specified legislative committees. So that probably means to the local government and housing committee in the Senate and whatever the comparable is over in the House concerning the impacts of the corporate ownership of housing. I wonder why this wasn't included in 213. We're doing a housing needs assessment. Why didn't we just include this? I mean, my gosh. We had amendments that were like, you know, 50, 60, 70 pages long. And then we amended the amendments that were that long with like another five pages here, four pages there, 10 pages there. That bill's, that bill's like this thick. That bill's an inch thick. We could have found room for this. Why are we putting together a task force to study corporate ownership when we have another bill going through that is the governor's bill? So something's got to pass. Maybe. But here we are with another bill to talk about more housing and corporate housing ownership. They could do that in the housing needs assessment. They could have identified this because in 213, the housing needs assessment plan, guess where that's at? In the Department of Local Affairs, in the State Demographer's Office, which used to be in the Division of Local Government, but I don't know if it still is. Well, it must not be, because it just says the State Demography Office in the Department of Local Affairs. So, man, that State Demographer is going to be busy. Must be why she needs an additional point for FTE. So, anyways. I don't remember how much we gave her in 213, but I'm sure it was some. Maybe it was like 11 employees. But anyways, here we are. They're supposed to make recommendations pursuant to this subsection, 4D of this section, to mitigate any negative impacts related to corporate ownership of housing that are identified by the task force. Now I ask you, does it really make sense that we have a task force that is supposed to start as soon as practical, get their membership going, start as soon as practical, and then they're supposed to trying to figure out in here when they have to have it done by. No later than October 1st of 2025. Let's see, the task force must convene no later than December 1 of 2023 and report to local government committees no later than October of 2025. And the task force is repealed in 2027. Now I'm just wondering, does it really make sense to have a task force go through and talk about corporate ownership and what that's doing, negative impacts to housing, when there's, oh my gosh, that's right, there's this other bill, 303. Remember, we only talked about it. I know it seems like it was a month ago, but it was really only a couple days ago because it didn't even get introduced till Monday. It got introduced on Monday because there was a press conference that we all had to miss because we were working on the floor. Some of us were. And the bill was not even out on the web page until sometime after 10.30, because I know I checked, I couldn't find it. But Tuesday it was in committee. Then Wednesday it was here? Tuesday it was here. I don't know, Wednesday it was here on the floor. 
And we went ahead and passed that through. But so here's the deal. So 303, remember, that's the whole thing about where we're trying to, where the governor said we were going to give you property tax relief when your property taxes are still going to go up. And what we really found out is we just want your table refunds so that we can put it in the education fund and spend it wherever we want to. Grow government, spend more government, and um, not limit government. So now we're going to create a housing task force to talk about how corporate ownership is mitigating the negative impacts. But if you remember in that bill, we changed around. Well, we didn't. I didn't vote for it. Y'all changed around the assessment rate. So we have to figure out, remember we had the whole discussion about that renters weren't going to get any property tax relief? Well, corporate ownership of housing, they're not going to get the same relief that a single family owner occupied home is getting. So why are we doing this when we don't know yet if that initiative is going to pass? Maybe we should just be waiting till next year or maybe we should add it right in because I'm thinking 213 is coming back our way. Conference committee, I'll be there with you, good senator from Commerce City, and we could just add this in if we really wanted to, or not. Especially the part about fees. Why would we do that? That would be crazy. We're trying to cut people's property taxes, and here we are, let's go put a fee on them. And that would include corporate ownership of housing, and here we are talking about, well, we should be recommending fees. Anyways, here's what, the rest, here's what they're going to examine. There will be certain information concerning, so to, to the specified legislative committee, certain information concerning the impacts of corporate ownership of housing. In examining the impacts of corporate ownership of housing units, the task force may consider to the extent to which corporate ownership of housing units correlates with increased vacancies, decreased housing availability, decreased home buying opportunities for first time home buyers which is what I brought up in 303, if you remember. Because we weren't going to give the same kind of tax breaks to um, people's children if they went and helped them to buy a home. They weren't going to get the same tax break. So here we are now, after we've already put it in a bill that's going to the ballot, after, you know, by the time we refer that to the ballot, we're going to talk about decreased home buying opportunities for first-time home buyers, increased displacement. Gosh, this sounds like 213. This could have been covered in 213 or in 303, in Senate Bill 213 or in Senate Bill 303. I'm not sure why we need 1253, other than it started over in the House and those two bills started in the Senate, so maybe they just got crosswise. So maybe we should just lay this over, and when 213 comes back to us and we go into conference committee, if that's where we go, then we could bring this up because we always go beyond the scope, always. So we could bring this up because this looks a lot like some of the stuff that's in 213. It also looks like a lot of this is going to be impacted by Senate Bill 303 or that referred ballot initiative that you all were passing and agreed to. Increased displacement, increased residential property prices, increased non-resident ownership, increased rates of foreclosures, and any other factors deemed appropriate by the task force. I mean, seriously, folks. When 213 comes back to us, we could go to a conference committee and we could just say, look, in that housing needs assessment, we want these things considered as well. There's no reason for a whole separate bill that creates a task force that's going to hang around for it looks like about 18 months. <coughs> well, actually, I'm sorry. It can hang around from uh, sometime this year, let's just say September of 2023 to September of 2027 because it's repealed in 2027. Of course, we know that when things are set to be repealed, we have that little sunset review thing go on, and a lot of times they just get extended because we like to have a bunch of people sitting around going through all of this stuff. So the task force must identify, <clears throat> to the extent practical, trends in corporate home ownership in relationship to housing type. Number one. Number two, geography based on zip codes. Number three, property values. Number four, neighborhood characteristics. And number five, 
any other factors deemed appropriate by the task force? Well, that seems pretty broad and pretty open. The task force may identify and report on, to the extent practicable, any corporate entities that purchase or own a disproportionate or outsized market share of housing units in the state. Huh. How are we going to determine where those corporate entities are from? How does that happen? So, for example, if China has a bunch of corporate entities, entities here, how is that going to be determined if China isn't coming in and buying up all our farmland? Oh, wait, this isn't about farmland. That China isn't going to come in and buy up all of our housing. And I'm wondering if, so if those corporate entities are from, like, say, Texas, then are we going to make sure, will the law say, like, you know, corporate entities from Texas can't buy homes in Colorado? Just asking. Maybe, maybe we should say California. I don't know. But anyways, you can look forward to legislation, more legislation coming if you vote for this bill. But again, here we are. We're talking about property values, neighborhood characteristics, housing types, housing types. That was in 213. Neighborhood characteristics. That was in Senate Bill 213. Property values. I think there was something about property values in 213, but if it wasn't, it certainly was in Senate Bill 303. And then the task force, because they apparently don't have enough to do, we have a section that talks about additional duties of the task force. And the task force show they're going to meet on or before December 1st. So we're going to mess with, mess with their Thanksgiving. At a time and place determined by the chair of the task force. Meet at least once every four months. So apparently we're really not looking for a lot of information from them for a while. So they meet in December. They meet every four months. So December, January, February, March. So we're midway through the session. Oh, that's not a problem. Because we introduced bills all the way up into including to the last third, three days left in the session. So they'll have plenty of time to get their bills in. But they'll meet at least every four months, communicate with and obtain input from groups throughout the state. We don't know what groups those are, but oh, affected by issues identified in subsection three. Submit a report to the Transportation, Housing, and Local Government Committee <coughs> of the House of Representatives and the Local Government and Housing Committee of the Senate and other relevant findings as the task force elects to report. So they get to determine what they think we need to know. And they're appointed by the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate. And the President of the Senate got shorted, one. And compensation, non-legislative members of the task force. So the state representative and the state senator will get paid to serve on the task force, essentially. You'll still get your You'll be able to get your um, reimbursement for mileage. You're still getting paid anyways. It says legislative members are compensated in accordance with section 2-2-326. I don't know if that means your per diem or not. I don't know. My per diem is lower than most everyone else's in here. So, well, maybe not. But my per diem is lower than a lot of yours, so I don't know what that means. I don't worry about it. And then it says staff support is by the executive director of the department. They may supply staff. It doesn't say they will. It says they may. The task force may also accept donations of in-kind services for staff support from the private sector. Boy, if I'm a corporate housing ownership person, I'm really going to want to make sure they have staff support just so they can come back and recommend a fee on corporations to fund a grant program to award money to organizations addressing housing issues. That could be any nonprofit organization that puts in their mission that they're going to address housing. Doesn't say what they have to do, just they have to address housing. That could be pretty much anybody. And then there's this appropriation. $93,000. Oh, you are going to get per diem if you're a legislator because that's in the fiscal note. It says you're going to get nine, at least $944 legislator per diem. But 0.4 FTE, total of $93,000 in the first year, so that we can have a task force 
that is going to go look at home sales within specified sale price ranges, the number of home sales for occupied and unoccupied homes that resulted in partial or exclusive ownership by corporation, so that the two legislators sitting on there may help with any recommendations on how to mitigate this, but also so they can carry any legislation that might result in a fee on corporations to fund a grant program to award money to organizations addressing housing issues. Members, I think we already have Senate Bill 213. We already have Senate Bill 303. If there are portions of this that you actually like that aren't covered in those two bills, then we should just include them in those two bills. 303 is coming up on the House floor. It was in appropriations, I believe, over there this morning. They can just add these in right now. We don't need another bill that costs us yet another 93,000 bucks, another 0.4 FTE that will go on forever. That's going to go make a recommendation on fees to fund another yet another grant program. You know what's going to happen when that fee, when they come back with a bill that says this is how much the fee is to create this grant program, and it has to be in the Department of Local Affairs and the <coughs> Division of Housing, you know they're going to add on more FTE. They're going to take money off the top of that grant program to add on more FTE, more state government. Wrong. I urge a no vote on 1253. Senator Hendrickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think among the most compelling arguments I, I heard from the good Senator from Brighton were about efficiency. So uh, in that vein, I would uh, offer that we could, we could gladly add more women to the task force. And if she is willing to commit to uh, supporting it in conference committee on 213, uh, I, I would gladly. Uh, but I, I would wait for a, a, a answer on that, Mr. Chair. I'll just say we are on House Bill 1253. You didn't hear that. We're, we're going to go back to the bill, regardless of other bills. Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, members, um, I have been kind of looking over this bill. And um, uh, like my good colleague from uh, Brighton, good senator from uh, Brighton, and um, I, I have a few questions and just comments here. Um, you know, we're uh, talking about corporations uh, that uh, supposedly own the real estate. You know, I'm kind of wondering what kind of corporations they are. Um, you know, I don't know if they're, uh, you know, oil and gas corporations or retail corporations um, or healthcare corporations or uh, small LLCs, private corporations. So I uh, have uh, I have some real questions. You know, what what do we mean by uh, uh, corporations? You know, are they publicly traded? Are they uh, uh, are they foreign corporations? Uh, uh, are they multinational corporations? I think that 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 probably needs to be uh, addressed by this. Uh, uh, it does say here corporations mean a company or a group of people that are authorized to act as a single entity and are recognized as such law. Well, you know, I, uh, I'll, I'll let the, uh, the good, simple country lawyer from El Paso County maybe uh, talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, because he understands corporate law far more than I do. But uh, when, we start, when we do start talking about corporations, there's, you know, there's, you know that's, that's just a big area. Um, and uh, the other thing that I, uh, that I have a uh, question about, you know, it talks about the breakout of this, uh, of this membership, and I don't see anything uh, too specific. Uh, it does say some, something about a, uh, a member who has a professional experience as a real estate agent. Um, I, I would think that uh, there's any group that should probably be included in this, uh, uh, in this task force should be uh, probably the uh, Colorado Association of Realtors, 
since they uh, that's kind of the body and the uh, and the uh, organization that represents the real estate industry, though I suppose you could also have the uh, 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 El Paso County uh, Association of Realtors, uh, or the Denver. Denver, I'm sure, has a, an association of realtors. I would think that the good people from uh, uh, Mesa County, I don't know, do they have, they have an association of realtors over there? They, they do, they have a big one. Uh, what about, uh, well, my colleague from Weld County, does Weld County have an association of realtors? Would you know? I don't know. Well, we'll ask the, you know, the sponsor of the bill. Of the bill. But uh, uh, I would think that it would be very informative to have uh, somebody from either the Colorado Association of Realtors, and maybe really, uh, I wouldn't think it would just be from a a large county, be it El Paso or Denver or Weld, though uh, they should be represented. I would think that uh, people from the real estate industry, from uh, Peltonia, uh, certainly either northern Peltonia, uh, like Phillips County or Sedgwick County or Logan County, uh, you know, help me out there, and certainly from southern Peltonia, uh, you know, Cheyenne, uh, Cheyenne County, uh, Bent County, Otero County, Huerfano County, Kit Carson County. Um, I think it would be important that uh, that the small counties should be uh, should be represented because um, this task force. If you haven't had a chance, members, to look at this, the task force is going to. Uh, look at sales that have occurred since January 1st, 2008. Uh, I'll go through these in some detail. Um, within the following sales price ranges, uh, $50,000 or less. Now, um, I suppose back in 2008, 2009, when um, we had the Great Recession, there were probably a few homes that sold for less than $50,000. Uh, if anybody knows of some of those, help me out. I'm not sure. I'm, uh, I would think that there might have been a few, uh, some short sales, uh, some uh, very, very small pieces of real estate that could have been sold for less than $50,000. Then uh, in uh, a number under A2, more than $50,000, but less than $100,000. Well, you know, probably back in uh, 2008, 9, and 10, uh, I suppose there might have been a few that would have fit in that category. Though, uh, you know, as you get on later, when the, when the real estate market started picking up in uh, 2015, 16, uh, and the economy started coming back, I doubt that there were very many uh, uh, sales of real estate less than 50,000 and probably less than 100, uh, 50 to 100,000. Now the number three, uh, from 100,000 uh, to less than 150,000, now you're starting getting into, I'll say the, the upper low range or the low mid range of uh, real estate. Uh, it would be conceivable that uh, there were that there would be some real estate uh, that could have been sold within that within those uh, uh, parameters, though I'm not sure. Um, and then uh, number four under uh, on page four, it says more than than 150,000, but less than 200,000. Well, now then we're probably starting to get into a little more meat of things. Um, I, I don't know how many uh, homes would have been sold in the Denver metro area or even in El Paso County, though there would be some. Uh, but I would uh, think that in some of the uh, smaller counties, be it in Peltonia or the Western Slope, that it's conceivable that there would be some homes that were sold between 150 and 200,000. Uh, then we get uh, on those uh, uh, number five, Roman numeral five, those that were uh, more than uh, 200,000, 
and less than 250,000. Well, there again, now you're starting starting to get into uh, uh, mid-range homes that uh, you know probably needs to be studied. So that might be worthwhile for the task force to study uh, because I would think that you know that there might be a fair number of homes that would be sold in that range. And moving on into number six, the uh, 250,000 to 300,000. Now then, as I recall, uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, back in, what year was that? Well, I guess that was before 2008 when we, bought, when we bought our home. We would have been in this category. We bought, a, uh, we bought one, uh, our home when we moved literally across the street. I, I don't know if I ever told you that, that uh, where we live in Colorado Springs, um, We'd lived in the home for 20 years, and this home, literally across the street from us, came up for sale. And we had looked out our front window for 20 years. For 20 years, we'd looked at this house across the street. It had been owned. In fact, it was the first uh, house on our street that had been built. And we'd looked across the street every day for 20 years, and it was still owned by the original um, by the original owner. And uh, it was a uh, home that, uh, like I say, it was, it was well ahead of its time. Big, giant three bedrooms um, upstairs, three bedrooms, had a big, oversized two-car garage, fireplace, uh, walk-in closets. That's what, that's what my wife was always interested in. She said, Larry, you know, we've got, I want to have a home where I can go into a walk-in closet. And sure enough, uh, this home had a walk-in closet, great big bedrooms. Uh, like I say, it was uh, a home. Uh, it was uh, built by a well-known builder who had built a lot of the uh, uh, nice homes in the country club area. I still remember her name. Her name was Dorothy Stout. Uh, she was a well-known builder, uh, the good senator from Colorado Springs, uh, that lives in the southeast part of town, Senator Exum. He may have heard of Dorothy Stout. Not sure. Dorothy Stout, well-known builder. But, but uh, uh, Senator, listen, uh, are we going to tie Miss Stout back to the Yes, the I'll, bill I'll in get front back. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to add a little okay. detail. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Sorry, Mr. I'm just trying to add a little detail that, uh, you know, edification. But uh, anyways, well, I'll, I'll uh, fast forward. So anyways, we bought this house, and it was a nice house, uh, though we fixed it up a lot. It took a lot of work because it was very dated. Home was built in 1964, and uh, we, we bought it for, uh, in uh, Roman numeral six, it would have fit right in Roman numeral six. So I just use that as context for everybody. But then uh, you move into Roman numeral seven, for the 300 to 350,000, you know, uh, back uh, when we when we bought our house, that would have been a fairly expensive home. Today, I, I'm not sure if so. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if that would be considered a real, exp uh, you know, uh, an expensive home or not in today's a uh, three three hundred and fifty thousand dollar home is not really considered. Uh, a very expensive home. Uh, then you get on, I'll just kind of summarize these here into uh, eight, nine, and 10. It looks like to me it goes up by about $50,000 per category. So by the time we get to category 10, you're at four hundred and fifty to $500,000 homes. Now those are, you know, those are kind of expensive homes. Of course, in today's real estate environment, a half a million dollar home is really, uh, for some people, that's considered a starter home. Um, and then you get on to uh, number 11 and 12, then you're going from 500 to 600, 650,000. Uh, uh, we're talking kind of real money now. Uh, and um, uh, well, yeah, okay, so you say this is not in the Ring Ghost version. Well, for some reason, I don't have that. So uh, um, I'll, uh, 
I'll, uh, I'll just skip on. But, but the point being is that there's a lot of categories. Uh, we have 13, 14, 15. Sorry, I don't want to bore everybody with this. Uh, you get into 15, 16, and all of a sudden we're at 800, 850, 900,000. And then I turn the page and 900, 950. Uh, tw by the time we get to category 21, we're at homes at more than a million dollars. I don't know about you, but, but to me, a, a million dollar home is real money. I, I don't know how many people of you of own million dollar homes, raise your hands. No, wow, I'm impressed. Million dollar homes. Okay, well, I don't see anybody raising their hands. So, you know, we're all working people, at least some of us are. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, so, anyways, uh, so, you know, I, I think this task force uh, is, is really gonna have a giant job to look at all of these different categories and I certainly hope and uh, uh, would recommend to the sponsor of the bill that they bring in uh, the uh, Colorado Association of, uh, Association of Realtors, which uh, or, or their subgroups, whether it's uh, the Mesa County Realtors or the uh, Cheyenne um, uh, County uh, Realtors or the Logan County or the Phillips County Realtors, because large and small need to be represented. And the other group that I, that I almost neglected and that really should probably be brought into this equation uh, or into this task force are the Colorado Association of Home Builders. Because if there's anybody that understands real estate and knows about real estate and the uh, nuances of building homes and the home building industry, I would think it would be the Colorado Association of Home Builders. Uh, and I don't see that they're in here, so I would certainly, uh, as a maybe as an idea or friendly uh, uh, friendly amendment, that the Colorado Association of Home Builders maybe be included um, in this task force. So, uh, you know, uh, I want to commend my uh, colleague, uh, the good senator from Pueblo County, for uh, uh, you know trying to uh, do this study. Though I, I think. Uh, Boy, I kind of wonder uh, uh, about the fees that uh, uh, that are going to be assessed. Is it going to be a, a, a percentage fee? Uh, you know, uh, how, how that fee structure will will truly work. So, uh, with that, I will. Uh, I, I think I've raised some good points and some good questions, and I'll turn it over to uh, uh, to either my good uh, colleague from El Paso County or the good senator from Pueblo County. Thank you, members. Senator Hendrickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the other good senator, one of, one of a few good senators from El Paso County. Um, one of a few good senators from El Paso County. One, two, one, two, three? There's three. Yeah. So um, I, I, Ben, perhaps wisely advised uh, that I should clarify why I think it's obvious to the mood and the room that um, comments made earlier in jest to the good senator from Brighton uh, were meant to be sarcastic. But I appreciate some of the, the questions that were raised um, by her. I, and I also appreciate some of the, the questions raised by the senator from Colorado Springs. The breakdowns of, um, of home valuation have been stripped from the bill. Um, that's, that's not part of the re-engrossed version of this bill. But I want to reset sort of what we're talking about with this issue. We're talking about issues where there are bidding wars and what a corporation can offer, either in terms of closing prices or terms, is something that a individual on a VA loan can't compete with or someone on an FHA loan can't compete with. And so that housing then is absorbed into corporate ownership. That's why this bill focuses specifically on single family homes, condos, and townhomes. We're not talking about, um, you know, about large apartment complexes. We're, we're talking about single family homes 
which is, I think, the, the greatest foundation of wealth in our society. When you have a chance to buy a home, own a home, take care of that home, maintain that home, for the average American family, it's a huge part of your retirement. It's a huge part of your wealth. It's a huge part of your stability. And so I'm concerned when we see more and more single family homes, townhomes, condos, at price points that typically would be available to working class families who are outbid either in prices or in terms of, of, the, uh, of the bid by corporations. And then that home, and I can give an example. The, the, my, the first home that my wife and I bought is now owned by a corporation. Um, we sold that house a couple years ago. It was then later sold again. It's now owned by a corporation. That home was built in 1950, and for, uh, for 70 years, it was, it was a family home. It was owned by private individuals, families, starting off like mine. Um, it, was a, it was a home for a couple who had retired. And it was how you maintained wealth or how you built wealth, and it was the security, and now it's a rental property. Occupants will never be able to build wealth in that home. And so what we're looking to do is to have this task force that will make recommendations on that issue. Because when working class people are blocked from the market, from the one source that has consistently been the key generator of wealth accessible to working class families, that's something we should all be concerned about. And that is the exegesis of this bill. I'm happy to have more conversations about the specifics of this, but that's why this bill is coming forward and that's why I want the conversation to be focused on. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, I just want to say to the good senator from Pueblo, I appreciate your comments. I know it was all in levity and good fun, and that um, it's late on a Friday night. It's not real late, but it's 7 o'clock, and it was just a great conversation. So I didn't think anything of it other than we were just having some collegial good talk. So thank you, though. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 1253? Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening to everyone. Good evening. Um, this bill, uh, like every bill, I suppose, is kind of an interesting story, I think. There's probably things I don't even know about the bill. Um, so I have to surmise. But um, it's concerning, it, it says on its face, concerning a task force to study corporate ownership of housing in Colorado and the usual, and there's an appropriation, and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Um, so, the bill adds a uh, Section to 2432, it'll be section 733, uh, for a task force on corporate housing ownership, um, creates it and so forth. Um, and it starts with definitions, it, so many times, it starts with definitions so that someone can define an apple as an orange or a horse as a cow. Uh, this says, as used in this section, and then we always have these magic words unless the context otherwise requires. I've always wondered what the context would otherwise require. And if you were going to do that, why didn't you just let the context determine what the definition was? But corporation has the meaning set forth in section 7-90-10210. Now, it just so happens 
I have 70-90-102-10. My colleague from El Paso County um, was asking about what corporations and were they international corporations. Well, 790-102-10 says corporation means a domestic corporation or a foreign corporation. A domestic corporation in this context means a Colorado corporation. Anything that's not a Colorado corporation is a foreign corp corporation. Uh, Texas corporation is a foreign corporation. A Delaware corporation is a foreign corporation. And a Canadian corporation is a foreign corporation too. Um, that made me wonder though, why does the bill limit the task force to only studying uh, corporate ownership? And by that I mean, you know, a, a corporation, something to be a corporation, uh, is defined and incorporated, but we have other forms of entity ownership. Uh, in fact, it is more common in real estate um, to have uh, real estate investment trusts, things that are owned by limited liability companies. And limited liability companies are uh, not corporations, and they're uh, like corporations, they are a creature of statute. Uh, they are more flexible, they uh, uh, can, can operate um, without issuing stock and things like that. And so you, you ask yourself, since so much real estate that is an entity ownership is owned by LLCs, why in the world are we only studying corporate ownership? Um, is that what we intend? I, I hope uh, uh, we can get some light shed on that as to why corporate as opposed to other entity ownership. Uh, because an LLC might have hundreds of members and a corporation can own an LLC and the LLC could own the houses. And in fact, it's not uncommon for every individual property to be owned by a limited liability company to uh, uh, limit the liability, to be somewhat circular, to only that property. So that if that property had issues, uh, if, if someone slipped and fell on the sidewalk in that property, walking up to the steps, it would only be that property that was subject to a judgment. So I, I'm just wondering why corporation is what we're going after here as opposed to other forms of entity, entity ownership which might have the same effect upon uh, housing prices and housing affordability and housing availability. Uh, task force means the task force on corporate housing ownership created in subsection 2A of this section. So that's good. Uh, the task force on corporate housing ownerships created in the state demography office in the Department of Local Affairs. Um, I don't know, maybe uh, the, uh, the senator from Brighton with a lot of experience in the Department of Local Affairs might uh, be able to tell us why the demography office uh, is the correct office to, uh, to house the task force. It seems a bit odd to me, but never mind. The task force consists of the following, and it appears that as if there was a, a number of members enumerated there, but that got um, in this re-engrossed version uh, was amended out appointed as follows. Now this is really interesting. Who is on the task force? I always look at these things and I always look at them carefully. We create task forces and boards and commissions. Uh, earlier we were talking about the Independent Ethics Commission which was created in the statute and no more than two members of that uh, Independent Ethics Commission could be from 
a single political party. There's no such limitation here. But we often see that done in other ways uh, in boards and commissions uh, or task forces that would uh, give some diversity. And by the way, there's a, there's a big move for diversity here, but apparently not diversity of thought, only diversity of protected classes. Uh, why do I say that? Well, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, that's currently someone of the same party as the Senate President, uh, shall appoint one member of the House of Representatives. I'm guessing that that one member of the House of Representatives won't be from the Republican Party. I'm just guessing. Um, I might take, you know, could take some odds on that. Uh, and these are all speaker appointments. One member who is a member of a statewide association of real estate professions. Well, uh, real estate professionals. Well, I suspect that will be a member of the Colorado Association of Realtors, but I'm betting that that's not going to be a Republican. And if it is, it isn't going to be a Republican from El Paso County. Uh, I don't think, just, just guessing. One member who has significant professional experience with labor and workforce issues. Well, I don't think that's going to be someone from corporate America. I think that'll be someone from labor America. One member who represents a statewide trade association of banks and other lenders. Well, you might not be able to find a Democrat there, but I suspect you can. I, I knew a Democrat banker or two. Uh, but it is the Speaker of the House of Representatives making the appointments. Uh, the President of the Senate shall appoint. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I left one out. One member who has significant professional experience as a county clerk and recorder. I suspect that will be a county clerk and recorder or a former county clerk and recorder, but I'm guessing that person is going to be a Democrat. Just guessing. I could be proven wrong. I could be proven wrong. Maybe. The President of the Senate, the last time I looked, the President of the Senate uh, is a Democrat, although he, he could be mistaken for a Republican by some, uh, and was uh, apparently at one time. I, I don't know. Ask him to tell you that story. <laughs> He's going to appoint one member of the Senate. I'm thinking that that one member of the Senate will come from over here or the back row back there. One member who has significant professional experience as a mortgage broker. Now, you're going to have a real challenge to get a mortgage broker who's a Democrat, but I have met some. I have met some. One member who has significant professional experience advocating for housing rights. That won't be very hard. I'm guessing that will be a Democrat. Or perhaps a progressive liberal socialist, but it will not be someone from the right wing. Uh, and one member who has significant professional experience as a county assessor. I suspect that will be a county assessor or former assessor from a front range county, uh, which is predominantly uh, Democrat. I'm just guessing, though. Uh, and the executive director of the Department of Local Affairs shall appoint one member who represents the department. So I think the executive director of the Department of Local Affairs is probably appointed by the Democratic governor and is a Democrat. So uh, I'm, I'm thinking we got, I, I'm thinking we got a very, very Democrat heavy task force here. Um, 
The, the appointing authorities shall make each of the initial appointments described in the subsection no later than 30 days of the effective date of sec section. Makes you want to go back and see, well, when's the effective date here? Uh, it's subject to petition, so um, the 30 days after 12.01 uh, a.m. on the day following the expiration of the 90-day period after final adjournment of the General Assembly, except that if a referendum petition is filed pursuant to Section 1.3 of Article 5, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's the petition clause as opposed to the... Uh, um, as opposed to the safety clause. So, and there's provision for any vacancy. Um, now, you say, well, that seems pretty, pretty lopsided. Well, there is this admonition that in making appointments to the task force, the appointing authorities shall ensure that the membership of the task force reflects the ethnic, cultural, and gender diversity of the state. Well, that, okay, okay. Includes representation from different geographic regions of the state, including urban, rural, and resort communities. Okay. And to the extent practicable, includes persons with disabilities. I wonder why it would be impracticable. That's very interesting. We only have to appoint people with disabilities if it's practicable. But I can't think of a single reason why it would be impracticable to appoint someone with a disability. But even though this is a task force that studies issues, there is no encouragement of diversity across the American and for that matter, Colorado political spectrum. Interesting. Um, I, I, won't, uh, I won't burden you with the issues for study that's been done. I could spend 20 minutes on that, but I think I might leave that for someone else. Um, it strikes me that the title of this bill is um, a bit broader than it ought to be. And so, um, there is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L014? Amendment L014. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. I move L014. To, uh, to the amendment. L, uh, thank you. L014 is a very modest narrowing of the title. It inserts the word Democrat in front of task force so that it will be concerning a Democrat task force to study corporate ownership of housing in Colorado. Um, th this, this is more reflective of the task force as it's put together in its appointing authority. Uh, Senator Garner, I will, uh, I'm going to quibble with your grammar here. It should be democratic <laughs> task force if we are going to get proper grammar. No. But I know that that's the favorite way no. for your party to say that word. Th Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But democratic, democratic can be associated with the word republic. Uh, but a democrat and things that are democratic may not be associated, in fact. Uh, that, I'll leave that to others to determine. Uh, uh, I, actually, Mr. Chair, um, trying to narrow the title may be unnecessary, and I withdraw L014. L014 has been withdrawn. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 1253? Well, you, you could reoffer it. You could re Senator Pelton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, you know, the running of that last amendment is kind of appropriate because uh, I kind of think that maybe this bill is is mistitled also. Uh, kind of what I'm going to get at is this bill should be entitled, what the heck does the government need to know this for? You know, we, we go into uh, one thing that this, this task force will uh, be tasked with is recommendations regarding potential creation of a fee 
to impose to be imposed upon corporations that own significant numbers of homes in Colorado. Uh, I don't know where this notion comes from that corporations are big and bad and just full of money. Uh, out in rural Colorado and agriculture land, that is definitely not the case. And uh, I, I just, I don't like any time we single out single uh, corporations and things like that for that purpose. Another part of this bill that I have issue with is uh, section three issues for study. Uh, examine housing ownerships by corporate entities and residential real estate transaction by corporate entities in Colorado since January 1, 2008, including purchases resulting from foreclosures. Why? Why and what is the need for that? Uh, so what if corporations own some of this housing? It's still being utilized. Under num Roman numeral four, under the same section, uh, makes legislative re recommendations pursuant to subsection 4D of this section to mitigate any negative impacts related to corporate ownership of housing that are identified by the task force. So right there, they've got their marching orders to be looking for uh, negative impacts uh, because of corporate ownership. And I just, I don't think that's the business of this building and this body to be doing things like this. Uh, I, I rise in strong opposition to this bill and I think it's misnamed and the, the, its task is inappropriate. So I ask for no vote. Senator Will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise in uh, strong opposition to this bill as well. I understand it's uh, I understand it's just a task force, uh, but I think with all legislation, and I've, I've read through and read through the declaration, but you know, what's the intent of the bill? And that's where I'm coming from. What, what's the intent? And the other thing, what, what are we gonna learn and what are we gonna do with it once we learn it? And uh, you know, with this task force being in the state demography office and Department of Local Affairs and it, it, directs the task force to do all these things and examine housing ownership. Uh, I think most of us, and uh, especially the districts and the part of the districts that we're most familiar with, we, we know what that, that ownership is. And uh, definitely the uh, uh, real estate people do. And I think this, uh, I really wonder when I was reading through this bill, because it almost seemed like a companion bill, and I could be right or wrong, but it seemed like a bit of a companion bill to, uh, to 1190, the, uh, the first right refusal. And maybe we're gonna learn all this stuff, and maybe we're gonna try to uh, get some of these corporations to, uh, uh, to get into the affordable housing, or maybe to, where the local governments will hand off the third party thing to some of these corporations to try and figure out uh, some affordable housing situations. And uh, so I, I, really, I really struggle with this bill. I, I, I don't see that it, uh, and the, I don't see that it does anything and I don't understand the full intent of it and what the result, even after we find out all these things through a task force, um, what the result of what we find out is gonna be I can tell you on a good share of my district, it doesn't matter who owns who owns the, the property or the residential. I understand I, uh, the sponsor made it quite clear that it's, uh, you know, single family homes and like condos and all, but corporations, there, there's a lot of single family homes in the district that I, uh, a lot of single family homes that I, in my district over there, and they're, they're uh, it's kind of like the, uh, the accessory dwelling units. I mean, these, these uh, all these single fam family homes are $15 million homes. They're never gonna be affordable housing. And if you do a, a, an accessory dwelling unit, it's gonna be a $3 million accessory <laughs> dwelling unit. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's not gonna be affordable either. So, um, and I understand there, there could be some uh, s small opportunities I think all those opportunities 
that, that I know of and that I can think of are already being explored. And, uh, you know, the local, the local governments, obviously, they're always looking for affordable housing, they're looking for it for their employees, especially county, county employees. And uh, they struggle with this. We can, we can do this, this task force and learn things, but I can tell you probably every county that I represent already knows everything you're going to be asking for in this task force. They already know it. I think the information's already there. They're familiar with it. They understand it. They know who owns what, and they still don't have any solutions to affordable housing, because I think that's where this is headed. The, um, and I hope, it, I hope this isn't like a companion bill to 1190, because um, 1190 is also not a, not a great bill in my opinion. But uh, I do strand, uh, stand a strong opposition uh, to this bill, and uh, I appreciate and thank you for the time. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 1253, Senator Kirkmeyer? Senatorial five. All right, we'll be in a senatorial five. And we are back. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L015? L015 Senator by Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L015. Uh, to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, this amendment is all about fairness and making sure that if we are going to have to have this task force, which I'm hoping everybody votes no and we don't, but in case this does pass, <clears throat> what this does is, uh, currently the Speaker of the House gets five appointments. The President of the Senate gets four, so our side was shorted at least one. And then it had the Executive Director of the Department of Local Affairs shall appoint <laughs> a member. And so I'm sitting here thinking, why does the Department of Local Affairs get to appoint a member? That's, that Executive Director shouldn't get to appoint somebody. They have to staff the committee. They don't need to be appointing people. So they're already going to be there. They're already going to have staff there. They can just show up. They don't need to be on the task force. 
They can go still get their voice in. They can see how it feels to be a stakeholder, I guess. But anyways, so the Speaker of the House was supposed to get five members. President of the Senate was short at one, and, if you re and he's only going to get four appointments. And then if you remember correctly, we did have an amendment that called this what it was, which was the Democrat task force, but then we pulled that out. But so we got to get some fairness here. And if you remember also correctly, in Senate Bill 213, the task force that was amended into that and maybe is going to be coming back. It depends what happens from the House to the Senate. But anyways, that shorted the Real Estate Association. So this amendment simply says the executive director of the Department of Local Affairs does not get an appointment. However, a new Roman numeral number three, the minority leader of the Senate shall appoint two members, one of whom is a statewide trade association representing bankers or other lenders, and one of whom represents a statewide real estate association. Now, I think if we're going to talk about corporate housing, we should have more bankers and or lenders on the task force. That would help out. And since the Real Estate Association got shorted in 213, I think it's only fair that they get two members on this task force instead of one. So that's how I came up with who should be um, appointed by the minority leader. And again, Speaker of the House gets appointments. President of the Senate gets appointments. I think it's only fair that the minority leader should get two appointments. I urge an I vote on Amendment L15. Senator Hendrickson. We'll be in a senatorial five.
We are back, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I withdraw Amendment uh, L015. L01, the motion for L015 has been withdrawn. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L016? Amendment L016 by Senator Kirkmeyer and reading gross bill Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L016. To the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, we worked this out, and here's what's happening. So to make sure that we're fair between the House and the Senate, we took one member from the House of Representatives speaker, from the speaker, and we are adding that to the minority leader of the Senate. So the speaker will have four appointments, the president will have four appointments, and the minority leader will have two appointments, one of whom is a representative of a statewide trade association of banks or other lenders, and one of whom represents a statewide real estate association. And then we left in the executive director of the Department of Local Affairs still gets their one appointment. So we're still, now we're up to 11 members, but the minority leader gets to appoint two. So it's four for the speaker, four for the president of the Senate, and two for the minority leader of the Senate. I urge and I vote on L16. Senator Henriksen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I uh, also ask for I vote on L16. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? The question before us is the adoption of L016. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and L016 is adopted. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 1253? Mr. Minority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise in opposition to House Bill 1253. Um, I, I, excuse me. Expanded appointments to the minority leader notwithstanding, that doesn't put me in a spot where I have to take a 17C or anything, does it? I, I would assume not. There's no uh, f uh, pecuniary interest in this. Um, I, the, the concept of creating a task force, even though it does have improved appointments by virtue of the fact that the minority leader will be making some of those appointments, to evaluate, study, and understand what's public, public information. You can get this information publicly as to um, corporations, and when corporations are used in this context, it's the, the word that's implied before it is evil corporations, but the reality is that's not a truism, that's a, f a falsehood. Um, corporations uh, can very, very likely be individuals like my my parents um, might have a corporation that they have a house in that they, they either rent or live in. Uh, my, my child could have a corporation do that. Um, I think what potentially someone's trying to get at is big corporations, big holding companies like BlackRock, who have been building subdivisions of single family homes. Maybe that's what's trying to be found. Anyway, the point is the task force um, gathers this information together and then it essentially, decides that it's going to become a taxing authority and it's going to tax these corporations or fee is, is the way it's written, these corporations to fund a grant program to award money to organizations addressing housing issues. So this is a construct that is designed simply to create, um, and, and even though we will be appointing this task force, they become de facto unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats. And they are going to essentially establish taxing regimes. Uh, on the face of this, this is not a policy that I can support, a policy that I would vigorously and strenuously oppose. Um, it gives DOLA a responsibility to help manage this task force. And of course, there's a cost associated with that. It's gonna cost us 140 grand over two years and a part of an employee to help administrate this. Um, contracts with a professional facilitator, managing all the task force logistics, conducting research, preparing regis legislative reports, um, it, I, I'm just, I'm stupefied is, is the only word that I could come up with. And some of you may think, well, Undine, you sound stupefied most of the time, but this bill has truly driven me into a corner where stupefaction is the only thing that I can possibly use to express 
my response to this bill. What, 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 I, I, what's the name of this task force? I, I need to get that square in my brain. This new taxing authority we've created here, feeing authority, excuse me, I didn't mean to call it a taxing authority, concerning a task force to study corporate ownership of housing. Um, we've got a bunch of definitions here. The task force means the task force on corporate housing, creation of membership, demographics. Um, I'm looking for a name. Surely, am I not going to find a name? Is there a name in here? The task force shall do a bunch of things. It's just a housing task force. Does the task force have a name? Task force must do this. Task force must do that. Task force shall. Surely we need to give them a name. Boy, that's maybe an amendment I should bring. A conceptual amendment right here. The task force on, oh, here it is. It's in section one. Actually, it doesn't call it out as that. It just describes it as such, task force on corporate housing. I would call this the study public records and tax corporations to advance money to interests that may or may not provide beneficial access to housing task force. Um, I guess I will, in this stupefied manner that I find myself, simply say um, I, I oppose House Bill 1253. Um, don't think you can amend your way out of this, even if you gave all the appointments to the minority leader or his or her successor. Um, I urge a resounding vote against House Bill 1253. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1253. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no? No. The ayes have it. House Bill 1253 is adopted. Will the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1257? House Bill 1257, Representatives Belasco and Bazenacre, Senator Cutter, concerning water quality in mobile home parks and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Senator Cutter. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move House Bill 1257 on second reading. And I have a uh, Finance and Appropriations Committee report. Yes. Let's see. I'm sorry. The Finance in the um, uh, in the Finance Committee, you, we just made okay. a few. Um, I think, darn, I don't remember what we did. <laughs> we just made a few changes that um, that sort of tightened up some of the language and made things a little bit more clear in terms of the study. And in um, preparation? Uh, so to the Finance Committee report. That's, I'm sorry, that's what I was just okay. talking about. In the Finance Committee, we just made a few changes to clarify um, some language around the committee and tighten up some of the language and a few technical changes, and I ask for uh, your support on that. Any further discussion on the Finance Committee report? Seeing none, the question for us is the adoption of the Finance Committee report. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the Finance Committee report is adopted. To the Appropriations Committee report, Senator Cutter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we just appropriated the, the um, funds we needed, and I ask for an aye vote. Any further discussion on the Appropriations Committee report? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the Appropriations Committee report. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the Appropriations Committee report is adopted. To the bill, Senator Cutter. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So there are a number of mobile home parks in Colorado, about more than 800 of them. And they're diverse communities, they're important communities, and a lot of them have um, uh, they're, they're affordable and provide stable housing. It's a really important source of housing in our state. And some are designed for residents 55 and above. There's um, a number of um, uh, people with a, their, uh, an income that's substantially lower than the medium income median income of renters and homeowners. So many people rely on this housing source as either retirement or workforce housing. Um, Res a lot of residents in recent, well, years uh, have been complaining about the water quality, and those concerns have really gone largely unheard. They describe water um, situations where water tastes and smells bad or is discolored. 
and they're forced to buy water instead of relying on their tap water. So they could be caused, these issues could be caused by several things, the source of the supply, the pipes within the park, or the pipes in the mobile homes themselves. So this bill is um, simply providing a pathway for them to, um, for them to have these, these things addressed by the mobile home park owners. Um, upgrading infrastructure is really complicated, and eventually we'll set up a grant fund for this to help mobile home park owners, but the pipes are part of the infrastructure that they own, and um, everyone should be able to have clean drinking water. So I ask for your support on this bill. Any further discussion on House Bill 1257? Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, I um, support this policy uh, very much. Um, I have had an instance in my community um, at a, a community called Elevado. And for whatever reason, um, this community is kind of stuck in, in no man's land where nobody will take responsibility for helping these residents figure out how to get clean, drinkable water. Um, the water has been tested a number of times. It's come up with um, all sorts of uh, impurities, it stinks, it looks bad, it's, it's yellow. Um, the city says that they can't really do anything about it, that it needs to be the county. The county says, oh no, we can't do anything about it, it needs to be the state. The state comes in and says, oh no, uh, this is a local responsibility. Um, at some point, uh, we have to recognize that we have people that are living in these conditions um, and nobody will help them. So I, I feel that this is uh, very important policy uh, that we need to establish some sort of a better process around uh, testing of the water at our mobile home parks and um, and we need to take some action when it very clearly uh, it comes up as being uh, an issue and um, uh, for whatever reason um, in in my instance uh, nobody would was willing to step up and take responsibility and I think that this bill will really help with that so thank you Senator Baisley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, just so that we are all clear on what, what this uh, bill does, but what the, what the ramifications are. It's pretty harsh. Um, a violation of this bill, if it were to become an act, become statute, is considered a violation of the Colorado Consumer Protection Act the bill further establishes that if a, a, a trailer park owner fails to develop a remediation plan or implement the remediation plan, then that trailer park will be considered a class three, three public nuisance and the park owner must forfeit the park. So the park that's been forfeited is because it's a class three pub, public nuisance becomes property of the county where the park's located and the county will continue to operate the park to provide affordable housing for no fewer than 100 years. So, and a park owner who fails to register under the Mobile Home Park Act Dispute Resolution Enforce Enforcement Program violates the Colorado Consumer Protection Act. So, this is more of the government getting into the business of affordable housing very directly it reminds me of the first right of refusal for acquiring um, property and so on. So we're moving down a really risky, dangerous path, not advisable in my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Simpson. Can I request a senatorial five? Response? Yes, we'll go into a senatorial five. Sen Thank Senator Cutter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to clarify that that is not um, no longer, that's an old version of the bill. That is not in the bill that they will lose the, their park. It is just a consumer protection violation. So just so we know. Any further, Senator Will. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, so I, I, uh, I'm quite familiar with uh, this bill and how it came, up, came about and where it came about. And uh, the impetus for this bill came from a, a trailer park in, uh, in the district that I serve. And uh, th there, there are some issues. I've, uh, had, I've had several uh, stakeholder meetings with the residents of the particular park that uh, this bill came about from. Although it's an issue across the state, I know that. But in this particular park, uh, trailer park, we, I mean, we need this. You talk about affordable housing. We have to have these trailer parks. In this particular park that uh, I'm talking about, we, we definitely need it. And there's a, um, there is some discoloration of water. I've got multiple uh, pictures of it. Uh, I, actually, this park is uh, only a few miles from where I live, actually. Uh, a little bit up river and, and, and down the creek. But there's, they've tried to get something done with the water system. Obviously, these parks are privately owned. If it was a municipality, you know, like the, the town of Newcastle or something, we'd already have it fixed, right? There'd already be grants out there. Um, there's all kinds of grants for water systems across uh, these, these small towns and, and small communities. But since it's in private ownership, and my response has been when they ask about um, getting the state, I guess, or, to, uh, to pay for the water system. This particular park just sold two years ago for $24 million. $24 million for this trailer park. So, I mean, it's not like the owners can't afford um, to put in a good water system. This, uh, this particular bill, I have to, I have to tell you because uh, because where I represent and how close I am to this issue, um, I support the, the, the biggest part of this bill because we need to fix it. And as, a, as a, the sponsor said, you know, people, people deserve good, clean drinking water. And, there's, um, and, and I agree with that. I think everyone in this room agrees with that. We deserve that. Um, how we get there is, uh, is another thing. But the, uh, the issue with these parks, and I know, uh, I think uh, the good senator from Alamos will be speaking on it too, because he has several of these parks uh, down in his area. And the, uh, the, I spoke of the affordable housing portion of this. We, we need them, and our communities need them. So it's not about that. It's about uh, how do we... How do we provide that to these residents? And then it's a, it's a little bit of a slippery slope because the, um, to where I live, most of the people on the north side of the river, um, if they have a well good enough for their home, most of them haul water. Uh, but if they have a well good enough for their home, it's not, uh, it's not good drinking water. Uh, so there's, there's water systems all across rural Colorado that uh, that need upgrades. And the community I'm talking about on the north side of the river there, this place called Silt Mesa, what it really needs is there's a good reservoir sits above, uh, quite a ways above the community there, um, needs a water system. And then you can pipe water to all those uh, ranches and farms across that entire mesa. We need that. So it's not, it's not just people in the trailer park that, uh, that need this, it's people all across uh, Rural Colorado, especially those on wells, and, and uh, of course some of the parks are on wells as, as well, but some of them are, uh, you know, off of creek, creeks and have uh, treatment systems. But um, so I'm, I'm just, uh, I want to say that I, <clears throat> I support the intent of the bill and um, what we want to do here, but I don't know how we're going to get to the, uh, how we're going to pay for it. <clears throat> so uh, I'll leave it at that for this for right now. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, Senator Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I heard this bill, I was going to say last night, but I actually think it was this morning. 
it was sometime with the good senator from uh, Arapaho County. Is that correct? Um, in the, yeah. <laughs> to the bill. To the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we heard the bill earlier. Um, and uh, look, water quality for mobile homeowners is, is really paramount. And I think about, we, we talk about mobile home parks. They, they really aren't mobile home parks anymore, the, the vast majority of them. I think within, I, probably within a five mile radius of my hometown, there are seven of these characterized mobile home parks. Um, and I can assure you the homes are in no position, no condition to be mobile. Um, and so it's vitally important that we, we provide assistance where we can and to the level that's necessary to create safe uh, environments for folks with safe drinking supply and wastewater. There's also uh, a provision in this bill for a grant program to help um, land, uh, home park owners uh, be in compliance. I have a couple of instances I've worked with CDPHE and park owners for two years now, trying to create and get them into compliance with wastewater treatment, where again, the park was built 50 years ago and has not, and was in compliance for 40 of those years, but are now out of compliance. And there's nowhere for those constituents to go if the owner was forced to shut the park down. So trying to find creative, innovative ways to stay compliant with safe, health and safety regulations, whether it's freshwater supply or wastewater. I can think of several instances the, where parks have had the ability and were successful in tapping into municipal, municipal supplies if they're close enough. But as the good senator from Newcastle was talking about, several of them rely on groundwater. Um, and then the challenge of, you know, getting the water from the well distributed in, into the homes. And the testing program is very intentional of not testing in the home, so there's no um, confusion about where contamination is occurring, whether it's the, the, the network and the piping inside the home or the delivery from the source to the individual home. So um, I, I supported the bill last night and still, some, still supportive. The fiscal note is a little troubling and the FTEs, but I, I know it's a good investment and, and a necessary one that the challenges the state faces around affordable housing, if we don't take care of these folks, we're, we're gonna compound the problem exponentially. Um, a lot of these folks are retired, low income, a lot of military families. Um, it's just disheartening to think about what would happen in, within my communities if all of a sudden we, we couldn't, pro well, it's disheartening to think that some of those folks are likely um, not receiving safe water supplies right now. So let's get the testing program stood up. Let's provide funding and grants and work with the land or the park owners and the residents again to develop and put together a program to make sure they get safe drinking water in the park. So I appreciate the sponsor um, and the effort here, and it's really important to my community. I I think this was unfolding in the last few weeks in a park in Durango as well, which is in my district. So I haven't stopped to try to count how many mobile home parks there are. I just know there are um, dozens of them within my Senate district, so it's really important to me that we work collaboratively to get safe drinking water supplies to those constituents. So thank you to the sponsor, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would like to, uh, if I could, hear from the sponsor about the uh, the FTEs associated with the fiscal note, because I don't know if I have the most recent fiscal note. There it is. Thank you. So this is a, a May 5th fiscal note. Yeah, this is, yeah, thank you. Thank you to the fine senator from Alamos on this. But, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, FTEs and personal services uh, in 2324 of uh, 10.8 FTEs. And I'm just 
wondering if that's uh, if that's accurate on the fiscal note. Ten FTEs for this program. Yeah, here it is. Senator Cutter. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sure that's accurate, but I also want to point out that's cash funds. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I do. I mean, I do have some some issues with the fiscal note. I do. I don't know that. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, quite a few FTEs and and uh, and a lot of money for this. But uh, all right. Thank you for that clarification. Senator Zunzinger. And um, the good senator from Newcastle, I think? Okay, Correct. yes. Um, also, I just want to point out that um, uh, the way that the, the, the program is funded is through a, a cash fund, um, and it draws from fees that are already being charged to the mobile home parks. Um, and uh, those fees are already happening, and they're just going to be tapping that particular fund source in order to pay for the program. So it's, it's not uh, uh, increasing. Um, it's not uh, taking away from general fund. Um, so it's a program that actually pays for itself um, for the very purposes of what they should be doing in the first place. Um, so uh, I, I think the existing fee is already $24. Uh, per mobile home, and so um, uh, they're just going to be utilizing that particular uh, vehicle in order to implement the program. Seeing no further discussion, a motion before the body is the adoption of House Bill 1257. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The ayes have it, and 1257 is adopted. Ms. Cole, will you please read the title to House Bill 1260? House Bill 1260, Representative Sopra and Valdez, Senators Baisley and Priola concerning tax incentives to maximize investments in semiconductor and advanced manufacturing in Colorado and in connection therewith authorizing the Economic Development Commission to approve refund certificates for certain income tax credits creating a semiconductor manufacturing zone program modifying the Colorado job growth incentive tax credit for semiconductor and advanced manufacturing creating an advanced industries task force and making an appropriation. Senator Priola. Thank you Mr. Chair. Uh, members I move House Bill 1260 and the Appropriations Committee report. To the Appropriations Committee report. Uh, we appropriated some funds in the, or adjusted them in the Appropriations Committee report. The motion is the adoption of the Appropriations Committee report. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the Appropriations Committee report is adopted. To the bill, Senator Priola. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, this is a very important bill for national security that will help um, accentuate the federal legislation in this space, the CHIPS Act at the federal level. Uh, it's very innovative and it will do creative things like create chip zones uh, around. And the chip zones, it's not like free to lay chip zones, it's for microchips for computers and cars and stuff like that. So ask for an I vote. Senator Baisley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, this, is, uh, this will come from the uh, federal government, uh, the, the federal government's CHIPS Act, which is uh, a very large program uh, to try to help. Uh, encourage chip semiconductors um, manufacturing within the U.S. They put $280 billion towards that. Um, our share potentially is $5.5, $5.5 billion, and that's uh, in, as a result of a $15 million investment by the state, which is required if we're going to get in on, uh, on the uh, chip, CHIPS Act. So a, a uh, relatively small investment for an enormous potential return. This does include, by the way, the, uh, the uh, um, emerging quantum computing industry here in Colorado. So it's a $366 per $1 investment potential. I highly recommend an I vote. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of House Bill 1260. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it, and 1260 is adopted. Ms. Cole, will you please read the title to House Bill 1273? House Bill 1273, Representative Snyder and Joseph, Senator Roberts, concerning the creation of the Wildfire Resilient Homes Grant Program, and in connection with making an appropriation. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1273. Any discussion on House Bill 1273? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> 
Uh, this is an exciting bill, colleagues. Uh, this is a bill that will create a, a grant program within the Department of Public Safety to help Coloradans harden their homes against wildfire. Uh, this is uh, incredibly important for a few reasons. One, if somebody can harden their home against wildfire, they of course protect their own home against uh, damage or loss related to a wildfire, but they also protect the homes around them. It has been shown that har homes that have been hardened already prevent the spread of wildfire. Uh, this helps, of course, mitigate uh, disasters as they are happening, but it also will help surrounding homeowners in wildfire uh, urban interfaces with lower insurance costs throughout uh, the years. This is also important for us to set up here in Colorado because there is a uh, uh, high level of federal dollars available uh, for this program. If we can set up even just a little bit of funding at the state level, we can draw down a significant amount of matching dollars to help Coloradans with this. I want to thank the House sponsors. They also put in an amendment in the bill that will means test this program so that those Coloradans who are struggling the most uh, or are more lower income will be the ones who qualify for this assistance first uh, and make it this uh, program as equitable as possible. But this is one tool in the toolbox to help uh, communities deal with wildfire resilience and prevention. And with that, I'd ask for an I vote. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <sighs> Members. I know you all like things that have to deal with wildfire funding. In fact, I know you like it so much that in the legislation and budgetary actions that have occurred over the last three fiscal years, one-time transfers, so this is only the one-time transfers and ongoing appropriations from wildfire-related programs, and this is only, only in the Department of Public Safety. I didn't even go pull up, but I could, Go pull up what we did over in the Department of Natural Resources, but only in the Department of Public Safety. $93 million. $93 million. That's what we have done in the legislative and budgetary actions just in the Department of Public Safety. I don't believe that includes the helicopter from this year either. So add on another 30, 35 million. So in the Department of Public Safety, $93 million. And there are grant programs in there that have been funded. And you're telling me they can't find $100,000 for this? And here, I'm going to go through some more stuff here because I'm pulling up the budget. <clears throat> so just so you understand where this money went to. In 2021, wildfire stimulus package, $14,037,260. $10,811,260 were general fund monies. 20, that was in 2020-2021. In 21-22, wildfire stimulus package, $12,245,969. $10,445,969 of which general fund. In 22-23, we gave $750,000 to the Colorado Team Awareness Kit Systems. I'm sure the good senator from Route County probably knows what that is, but I do not. But it has to do with wildfire legislation and budget actions that went only to the Department of Public Safety. Again, did not go pull up the Department of Natural Resources, but if I need to, I will. Because we are out of control here. Every time they come in, wildfire, we need wildfire mitigation, we need this, we need that. We have been funding wildfire legislation and budget actions just in public safety to the tune of $93 million. And let me just remind you, we gave last year $5 million to CSU Forestry Systems to build greenhouses and put in seedlings. And then this year, we gave them another $5 million to State Forestry, that's in higher education in CSU, for seedlings and to help finish off some more stuff in that greenhouse. That's $10 million that's not in this budget. 
So $93 million, here's what else that $93 million went to. Almost a million bucks to fire commission wrecks. That was in 21, 166. In 22, 002, volunteer fire resources. So now we're funding another million bucks to volunteer fire resources. And the thing is, well, they don't collect enough. Well, guess what? I pay into a fire district and it's over the statewide mills. It's like 12, 13 mills into my fire district. And I heard last night in the discussion, I think that was last night when we had the discussion about 303, maybe it was the night before, I don't know, sometime this week, that the state does not, should not keep backfilling or reimbursing these local governments. That you're supposed to just, this was what I call the tough love speech, you're supposed to toughen up and fund what you need to fund in your department. You know, everybody needs to understand the state, when you have a fire department, and it's volunteer, and I can appreciate that, and I can appreciate that there are smaller fire departments, volunteer fire departments throughout the state of Colorado. What I don't appreciate is that I'm getting taxed at a really high rate with the mill levy to the fire district, and in other fire districts that are not doing that because they're all volunteer, that we're taking state general fund money, my taxpayer dollars, to give to these volunteer fire departments. It's like, Talk to the people who live in your district. But another million bucks. That was a legislative appropriation just for fire, volunteer fire resources. Statutory transfers that we did. 2021. Senate Bill 54, wildfire transfers, three million bucks. Here's the first helicopter, 21113, firefighting aircraft, $30,800,000 thousand dollars sorry thirty million eight hundred thousand dollars twenty two eleven ninety four firefighter resources five million dollars twenty one twenty two disaster preparedness fifteen million five hundred thousand dollars in twenty two twenty three annualizations more fire commission recommendations in 2324, volunteer fire resources, another $4 million. In 2111, or 21113, so 21113, firefighting aircraft, $3.6 million. In 22206, disaster preparedness, $1,834,418. Budget requests. They requested $11,830,823 for fire aviation resources. For fire investigation, they requested $6.4 million, almost $6.5 million. Local fire training, they requested $4.6 million. Fire risk reduction initiative. One point one million five hundred fifty six thousand three hundred nine dollars. They had after we had already given them over a three year period. Ninety three million one hundred thousand eight hundred seven dollars. They came in with on top of that another twenty four million five hundred and twenty five thousand two hundred and twenty two dollars. And we kept funding them. It's not like we didn't fund the money. We kept funding them. And we got down to, you know, you want a helicopter, you want aviation resources, you want money for local firefighter training, when they're supposed to be paying for that themselves. When there's all these regional training centers all around the state of Colorado that Energy and Mineral Impact Grant funds help fund. And oh, by the way, did I mention, we gave, we gave the Department of Natural Resources $10 million out of severance tax operational account for wildfire mitigation. And that included having people in their program where they have kids and other people go out, I think they call it co-swap or something like that, go out and do mitigation around people's homes. 
you know, cut down shrubs and landscaping, do mitigation around people's homes. I don't, what grant do I get to go get money from? I mean, how much money are we going to actually keep putting into this? And here's the thing that really upsets me is when the Department of Public Safety came to us with their gazillion budget requests, because fire safety is only one division in the Department of Public Safety, they had requests all over the place. We funded a huge portion of the requests, and then we funded that additional helicopter that everybody said they had to have out of general fund money. Maybe this is why we can't fund school finance and buy down that budget stabilization factor. Because we can't prioritize. But we continue to fund. But when they came in on their hearing request, we told them to, to tell us, I mean, their requests are all prioritized. And we said, you know what, we're not going to fund all of these. They had like 36 requests. We're not, we're not funding all of these. So which ones are most important to you? And those are the ones we're funded. And guess which one we didn't fund? Two million bucks for wildfire resilient homes grant program. So this came through the Joint Budget Committee and they were told no. Because they told us these other things were more important to them. These other requests were more important. So we funded those. So listen up, Department of Public Safety, because next year, when you come in front of the Joint Budget Committee, I'm going to remember what you did going around the Joint Budget Committee. We asked you, what is it that you would like for us to fund? What are your priorities? And we fund those. $93 million over the last, over the last three years another 24, almost $25 million in requests this year, additional onto all of those programs that we created, that we annualized, that keep going. And so they got to decide what their priority was. And so you know what, when they come to the Joint Budget Committee and they say, this is our priorities, and we work through that with them and fund them, I don't expect the Department of Public Safety, Division of Fire Safety, to go around our backs and go get a bill to do something that was not funded through the JBC, through the long bill. Yeah, they had an opportunity, y'all had an opportunity through the budget amendment process to bring this up. We could have compared it with all of the other budget amendment requests. But that didn't happen either. So I'm sure, I'm sure this is probably going to pass because you all can't see past what's going on in these budget processes. And for some reason, we think we should be paying for people's retrofitting of their home. And you want to know what we heard in appropriations today? 100,000 isn't enough. They started off asking for 2 million over in the house. They got it cut down to 100,000. You know what the 100,000 does? It doesn't do, it's not going to do this grant program. They had to create a grant line though, because you can bet on it, they're gonna come back and ask for more money next year. But they had to create a grant program line item to put money in, and the 100,000, the majority of it is going to outreach. Now I'm pretty sure one of those bills I mentioned, probably, wait, maybe I'm not. I think we did that over in the Department of Natural Resources. We did a huge chunk of change for outreach last year that they're still spending this year. So the 100,000 that we're talking about in this bill is not actually going to a grant program, it's not going to grants. That's what they told us in appropriation. And this is, when I say they, the representative from the Department of Public Safety, they said we're probably going to do mostly outreach with it. But here's the deal. You cannot keep expecting hardworking Coloradoans, those working families, where both the mom and the dad, where both parents go out and work every day, nine to five jobs. Maybe they're working 10 or 12 hour a day jobs. I don't know. 
but they're the ones who are paying the taxes. They get up every day, they make sure their kids are being fed, they make sure their kids are getting to school. They go out, have a job, and all we ever do is think of ways to tax them to pay for things like someone else's deck. Because they live in a fire area, an urban wild area where they knew where they were moving into, and we're gonna help them pay to replace their deck. Or they have wood shingles still on their house, and we're gonna help them pay to replace their roof. Where's the grant that these working families who don't live in these areas, that are paying their taxes, paying those exorbitant property taxes because you all repealed Gallagher, or put it on the ballot to repeal, where's their break? Who's going to help replace their deck or replace their roof? What happened to personal responsibility? You know, did you read the legislative declaration? The General Assembly finds and declares that home ownership in the United States has long been a cornerstone of the American dream. Absolutely. Home ownership presents an opportunity to accumulate wealth, build community, reduce wealth inequality, and improve generational wealth. Great. You would think if it's that important to everybody, they would take personal responsibility to protect their own home. I don't think it's my responsibility or all those other working families out there that are going day to day, working their butts off to provide a living, to have their own home, to provide for their family, and then pay taxes so that we take those taxes and use it to help replace somebody else's deck when maybe they can't do it on their own home because they have to keep paying taxes or they're trying to make ends meet because you know we had 8.3 percent increase this last year inflation they're trying to make ends meet in the meantime we're taking their tax dollars a whole chunk of change i read them off for you 93 million dollars over the last three years 24 million dollar request this year just for the department of public safety doesn't include the department of natural resources but we're taking their general fund monies so that other people can come into the department, go to the grant program, and be able to get money to retrofit their home because they live in an area that may be close to a fire. Somehow, personal responsibility needs to get back into playing, playing in this. People have a personal responsibility to protect their own home. They have a personal responsibility to understand where they live. And if they have a wood deck and they live in a wild, what is it, wildland ur urban interface area, then they have a personal responsibility to protect their home and change that out themselves and pay for it. My taxes, other people who work very diligently to make a living, their taxes should not be used to replace someone else's wood deck because that's what we're talking about here. We already use our taxes in the Department of Natural Resources and programs that help people have defensible spaces, go and clear out the shrubs and the trees and the dead bushes away from their homes. Why is that the general public's responsibility? Why is that not the homeowner's responsibility? And I know I heard, and it even says it here in the declaration, wildfires in Colorado threaten the American dream. Yeah, I think we all know that. Wildfires have become one of the greatest threats. It's a controversial bill because public safety went around the Joint Budget Committee. They came in, we told them, we worked with them on what their priorities were and funded them. And then they worked around the Joint Budget Committee and came in and now a bill's introduced to basically, again, develop a grant program to make sure that people's personal property is funded with general fund tax dollars to ensure that they get to make their home resilient. So we talk about how wildfires become one of the greatest threats. Well, if you live in an urban interface area, I would think you have the understanding where you live and you would know about fires. There have been enough fires since forever, but if you go all the way back to 2001 and all the fires that we've had in this state, 
I don't know how you can't understand that when you live in a wildfire urban interface area that you shouldn't have a wood deck, that you can't have wood shingles, that you need to clear and have a defensible space, and that is your personal responsibility. Seriously, if you are waiting for government to grant you or replace your wood deck or your wood shingles or cut down all three of your shrubs that are dead, that's just wrong. It is your responsibility to take care of that. It is not the general public who go out and pay their taxes, work hard. It is not their responsibility to make sure that your home is protected. That is your responsibility. And over the course of the last two years, we have put millions of dollars into outreach. I mean, I think at this point, you've probably received notices directly to your home, because I think that was in some of those things that we passed last year, to let you know. And I understand. I heard from the good senator from Steamboat. Is that where you're from? Avon. Thank you. I heard from the good senator from Avon about how important it is that people protect their home and that they don't have wood decks. And it's right here, it's right here in the legislative declaration. I don't disagree with any of that. What I disagree with is not requiring people to take personal responsibility for themselves and protect their home and stop using taxpayer money to do it. And what I don't understand is the Department of Public Safety who thought it was a good idea to do a work around the Joint Budget Committee. And I'm pretty sure next year they will have a really complete understanding how I don't think that's a good idea. So, again, I understand that this probably is going to pass because you're all, you all think this is just a great idea and this is how we should be spending taxpayer dollars. I hope you don't vote for the bill. I hope you don't vote for this bill. But if you do, there should be some buy-in from the homeowner. Replacing their entire deck should not be the responsibility of the taxpayers of the state of Colorado. They should have to buy into it, and they should have to provide matching dollars. They should have to have some skin in the game. This should not be all on the dime of the taxpayers. There is an amendment at the desk. Ms. Cole, Sorry, will you please read L006? Amendment L006 by Senator Kirkmeyer, men ring gross bill page fine line seven after division add a homeowner must include on Senator the application. Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L006. To the amendment. So again, members, it should not be on the taxpayer to help people replace their wood decks or their wood shingles or clear a defensible space around their homes when they have chosen to live in a wildfire urban interface area. It should not be on the dime of taxpayers. But if you're going to insist on passing this bill, which again, I hope you don't, but if it should pass, I think that the homeowner should have to put money in and that we shouldn't be funding the whole amount. That way, look at it this way, the money will go farther. Because right now it's $100,000 that's going to outreach. Next year you can bet on it, they're going to come back and say they want two to five million bucks. And I look forward to that discussion in the Joint Budget Committee hearing. But what this amendment does is says, is that during the, in the application process, the homeowner must include on the application the projected total cost of the improvement proposed. So this means they're going to have to go out and get some bids. No faking it. No saying it's going to cost 30000 bucks. They get the grant, and then they do it themselves, and they end up making money on the deal. We heard about how insurance scams happen. We don't want our grant, this grant program to get scammed either. So, the application would have to have the projected total cost of the improvement proposed by the homeowner, and the division shall not award a grant in the amount of more than 30% of the total projected cost. So this is a 70-30 match. So they have to put in 70% of the costs, and we put in 30%. Still a deal, because there are plenty of taxpayers in this state that won't be able to even apply for this money. 
There are plenty of taxpayers in this state that will not be able to apply for this money. Their taxes are going to pay for somebody else's replacement of their wood deck or their roof or clean a dispensable, defensible space for them. So I ask for an I vote on L06. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the good Senator from Brighton uh, for this conversation. Uh, respectfully, I've asked for a no vote on the amendment um, for a couple reasons. One, the amendments that the House put on this bill, I think, address some of the concerns that, that you are trying to address here. The, the amendments put on the House say that uh, the homeowner needs to submit an application and that the department shall ensure that things like their homeowner's income and assets are being uh, considered, that this is essentially being means tested and it shall be prioritized to the folks who need the help the most. Uh, are, are the ones receiving the grants. This essentially means it's not going to go to somebody's second home. It's not going to go to higher income or, or higher uh, value homes that the, where the homeowners have the money to do this themselves. Second, I just want to point out, these are not people choosing, this is not about people choosing to live in the wildland urban interface. This is about the wildland urban interface coming to them. These are people who live in, uh, in not high value homes where because of a ongoing drought, in extremely dry summers caused by climate change, the wildland urban interface has come to them. They deserve some assistance to harden their homes, and this will help not just those individual homeowners. This bill is endorsed by people like the Rocky Mountain Insurance Association, the Colorado Municipal League, the Colorado Association of Home Builders, the Colorado Springs Chamber of Commerce, because by hardening homes, it lowers everybody's insurance costs. This will save the entire uh, homeowner's insurance uh, market money if we can help people who live in the urban inter wildland urban interface uh, protect themselves. So with that, uh, respectfully ask for a no vote because I think the House amendments address the concerns raised in L006. Senator Kirkmeyer. So people do choose to live in their homes and in these areas. The drought is occurring throughout the whole state of Colorado. I don't see anything in here that says, because I live in an area that has high drought out on the Eastern Plains, where if a fire starts out there, it just ravages through very quickly. I don't see anything in here that says they get to get a grant. They would do better off if they didn't have a wood deck as well, or wood shingles on their house, or had a defensible space around, harden their house. There's nothing in here for that. The wildfire urban interface area, yes, yes, yes. Those are areas of the state where local governments permitted housing. And they have building codes. And people did choose to live there. Did anyone know the Marshall Fire when it took off? I mean, it could have wiped out all of Broomfield, which is not in a wild, wildfire urban interface area. It could have wiped out a whole bunch of Arvada. Again, not in a wildfire urban interface area. It was streaming right down 36, Highway 36. It could have wiped out Westminster because it was moving so fast. None of those people can get into this grant program. They're not in a wildfire urban interface area. So again, in awarding the grants, says they shall consider the location of the homeowner's property. Okay. Whether the property is a primary residence. That makes sense. The income or assets from all sources of the homeowner. The type of improvement proposed by the homeowner. And other criteria established by the division. There isn't anything in there about the cost of the improvement. The division may require applicants to provide information on the applicant's income, and the division may prioritize income levels of applicants in awarding grants. Great. So if you can afford to do it yourself, you have to go do it yourself. But if you decided that you have a different income level and you're using your money somewhere else, you can come apply for this grant. 
if you didn't prioritize because you live in an area where it's high drought and you live in the mountains and you live in an area where there could be fires and you didn't prioritize taking care of your own home because that is the American dream, your single largest probably expense that you'll ever have in your life, and you didn't prioritize it and take the personal responsibility to protect your home, you can come apply for a grant and be first in line. And then it says, a homeowner who receives a grant pursuant to this section shall not use the money for any purpose that is not authorized by this section. And then it says, upon completion of the retrofit of imp or improvements for which the grant was awarded, a homeowner shall submit to the division the certification of costs and any other documentation that the division may require. Well, at least we finally got to costs. But that's it. So there's nothing in here that says you should have to put some of your own money in for the improvement. Yet all the rest of the taxpayers of this state should be paying for this. So I ask for an I vote on L006, which says that the award grant cannot be more than 30% of the total projected cost of the improvement. So they're going to get 30%. That's a heck of a lot better than you would get from FEMA. That's a heck of a lot better you can get from your insurance company, if you have insurance, which you probably have to have. But anyways, it's still you're going to get a grant. Are you going to get it for the full amount? No, because you should have some responsibility to protect and harden your home. And it should not fall on all of the taxpayers of the state of Colorado. I ask for an I vote on L006. Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I rise in support of L006, and, and actually I, I do support the bill, but uh, as I've said to the good senator from Avon uh, when we heard this bill in appropriations uh, earlier today, that, uh, and I think this is a good idea, uh, uh, you know, 70, 30, whatever, I definitely agree that, uh, that the homeowner should have some skin in the game. Uh, what that exact percentage is, I don't know, but 70, 30. Uh, uh, and, you know, for the, for the homeowner to uh, the uh, state and these uh, uh, funds are already helping, it's a big deal. Uh, I know uh, from personal experience uh, that uh, uh, my, my wife and I, we have a cabin up in the mountains, so to speak, we do. And uh, years ago, just give you the short version, uh, we, we had a new roof put on, uh, a, a metal coated, uh, 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 stone coated metal roof. And we paid for it ourselves. I, I, I negotiated a deal uh, kind of with the insurance company, uh, but uh, it was me and the insurance company who paid for it. And then we had a new deck put on, and instead of wood, we had the wood deck taken out. Uh, we had a, a Trex deck put on at our expense, uh, totally. There was no insurance involved. Uh, <clears throat> so I think this is reasonable. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm for the bill uh, because I think that people that will go out and be proactive, which is what we want them to be, proactive to protect their properties, um, uh, that will save money in the long run. And I think it will also bring down insurance premiums, is that if more and more people get the idea, uh, you know, there's nothing like... Uh, 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 equity ownership. If you have your own money at risk, you're uh, uh, you're going to be inclined to uh, protect that and work harder. So, if you're uh, putting on a new roof or new deck or whatever you're doing to protect your property, uh, you know you've got a vested interest in that. And the more that that you and your neighbors do this type of thing, the uh, the insurance rates will. I, I do believe the insurance rates will ultimately come down. I know that uh, my insurance company, um, I've been very proactive and said, hey, look, put on a new roof. I did this, I did that. I would hope and expect that I would get somewhat of a break, and indeed I have. So uh, I support the amendment uh, L006, I believe, L006, and I do support the bill also. Thank you. 
Seeing no further discussion on L006, the motion is the adoption of L006. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. No. The noes have it, and L006 is lost. To the bill, Senator Kirkmeyer. There is an amendment at the desk. Ms. Cole, will you please read L008? Amendment L008 by Senator, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, well, you didn't like 70-30. How about 50-50? 50-50. So think about it. It makes the money go farther within the grant. If we're truly trying to get to as many people as possible, everyone should have some skin in the game, so to speak. And in this one, it would be 50-50. You could get a grant, you could get money for 50% of what it costs you to replace your deck, your wood deck. You could get 50% of what it costs to replace your roof. 50% of what it costs you to do defensible space around your home. 50% of what is your responsibility to do, but you could get a grant for 50% of it to harden your home. Senator Kirkmeyer. I need to move. L no. <laughs> I need to move L008. So moved. So thank you, Mr. Chair. So L008, as I just said, you still have to have the application, still has to have the projected total cost of the improvement proposed by the homeowner. And then the division shall not award a grant in amount of more than 50% of the total projected cost of the improvement as reported on the application. So 50-50. I think that's a good deal. I urge an I vote on L008. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I uh, thank you to the good Senator from Brighton. I appreciate the spirit of this amendment as well, and it, it's certainly uh, uh, an increase from 30%. I think, uh, however, I, I, I still will encourage a no vote on this because because of the amendments that were put on the House that essentially means test this program, we are targeting people who don't have the financial resources to do this in the first place. And if there is a requirement that they put in a significant amount of money uh, to begin with to even do the project, it is likely that they won't do it at all. And then it won't be solving the issue that we're trying to solve of helping low-income homeowners harden their homes as opposed to uh, second homeowners or higher income people hardening their homes. So uh, in the spirit of what the bill is intended to do, I think this amendment would frustrate the success of the program and I'd ask for a uh, no vote. The motion is the adoption of L008. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. no. The noes have it and L008 is lost. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, 1273, you've heard me talk about it, heard my comments with regard to it. The amount of money that we have funded for wildfire mitigation in this state, wildfire outreach, and I only talked about the money that went through the Department of Public Safety. I didn't even begin to speak about the money that went through the Department of Natural Resources. So we have funded hundreds of millions of dollars towards wildfire mitigation, wildfire hardening of people's homes in defensible space areas, outreach, helicopters, you name it, we have funded it. The Department of Public Safety came in, asked for close to $25 million worth of requests, and that was just in the Fire Safety Division. That wasn't even the whole request from the Department of Public Safety. I'm only talking about the Fire Safety Division area. And when we asked them what their top priorities were, those were the areas that we funded. This was not one of them. Had I known that they were going to go around the Joint Budget Committee and essentially, in my mind, go behind our backs, which is how I feel. I'm not saying anyone else feels that way. That is how I feel. I feel like they were not forthcoming in the discussions that they had with the Joint Budget Committee. So again, I'm sure this is going to pass. I don't think it's the responsibility of all the taxpayers in the state of Colorado to ensure that we pay for someone's replacement of their wood deck or of their roof or of their cleaning out their def defensible space area. I don't think that is always, after everything we've already done in this area, 
the taxpayers of this state their responsibility. I think people have a responsibility. If your home is your American dream and it's your home, you have a responsibility to protect it. You have a responsibility to take care of it. And that should be your, one of your first priorities. So I don't believe that we should be putting money into this. And I would urge a no vote on 1273. And I hope the Department of Public Safety is listening because we'll be having a great conversation next year. The motion is the adoption of House Bill 1273. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it and 1273 is adopted. Ms. Cole, will you please read the title to House Bill 1277? House Bill 1277, Representatives Marshall and Taggart, Senators Colco and Smallwood, concerning the filing of income tax returns by business entities. Senator Colker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 23-1277 in second reading. Any discussion? Do we have an appropriations? Uh, an appropriations committee. No, no, we're good. No reports. The motion. Hold on. Oh, we got a picture. We need a 16-year-old here. <laughs> I'll let you take one with me in it, and then I'll get out of it so it looks better. <laughs> That's enough. We'll filibuster in our own bill with pictures. <laughs> the motion is the adoption of House Bill 1277. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and 1277 is adopted. Ms. Cole, will you please read the title to House Bill? Twenty-three dash one two eight one. House Bill 1281, Representative Satona V. Hill, Senators Cutter and Priola, concerning measures to advance the use of clean hydrogen in the state and in connection with Senator making Priola. an appropriation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, I move House Bill 1285 and ask for an I vote. I'm sorry, House Bill 1281. The motion is the adoption of House Bill 1281. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and 1281 is adopted. <laughs> Ms. Cole, will you please read the title to House Bill 1065? House Bill 1065, Representative Story and Parenti, Senator Marchman, concerning the scope of the Independent Ethics Commission's jurisdiction over ethics complaints against local government officials and employees and in connection therewith expanding the Independent Ethics Commission's jurisdiction to include school districts and special districts and making an appropriation. We are going to take a Senator 05. Senator Zinziger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. May I request a senatorial five? Senatorial five granted.
Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I move uh, the committee proceed out of order for consideration of House Bill 1112. The motion is to proceed out of order in, for consideration of House Bill 1112. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the committee will proceed out of order. Ms. Cole, will you please read the title to House Bill 1112? House Bill 1112, Representatives Bird and Young, Senators Hansen and Kolker, concerning the enlargement of certain income tax credits for low and middle income working individuals Committee or families report. and in connection therewith, reducing Finance state income tax revenue by increasing the earned income tax credit and increasing the child tax credit. Senator Hansen. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 111 and the Finance Committee report and the Appropriations Committee report. Sorry, 1112. Uh, to the Finance report. All right, thanks very much. Uh, the Finance Committee, we did make uh, some changes. Principally, the, uh, the, the main thing we did in finance was to make the child tax credit not tied to the federal mechanism and made it flat across income, uh, eligible income levels in Colorado. We think this will make it much easier to administer and help the neediest families take advantage of the child tax credit. So I urge your adoption of the Finance Committee report. The motion is the adoption of the Finance Committee report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the Finance Committee report is adopted. <laughs> to the bill, Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, th I, th I think we do have the Appropriations Committee report. No? Oh, my apologies. No. Uh, I was trying to remember and glad to get that clarified. All right, to the bill. We do have uh, one amendment we'd love to have considered. There is an amendment at the desk. Ms. Cole, will you please read L10? Amendment L010 Senator by Senator Hansen. Hansen. Uh, thank you. I move L010 to House Bill 1112. Any discussion on Amendment L10? Senator Hansen. Yeah, quick explanation, colleagues. Uh, this is uh, a technical cleanup to make sure that the organizational issues that we had from the Finance Committee amendments uh, all end up in the right place. It was literally the matter of a colon that needed to be moved, and so I urge your adoption of L010. Pardon me, a semicolon, a semicolon. Yes, still, still have my parts. The motion is the adoption of L10. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The ayes have it, and L10 is adopted. Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And just a, a few quick summary comments about the importance of 1112. Uh, this is a bill we've been working on since the interim committee process over the summer. Uh, a lot of great support for this idea of enhancing the earned income tax credit, in this case, taking it from 25% of federal eligibility up to 38%, as well as expanding the eligibility and the format uh, for the child tax credit to help the families in the state that need it the most and, and to reduce child poverty in Colorado. And I urge your support of House Bill 1112. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before the body is the adoption of House Bill 1112. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it and House Bill 1112 is adopted. Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to lay over the balance of the special orders calendar until tomorrow, May 6th. The motion is to lay over the balance of the special orders second reading of bills calendar until tomorrow, May 6th. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the balance of the calendar is laid over. Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the committee rise and report. The motion is to, for the committee to rise and report. All in favor say aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the committee will rise and report.
The Senate will come to order. Senator Henriksen. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, your committee has had a number of bills under consideration. Ms. Cole, will you please read the report? Mr. President, your committee of the whole begs leave to report it has had under consideration the following attached bills being the second reading thereof and makes the following recommendations are on. House Bill 1069, House Bill 1147 is amended, House Bill 1189 is amended, House Bill 1198, House Bill 1253 is amended, House Bill 1257 is amended, House Bill 1260 is amended, House Bill 1273, House Bill 1277, House Bill 1281, House Bill 1112 as amended, passed on second reading in order to revise and place on the calendar for third reading and final passage, House Bill 1065 laid over until May 6, 2023 and retaining its place on the calendar. Senator Hendrickson. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the report. The motion is the adoption of the Committee of the Whole Report. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 34 ayes, zero noes, zero absent, one excuse, the committee of the whole report is adopted. <laughs> House bills 1069, 1147 is amended, 1189 is amended, 1198, 1253 is amended, 1257 is amended, 1260 is amended, 1273, 1277, 1281, 1112 is amended, passed in second reading order, revised and placed on the calendar, for third reading and final passage, House Bill 1065 laid over until May 6 and retaining its place on the calendar. The Senate will stand in a senatorial five. Message from the House. May 5th, 2023, Mr. President, your House, the House has passed on third reading and transmitted to the Revisor of Statutes, House Bill 1194, 1220, 1048, and 1066 amended is printed in House Journal May 3rd, 2023. The House has passed on third reading and transmitted to the Revisor of Statutes, House Bill 1084 and 1200 amended is printed in House Journal May 4th, 2023. The House has passed on third reading and transmitted to the Revisor of Statutes, Senate Bill 75 amended on third reading as printed in House Journal May 5th, 2023. The House has passed on third reading and transmitted to the Revisor of Statutes, Senate Bill 213 amended is printed in House Journal May 4th, 2023. The House has passed on third reading and returns here with Senate Bill 279. In response to the request of the Senate, the Speaker's appointed Representatives McCormick, Chair Sirota, and Soper as House Conferees on the First Conference Committee on Senate Bill 16. Message from the Reviser. May 5th, 2023, we herewith transmit without comment as amended House Bills 1048, 1066, 1084, 1194, 1200, and 1220 without comment as amended Senate Bill 75 and 213. Sign of bills. May 5th, 2023, the President has signed House Bill 1201, 1224, 1225, 1227, 1234, House Bill 1012, 1075, 1095, 1100, 1130, Senate Bill 2967, 111, 153, 249, 254, 283, and 287. What's that? Delivery to the governor. May 5th, 2023, for the, to the governor for signature on Friday, May 5th, 2023, at 11.59 a.m. Senate Bills 5, 6, 13, 28, 31, 39, 49, 53, 72, 87, 99, 161, 163, 165, 178, 184, 192, 204, 264, 265, and 284. Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate take up House Bill 1120, 1120 on special orders second reading at the hour of 8.51 p.m. Colleagues, calendars are being distributed to your desks. The motion is that the Senate take up House Bill 1120 on special orders at the hour of 8.51 p.m. This does require two-thirds Vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. The Senate will take up House Bill 1120 on special orders to the hour of 8.51 p.m. Special order, second reading of bills. Senator Bridges. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the Senate resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for consideration of special orders, second reading of bills. You've heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. The Senate will resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for the consideration of the special order, second reading of bills, and Senator Bridges will take yeah, the chair. I'll grab the packet in just a second. 
You start. I'm going to go around. Okay. Okay. The Senate will come to order. Will the clerk please read the title to House Bill 1120? House Bill 1120. House Bill 1120, Representatives Joseph and Ortiz, Senators Fields and Winter F, concerning an eviction protections for residential tenants who receive public assistance and in connection with making an appropriation. Senator Fields. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1120. There is no committee report. There is an appropriations committee report. Senator Winter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also move the Appropriations Committee report for Senate Bill 1120. To the Appropriations Committee report, is there any discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the Appropriations Committee report. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. That report is adopted. There is an amendment. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L? Twenty-five. L zero two five by Senator Fields and Senator Rose Fields. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We move um, amendment L zero zero five. L zero two five. L zero two five. Excellent. To the amendment. Thank you, members. This amendment is just to ensure the funding for House Bill 1120 is appropriate uh, as it relates to the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee, and I ask for an I vote. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L25. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. L25 is adopted. To the bill. Senator Winter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move 1120 uh, for approval. This is a fantastic way to make sure that we are stabilizing communities and stabilizing families. Uh, when the government is investing in people, whether through SSI, SSD, or TANF, we know that these are some of the most vulnerable people in our society, and when they have stable housing, when they are stable, when they have ability to um, pay their rent, and all this does is provide two weeks for mediation to ensure we're protecting that public investment into their housing, we're protecting the most vulnerable of families, we're protecting the disability community, and I encourage you to vote. Seeing no further discussion, the question so close. Mr. Minority Leader. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, there will be discussion on this. It's a substantial um, change in policy and with substantial economic uh, changes and consequences. And I believe, as so many of these bills, a, a substantial impact that will be in the opposite direction of what the sponsors um, seek to have. Although they did not give you a, a broad explanation of what the bill does or why it's being sought, um, I will give you some perspectives on the, the potential negative outcomes from this. Um, House Bill 1120 lengthens Colorado's three-month eviction process to approximately five months. R current law takes three months to, to evict someone um, from a property. This would extend that, not by double, but by an additional two months. By requiring, but not providing, mediation prior to a case filing and imposing for th a 30-day stay on court possession orders for any resident receiving most of the income-based, disability-based government assistance programs and financial payments. For a housing provider to be able to inexpensively loan a piece of property, which is what renting is, to a rental customer, there must be a reasonable, predictable, reasonably priced, and reasonably timed mechanism to get the property back in the event of a customer's default. 
It's just the way it works. There won't be any housing stock at some point if there isn't a reasonable, reasonably timed, reasonably priced method of keeping that which is yours. If you own a home and you choose to rent it, it's still your home. It's still your property. You still have a right to it at some point. And under the law, we've got provisions that say you can't just kick somebody out, march in and throw them out on their ear because you, and they, you may have cause, you may have legitimate cause, you still can't just throw them out on their ear. There's a process. And it takes three months. Currently, this bill would extend it to five for a specific group of individuals, those who are receiving government subsidy and assistance um, based on income or disability. So Colorado's eviction process already takes three months from start to finish. And this bill adds two new delays, a lot of additional expense and unpredictable outcomes to an already long and expensive process. Eviction is the remedy of last resort for a provider, a housing provider. No one at the end of the day actually wants to evict someone. They want the agreement that is known as a lease to be upheld, fulfilled, and completed by both parties. It's a marketplace transaction at the beginning, willing buyer, willing seller, an agreement of the minds. I would like the value you're providing, which is shelter for myself and my family. You would like the value I'm providing, a specified rent, specified requirements of how I will treat the property, specified time frames for the rents to be paid. And so it's a willing buyer, willing seller entering into an agreement. That's what everybody wants. And then they want that to last, persist. And then for the individual who's renting to either rent again from the same housing provider or to move on to a, a better opportunity for them. And the housing provider then has the ability to lease the property out, rent the property out to someone else. It, as I mentioned, evictions expensive, time consuming and unpredictable. Housing providers lose a material amount of money with each eviction. It's a net loss, which is part of the reason why you want to avoid it. Between the cost of eviction and the lost rent, the average housing provider currently loses more than $6,000 in a full term eviction, that three month process that exists in law now. The delays and added expenses expected from this bill, should it become law, will push those losses up by a, almost 50% to about $10,000. Colorado's requirement that a housing provider file a lawsuit anytime a customer refuses to return the property and anytime there is any ambiguity about whether the customer has moved is already dangerously long and prevents housing providers from taking chances with customers that have a marginal rental history. And this is where this bill gets really tricky. The bill seeks to, to stand in the gap on behalf of people that, that have challenges financially already. It says treat them differently because they have these financial risks and difficulties that they are receiving government support um, for either income-based or disability-based causes. Well, the same thing is happening on the side of the housing provider. They are also leaning in. They're saying this is a, a marginal circumstance. This is more risky perhaps than others. Other tenants might be folks with a better credit history, folks with a better pattern, proven pattern of having paid the rent on time and in the appropriate amount. And so for someone to rent out their properties to individuals who may or may not be able to um, make the payments 
is already a challenging prospect. It would be easier and better to rent it to somebody who is more certain to, to provide the rent, to pay the rent. And so preserving an adequate supply, an adequate stock, or any opportunities, frankly, for folks who have a challenging or marginal rental history is incredibly important. And this bill will put greater pressure on that limited housing stock. Mediation has no ability to issue an order for possession and consequently is a venue that cannot give the housing provider the legal relief sought. The delay provided by mediation is only for the benefit of someone seeking to delay possession. So it steps in the gap, and I understand exactly the intention, and that, that there is merit in that. But there is also risk in that. And that risk, the added risk, is fundamental to my opposition to the bill because I believe that it will dry up the stock of rental opportunities for individuals of, of this class. The mediation ordered by this bill is before the case is even filed. Again, remember, we've got that three-month process in existing law that includes the case being filed, lawsuit, and removing the mediation from any control by the courts and leaving a housing provider with no remedy for uncooperative residents. And think about that. It's likely that somebody's, you know, in a circumstance where they've found economic hardship, they can't pay the rent, they've, there's been some other challenge that has caused a, a, a legitimate reason for the housing provider to be able to legally demand the property back. They're in a, a challenged and um, circumstance. The likelihood of them being uncooperative, I would argue, is extremely high. And so the mediation ends up being a one-sided sort of affair. Refusal to cooperate with mediation will become an encouraged tactic for defendants desiring to stall the litigation process. So it adds um, a potential roadblock in. And I understand, I, every step of the way here, I understand why you might want to put your, your foot on the scale on behalf of these individuals who are um, in a um, income-based or uh, disability-based government assistance circumstance. But at the same time, the, the broader, and our, our, our goal here, our responsibility here, isn't to solve an individual problem or a problem for one or two or 10 people. It's to make sure that we write policy that serves broadly as many people as we can and serves everyone if there's, if there's a possibility. My argument is this bill um, is going to be challenged in doing that in the pursuit of protecting the limited number of individuals. It's going to, in fact, the, those being the folks who um, are, are uh, subject to eviction, it's going to disrupt and reduce the availability of housing to others who are in a similar economic circumstance and would, quite frankly, perhaps be better at paying the rent on time, living within the terms of the lease in such a way that they don't, don't find themselves um, being asked to leave the property. The mediation ordered by this bill is not provided by the courts. Rather, unsophisticated litigants are left to invent an unavailable mediation process of their own. One of the biggest delays in the eviction process is the delay in county sheriff's offices in executing the court-ordered writ of restitution. These delays can take up to two months. So we've got a three-month three legal process, potential delays in actually issuing the writ of restitution and an additional potential two-month delay built in to this legislation. Mandating the additional 30 days makes this delay even more unreasonable. The average length of a rent demand across the country is five days. Colorado's existing is a 10-day length, and that's twice the average that was just le legislatively changed from three days two years ago. 
Colorado already has the sixth largest or longest um, demand requirement of all the states. So um, I think there are others who have comments that they'd like to make to this. I have a number of amendments that I would offer that I believe would improve um, the prospects of this bill actually serving the individuals that it seeks to serve more effectively. Um, and I will be back up with those amendments at some point here. I don't uh, have them queued in the attic to fall from the sky at the appropriate moment at this point, so I need to do a little bit of prep work to make that happen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Amendments will be raining on the desk at some point in the future, however, not at the moment. Is there any further discussion? Oh, Senator Rich. I have a feeling this one's going to be trading off for a while. Senator Rich, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yes, uh, I guess it was in the last week of April, and maybe that was just a couple of weeks ago, we heard this in local government, and I was a no vote then. Most likely will be a no vote tonight if we don't make some changes. Um, I'm just going to read you something here about this bill. This bill prohibits a law enforcement officer from executing a writ of restitution against a tenant for at least 30 days after the entry of judgment if the tenant receives cash, cash assistance, except in the case where a court has ordered a judgment for possession for a substantial violation or the landlord has fewer than five single family rental homes and no more than five total rental units. Written demands must include a statement about right to mediation prior to the landlord filing an eviction complaint. The rental agreement must also include a statement that current law prohibits source of income discrimination and requires a non-exempt landlord to accept any lawful and verifiable source of money paid directly, indirectly, or on behalf of a person. The bill prohibits a written rental agreement from including a waiver of mandatory mediation or a clause allowing a landlord to recoup costs associated with mandatory mediation. So for someone that actually owns the property, there's a lot they have to, have to abide by if they're going to rent it as though it wasn't even theirs. Mandatory mediation could come at a large cost to both the tenant and the landlord. I think there's legal defense fund for the tenant, but not for the landlord. Not only does the mandatory mediation have to be done by a trained neutral third party, but legal representation will likely be necessary to be present while not mandated by the bill. According to the Vice President of Government Affairs for the Denver Chamber of Commerce, mediation only succeeds if there is a genuine attempt to settle on both sides. If a party has been compelled to mediate against its will, it is quite likely to fail to participate fully in the process, thereby wasting both its own and its opponent's time and costs. The fiscal note estimates that 2,912 individuals will qualify for mandatory mediation proceedings annually if this bill passes. This bill will, will result in high rental costs to the tenant in order to help cover potential legal fees should mediation be necessary in the event of an ex eviction. Uh, in the committee testimony, uh, the Vice President of Government Affairs for Den Denver Metro Chamber expressed their opposition to the bill, stating that this bill, along with other proposed so-called affordable housing legislation, is mandatory mediation, increased risk, and new rental provisions are of particular concern to landlords and developers and will slow investment in more housing in Colorado. As an example, applications for new apartment development declined by a shocking 88% in the three months following the passage of a new affordable housing ordinance in Denver alone. 
The main line of argument is to give more accessibility to those receiving cash assistance, supplemental security income, federal social security disability insurance, or cash assistance for housing. The idea is that it moves society from focusing on equity to empowerment. In a Progress Now's article about the bill, they claim that it advances social equity by giving tenants with disabilities more negotiating power in the eviction process. It also requires reasonable extra time for them to find new housing that meets their accessibility needs if they are evicted. In a Colorado Politics article covering this bill, opponents argued that the bill would make the eviction process too long, ultimately disincentivizing landlords and developers from investing in Colorado's rental industry. This bill, as in the case with other affordable housing legislation proposed this session, will work in the opposite way of their proposed intention. Colorado is about to become even less affordable for those interested in housing, particularly intra-level housing. Um, like the uh, minority leaders said, uh, the eviction process has now been extended to five months. And when I talk to legislators or realtors or uh, in my district, they say that once the eviction process has started, a lot of the uh, apartments get torn up and go into almost a destructive mode. And the cost to the people that actually own the property becomes even greater because it's uh, with that long of a time, it's just created some very hard feelings uh, among both parties. And uh, I think this is just going to work in an opposite direction. I would urge a no vote. Senator Winter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what I think is interesting about this is we're assuming that every eviction is an eviction, and that's the ultimate goal. When one of the reasons we're doing this is to try and keep people housed and stable, and we have folks that do this work every single day, and we have a letter from the Mediation uh, Association of Colorado. Um, in some of the quotes from this, I won't read the whole letter, but while mandatory mediation will greatly benefit the landlords and tenants covered by this legislation uh, in the following ways. So it increases the obligation for mediation costs um, for the person. However, what happens is every single time that a mediation gets resolved, which a lot of mediations do get resolved, you're actually saving time for the landlord and you're saving costs. Um, Every single time one of these cases is mediated and settled, it dramatically reduces the landlord's costs. There would be no court filing fee, no service to process fee, no attorney's fees, no time off work to appear in court, no eviction enforcement costs, no cost to evicting the actual tenant. Um, and these eviction cases typically involve only a few basic issues centered on possession and payment. And when you can work through these issues through mediation, the tenant's more likely to stay there. The income for the landlord is more stable. They're not spending thousands of dollars on an eviction proceeding, and they get to keep the tenant that's paying their rent. More often than not, these mediation cases work. We're already investing in these, family through pub these families through public benefits. And it is a problem when 1% of housing is accessible for the disability community. So yeah, if you're being evicted and you remember the disability community and only 1% of housing is available to you, I think it's worth that two weeks for mediation. Senator Fields. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And just responding so, to some of the comments that were shared earlier, 
um, in reference to landlords indicating that oftentimes when people are in these eviction scenarios, they just tear up the property. And I just want to refocus that this is for a very protected uh, class of people that we're trying to protect, and those are people who are on SSDI, that's Social Security Disability. Um, that's TANF, temporary assistance for people who need food. So we're talking about families and children. And it just doesn't make sense for this population to want to tear up property knowing that they're going to have to be housed somewhere else. And when you have a disability, it's difficult to find housing that might meet your need. So they're more in the, on the side of wanting to get resolution. No one wants to be unhoused. And there's no way for, for them to want to destroy someone's property as they're in this mediation process or looking at eviction knowing that they're going to have to um, get another location. So we need to understand that there's empathy that needs to be demonstrated when people have disabilities. And basically what this policy does, it provides an opportunity for mediation to take place, to transition someone or to resolve a housing issue. That's what we're trying to do here, is we're trying to create an opportunity for resolution to take place through mediation to keep people housed. Now, I'm concerned about some of the numbers because when I, I did the math, I did not come up with the scenario where well, well, someone's going to be still in the house for, for five months. Maybe that's possible, but my understanding, the way I understand it, is that the process might take two weeks. You have your 20 days, which is in statute. It might take a little longer, but I don't see a scenario where it's going to take five months. So let's bring the numbers down. This is not for everybody. This is for our most vulnerable people. People who are on food stamps. People are getting on fixed income. And we're trying to give them an opportunity to resolve their housing issue through mediation before they're unhoused and they're seeking another opportunity. I think it's reasonable. I think it's appropriate. And I think it's the right things to do as it relates to caring for people who are dealing with issues like disability and Social Security and not being able to find a place right away. They might need a little extra time. And so this legislation will help that opportunity to, um, to happen. So I urge and I vote for this very unique special population. They deserve it. Senator Rich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have a couple of comments. First off, I, I'm talking about this very specific bill when I say that I have talked with our realtors in my district. And you can, you can, say, you can sit there and you can tell me that they will, they will not tear up that property. But they have pictures. So it happens. Now, I can understand why the Mediation Association would support this bill. They, they stand to make money on this. Uh, I don't know what their, what their fees are, but this could take a while because they have to get scheduled and people have to be willing to go. So when we talk about months, it's, it's not realistic to just say, oh, it's going to just take two weeks. And when they're in mediation, what do you think is going to happen? Because if they're not paying their rent, what, what, what's going to be the negotiation there? What is that point uh, for, for doing this? Because it, you go to mediation, but if, if nothing is resolved, and uh, we've, we've got articles and we've got people that testified that are, are really working with people with disabilities, and they're not even charging these people $1,000 a month, they're, and they're doing everything they can to keep them there. But if they decide not to pay their, their rent, what's going to be the negotiation piece? Uh, if you could answer that question. Senator Felton. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I served on the local government committee that heard this bill. Uh, there are several disturbing things about this bill uh, that we heard in committee. Uh, again, another renter-centric bill that uh, is all about the renter and, and really leaves the landlords uh, kind of in a bad spot again. You know, uh, critics of this bill have argued that it would make the eviction process too long and disincentivize landlords and developers from investing in Colorado rental industry. And we heard from some people that do own rentals in this state that uh, this bill, along with many others, have gotten them to a point that, uh, you know, they, they are looking to invest in other states, liquidate what they have here, and I don't think that's in the best interest of the renter or the industry itself. Uh, one thing, you know, that really bothered me about this bill was the whole mediation process. Uh, what they want to do is mediate, uh, and then we'll just see what happens. Well, uh, currently, the landlord gets to uh, file for eviction, and then mediation can happen. And uh, that, you know, that point really bothered me. So I, I ran an amendment in in committee, uh, you know, that would. Uh, solve that so uh, with that there is an amendment at the desk will the clerk please read L 38 amendment L038 thank you mr. chair uh, what amendment L 038 uh, simply does there's you know a couple of different places it does things but the main thing it does is the complainant will comply with mediation services ordered by the court which means the mediation will take place after uh, an order of eviction is is placed um, I think it helps bring both parties together because they have to as soon as that that uh, eviction is uh, filed they have to come together Without that, I think, uh, especially in some renters' minds, uh, they may not be so motivated to show up. Uh, so um, with that, I urge a yes vote on Amendment L-38. Senator Fields. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. This is a very familiar amendment. We saw this amendment uh, in committee. Uh, we pass it as a no. We do not agree with this amendment. And the reason for that is because it takes away all accountability. If you look at it, starting on, on line four to five, it takes away the mediation process after the court has ordered, the court has to order mediation. And we're trying to avoid a court proceeding. We're trying to suggest mediation and dialogue before a court order situation. So if you do this at this point, it really prolongs the process. And so we're urging a no vote on L038. Senator Belton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and again, like I explained a little bit earlier, uh, not all. But there are going to be some renters that will not be motivated in any way to go to mediation without uh, the eviction order being filed. And uh, once that's filed, they have to go to mediation, you know. So uh, that's why I renew my support for L-38. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of L-38. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. no. Noes have it, and that amendment is lost. To the bill, Senator Pelton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So one of the things that I was concerned about when I, I heard this bill in committee as well, and one, one of the things that I was concerned about was um, the more and more that we, the more and more we put on these landlords and developments, the, the harder and harder it's going to be for people that want to invest in apartment buildings. 
Uh, one of the things that I'd like to, um, I took some notes here about the Vice President of Governmental Affairs for the Denver Metro Chamber. <clears throat> uh, he expressed uh, their, or they expressed their opposition to the bill, stating that this bill, along with other proposed so-called affordable housing legislation, is mandatory mediation, increased risk, and new rental and new rental provisions are of particular concern to landlords and developers and will slow investment in more housing in Colorado. As an example, applications for new apartment developments declined by a shocking 88% in a three months, um, in three months following the passage of a new affordable housing ordinance in Denver. That's my concern. I mean, don't get me wrong, I know, I, I appreciate what the sponsors are trying to do here, but my concern is, is we're talking all the time in this chamber and in local government about how we need affordable housing. And this is just one more thing that we're gonna be hurting affordable housing. The developers aren't gonna wanna invest in housing when they have to have these mediations and this more uh, regulations that we have on developments. So I ask for a no vote on, um, uh, what, what number is this? House Bill 1120 is House Bill 1120. I think what you're looking Thank for you. there. Thank you for that. Senator, oh, sure, go ahead, Senator Fields. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Members, um, we have people in the state of Colorado that have disabilities. And when you have a disability, you have challenges specifically as it relates to housing and accessibility, especially for affordable housing. And we know that the cost of housing uh, in Colorado is, is pretty expensive. And this bill is about believing that mediation really works and it provides an opportunity to keep people in their homes. This is not about trying to put a burden on landlords. This is, this is not about putting a burden on them. This is about creating an opportunity for people who have disabilities. This is about good government and being a good Samaritan to someone who has a disability. It could be a veteran. It could be someone maybe that has vision impaired. It could be somebody that's wheelchair bound. And what the bill is trying to do is to create a scenario before that person is evicted, this disabled person or this family that's on tenant with kids and family, can we come to a resolution? And if they can't, then that doesn't happen. But at least we're doing the right thing by having a dialogue. And most landlords that I know they want to keep people in their property. If they're paying their rent and they're doing the right thing, they don't want to be turning over their, their property. Most landlords are in the business to keep tenants and making sure that everything that's in their home is functional. This is not about putting a burden on landlords. This is about a unique population, those who are on SSDI, TANF, Social Security. Fixed income folks, very small population who are in need of housing. And we're just saying, take a little time to come up with a mediation, see if there's something that can be worked out. If it can't be worked out, it can't be worked out. They have an eviction notice. You sit down, you see if you can come to resolution, and then you, you either fix it or you have to move on. Reasonable, common sense. If you're in a wheelchair, do you know how difficult it is maybe to find a, a place that doesn't have stairs? And who knows what other kind of accommodations that they might need? Let's give the folks who have these disabilities that's, you know, dealing with some situations that deal with poverty insecurities on every single level. 
How can I help you? What, how can we make this work? And if it can't work, it can't work. But we can't just say that, you know, we just get out. That can happen. But what's, what's, what's wrong with having mediation? Let's be fair. I'm fortunate I'm not disabled, but I, I know that there are people who are disabled in Colorado. And we're trying to keep them housed. Because I do see disabled people on Colfax. So this is not a burden on, on landlords. This is about having a conversation with the tenant. That's not a burden. Landlords have conversations with their tenants all the time. How, do you, how are you doing? Ma'am, do you have any leaks? Is anything going on? Is, is, is everything, plumbing's functioning? Landlords don't just leave their tenants just out there. They want to have conversations and they want to keep people housed. This is not a burden on them. And, and not to give the impression that this bill is about putting a burden on landlord is just, it's just misinformation. Senator Janelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, this must be number 14 or 15 of tenant landlord bills that have come through uh, this session alone, and it adds to a significant burden uh, collectively. I don't think it's going to help in affordability. I don't think it's going to help renters. I don't really think it's going to help, land well, it's definitely not going to help landlords. But if you think all of these bills, whether it's just this one individually or the other 14 that have been, been brought forth are really going to solve the problems that we're trying to do for affordable housing, for renters, this is one more to add to the pile that's already there. First of all, it is putting a burden on landlords. Landlords don't want to do this. Um, we don't want to evict anyone. This bill, to me, is unnecessary, because I know that they would go to great lengths to help folks with disabilities. There's already so many protections in place for tenants who use public assistance. In the bill, if, you're, if your tenant receives supplemental social uh, security income, federal social security disability insurance, or cash assistance through the Colorado Works Program, collectively any type of cash assistance, the issue isn't with the tenant landlord, the issue is with the tenant and whoever's providing that income. So why the extra justification? If they're in violation, they're in violation, and I'm not sure if you can execute a writ for 14 days, so a landlord's got to absorb more days of free rent, and so why is that fair? Where's that burden? Um, if the tenant's in violation, then they're in violation. The other part that I think is not fair is mediation that has to be paid for by the landlords. The landlords have to pay out of their pocket for the mediation. So I'm not sure why, you know, this is, this is not something that we want to have done, but what you're doing is you're mandating, you're mandating a landlord and a tenant uh, mediate prior to commencing an eviction action if the residential tenant relieves, uh, receives supplemental income. 
I don't think this bill is necessary and it, it, it's putting the burden and the, and the payment by landlords when they're not even getting the payment from the cash assistance that they should be getting from the federal government or uh, from the Colorado Works Program or whatever it may be. So I rise in opposition to House Bill 1120. Senator Pelton. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I too uh, find that this bill is a burden on the landlord. Uh, the good senator from Fort Collins and I agree on this. Uh, you know, the number of bills that have come through this, this Capitol building this session and the, the four prior that I've been here is just horrendous, and they're all renter-centric and against the landlord. I, I'm surprised we have any privately owned rental properties in the state right now. It, it, it just baffles me how they continue to take this abuse, to take this regulation upon regulation upon regulation uh, to to provide a service, and, and a lot of them do it because they, they like doing it. They like providing shelter for these people uh, that rent from them. Uh, we heard many times in many bills all the different things that these landlords do to help their tenants out. So I agree, I don't think this bill is necessary except for those extreme times that I think those renters need that little extra push to go to mediation, which in my mind takes that filing uh, of eviction to, to motivate that renter to do that. Uh, so again, all the burden on this bill is borne by the landlord. And uh, for that reason, I still renew my no vote on House Bill 1120. Senator Will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise in opposition, House Bill 1120. To talk, give you a little bit of uh, background on some stuff, but I also talk a little bit from personal knowledge. Um, you know the <clears throat> my daughter and uh, son-in-law um, run a a part store. Um, did really well uh, when oil and gas was. Uh, going good on the on the west slope and uh, then we uh, from policy right here in this uh, under this gold dome uh, kind of took care of oil and gas and the west slope of Colorado they their business struggled so in order to make a living they uh, decided to uh, purchase uh, rental property and they bought several uh, fourplexes, duplexes, a couple uh, single-family dwellings there in the West Slope. Um, <laughs> with, with more and more of these, and, and a, a good senator from Fort Collins mentioned it, but there's, uh, they're, they're talking about leaving Colorado when my granddaughters get out of school because, uh, because of all the regulation and over-regulation. Regulation got to them on oil and gas. They're looking at all these kind of bills, regulation on rentals. And, uh, you know, they're not, uh, they're not rich landlords. They, uh, they're making payments on those properties. And so they, they need that rent, and they need that rent to come through. And, you know, it's... Uh, we heard a bill just last night in government. I, I sit in on, on government, and it was like, I was sitting there listening. It was like there was uh, all bad landlords and all good renters. And I can tell you that's not the case. I can tell you that my, uh, my daughter is a wonderful person. My son-in-law is a wonderful person. And they do all they can to help out with their renters and the people that they have 
and they want to keep them. And it's, you know, there's so many mom and pops, um, mom and pop landlords that, that uh, you know, they, they've, uh, doing all they can to relieve eviction and, and uh, uh, any pressures that they're getting on these rentals. And, you know, it's, uh, there's so many people on the West Slope that I know personally that are in rentals and that's their, that's their retirement. That's how they're making, uh, that's how they're paying their bills. And uh, maybe their retirement isn't enough. So they have a, they have a few rentals to uh, supplement their income. These kind of things hurt those people. It hurts them. And, you know, all it does, I think every, every little bit of regulation that we put upon them, it drives, it drives rents up, you know. And mom and pop landlords, I was reading in this, in preparation to this, is that there's, uh, these mom and pop landlords own approximately 77% of the small building units. And that's, in the area that I represent, that's absolutely true. I think it's probably probably higher than that. And they're, which are, they're often more affordable than single family rental homes or, or large uh, apartment complexes. And these small investors, and they are small investors, and their tenants are likely to more, be more vulnerable to economic downturns. And that's, uh, we saw that with COVID. We definitely saw that with COVID. But many of these small investors uh, think it's around 34% uh, of the ones I just talked about are retired. They're retirees. And their rental units are their only source of income or, you know, they have uh, maybe Social Security but it's not near enough to, uh, to supplement their, their income so they're doing it, they're doing it through, uh, through rentals. And... Uh, you know, so many of these uh, renters, re re uh, you know, they're receiving uh, federal aid or through the HUD program. And I know my my personal family, uh, there's a lot of HUD, that they get HUD payments for their rentals. But I think this is, these kind of bills, it's like taking property without compens compensation. And um, you get a, an eviction ban and uh, all it does is that, you know, you're getting the lawyers involved and, and kind of hold the, the property hostage. In my opinion, it's really just holding the par property hostage. And it forces landlords and, and these people to, uh, otherwise they'd be, they'd, many of them would be homeless. And uh, I, know, I, I know especially in the cities that's, that's true. So, uh, but at the same time, they're trying to take care of these people they they also have, uh, you know, they have their they have their mortgage. They're still paying for their mortgage on that on that rental property. They're still paying for insurance on that rental property. It's it's not like everyone's a rich landlord because they're not. And sometimes it's conveyed, or it definitely is uh, the perception I get is that it's conveyed that these are all rich landlords. You know. And I, I don't know how many people in this room have rental properties, but uh, if you do, you view this from a way different perspective. I have one rental property, and I have a way different perspective of it because uh, my granddaughter and her mom live in it, so it's a, I have a pretty darn good renter. And uh, obviously if, uh, if you can't pay rent, then it doesn't matter because old Pa got it covered, right? But that's not that's not everyone's that's not everyone's situation. But I think this uh, it's an uphill battle for, for for landlords, and and it's also been an uphill battle for landlords dealing with evictions. And and I've I've looked through this 1120 bill. I think it's. Uh, it's, it's, it's just piling on. I've, we, we've heard that, I hear that even in the healthcare uh, arena, that we're just piling on, we're piling on. I hear, I hear it from my local hospitals. I hear this from uh, my local constituents and people that I represent, 
they see all these bills as just piling on, and all they're doing is trying to do a good job, provide good rental units uh, that they can make their, their mortgage payment on, uh, pay their mortgage. And I can tell you, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these rentals end up uh, getting bought on, on sheriff's foreclosure sales, and then they turn them into rentals. So that's, that's good for our communities. It's good for our workforce. It's, uh, it's good for affordable housing. Um, these aren't, uh, some of these aren't castles, but they're nice, uh, but they're nice homes for people to live in. And you know, there's, uh, I was reading also on this that there's over, I think just in New York City itself, over a billion, a billion dollars in unpaid rent payments. So it's not, it's not all about the, uh, it's not all about the landlords. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, you know, and both, we talked about it, both the landlords and the tenants have rights. And, you know, COVID was a, uh, I think we all know that the COVID was a wrecking ball. It truly was for, for this state. And uh, it was also a wrecking ball for many people's financial lives, uh, and especially low-income people. Definitely those, and those who work in the service or hospitality industries, which we have a lot of in the area that I represent. And, you know, a lot of those are dis disproportionately affected. But uh, for those folks paying rent, sometimes I understand. It can be impossible, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of help out there. But the, uh, the non-payment of rent creates a disastrous domino effect that can, you know, literally gut these mom and pop uh, landlords who depend on the income, and you know they they pay the they pay the bills and pay their mortgage payments, and many of the rentals they also pay the they pay the utilities as well. So it's critical these landlords don't run afoul of the law, and uh, because the law just makes matters worse, especially for the landlord side. And the best thing landlords can do is try and uh, try and work with their tenants which they do, I think, uh, I think most of them do. In the rural areas, uh, you know, and, and, and the bill sponsors talked a lot about, uh, I think, uh, disabled and, uh, and elderly tenants. And they, uh, sometimes, especially our, our uh, elderly people, they don't even know that rental assistance uh, is available. Uh, so to serve everyone, as landlords can help understand their rights and get uh, Rental funds on their on their behalf, which uh, many landlords do know how to do that because they get the uh, the federal programs or the county programs uh, to help. But and in this scenario, I think everyone wins. But uh, forcing renters to uh, uh, you know eagerly eagerly or making their arrangements unattainable, it, it just uh, it ends up with a lawsuit uh, with the landlords. Uh, nobody wins. And depending on what kind of a, uh, a fixed mortgage and a rate you have with your rental properties and what the, uh, what the interest rates have been doing, um, it can make it almost totally um, a situation that the landowners can't, uh, can't deal with. And I, was, I, uh, I talked a little bit about you know the HUD and some of the uh, housing choice vouchers. There's many programs out there. Sometimes I mean they're over they're over uh, allocated because of the need. But uh, you know what it really does help uh, landlords and it also helps helps the tenants. So uh, I just I just think that we're piling on with regulation. And I think it was said there's like I don't know 14 or so at whatever it was number of bills that's been at this uh, at the state house this year concerning concerning rent and affordable housing and all that I think we're, what we're doing is we're, uh, we're trying to do do the right thing and do good things but there's unintended consequences and I think uh, that this bill 1120 has some real serious probably unintended consequences and it won't be a win for landlords and it won't be a win for tenants. So I will ask for a no vote. Thank you. Senator Fields, you want to jump in? Senator Baisley, we'll get you after. 
Um, just want to, um, to clarify in the bill that um, landlords with five or fewer units are not uh, covered, they're carved out in this um, bill. So it doesn't really affect the mom and pops that we've been hearing about. It would not affect them at all. There any, you have to have five or fewer units to be a part of this, five units or above. And also the Realtor uh, Association is neutral on this bill. So something to be mindful of as we continue this discussion. Senator Baisley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thought it would be uh, informative to uh, read this article from uh, Denver Post that was dated on March 3 of this topic by uh, uh, Seth Clayman and uh, John Aguilar of the Denver Post, both of them. At the uh, intersection of Colorado lawmakers' debate over rentals' rights are landlords like Paige Pulver and tenants like Trudy Cara de Solero. Pulver owns the Kaufman House in downtown Longmont, a 46-unit roaming house she purchased in 2017. She's poured hundreds of thousands of dollars into the property, which was built in 1902 by Charles Dickens' grandson and served as a hospital in the 1930s. Its inhabitants are now college students and nurses and retired professors ranging in age from 18 to 70. Pulver hasn't raised the rent in four years, she said, and prices for a studio apartment top out at $975 a month, the below the median rate in Metro Denver. We take risks on people who may not be able to find housing elsewhere, she said. Cara de Solero told lawmakers Wednesday that she's twice been displaced from units that she was renting because the property owner declined her new lease. Between movers, application fees, and deposits, her relocation costs totaled more than $6,000, she said. A previous landlord conditioned, conditions her apartment, waiting until the, ran, the clock ran out on her lease. And that same landlord then refused to confirm her tenancy, making it harder for Cara de Solero to find a new home. Quote, Growing up in Colorado, I don't remember being worried about being forced to move, she said. We decided ourselves to relocate for personal reasons. We knew our landlords and owners. They were mom and pop people. It was mutually beneficial to both of us, but that's no longer the case. Pulver's and Cara de Solero's attention were trained on a pro-tenant bill that passed an initial House committee vote Thursday. Now remember, this was back in March. The measure, House Bill 23-1171, would generally give rights or give tenants a right of first refusal on whether to re-sign their leases and block evictions unless the landlord had legitimate reasons. It's part of a broader package of pro-tenant legislation that's been advanced by lawmakers in recent weeks by, as Governor Jared Polis and the Democratic majorities in the Capitol worked to address housing access and affordability. Supporters of just cause evictions, like Democratic sponsor Representative Javier Mabri, says that the bill is an essential tool needed to avoid gentrification and displacement. As Polis and top legislators consider sweeping changes to the state's land use policy, Mabry said tenants need protections to ensure they won't get priced out of their homes or have their maintenance requests ignored until their leases end. Colorado's renters, quote, Colorado renters should be able to expect if they pay their rent each month and do not violate the terms of their lease agreement that they cannot be evicted, said Serena Gonzalez Gutierrez, who, like Mabry, is a Denver Democrat and co-sponsor of the bill. Opponents of the bill Drew Hammock, Pam Rick, excuse me, of the Colorado Apartment Association, argue that it goes too far and infringes on the basic principles of a lease. Either party, tenant or landlord, can agree con to continue or not. Hamrick told lawmakers Wednesday that the bill would allow for endless leases, 
restricting the availability of housing, and in turn, cause prices to go up. Republican Rick Ta Taggart, representative of Grand Junction, said he was concerned the bill had gone too far in addressing the balance between landlords and tenants. That echoes criticism raised by other House Republicans of the broader Democratic push to reshape the landlord-tenant relationship. Well, I'm reading the... Uh, um, but supporters of the Just Cause eviction bill argue that tenants often fear, fearful of raising concerns about the condition of their units because the property owner can choose to not renew their so, lease. Senator Baisley, we're on 1120. Yes, sir. I realize that. Concerning eviction. I, I realize that. You can read it and jump in. Um, I was reading an article that I thought was complimentary to, uh, to 1120. Um, you know, obviously I can't control what was, what was written here. I can only, uh, as I was reading, what I thought was uh, a relevant piece, an article, uh, on the general topic that, we're, that 1120 addresses. But, you know, I don't want to disrespect the, uh, the decorum and, and, and what we're doing here as a, as a body. You up? So I'll uh, step aside for now. Seeing no further discussion, Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do you have something to say, uh, Senator Fields? Senator Fields. Thank you. Um, members, this bill is designed to create equity for those who have a a level of disability to come to the table with mediation to keep them housed. This is not an attack on realtors. This is not an attack on landlords. It's just an opportunity for the tenant and the landlord to kind of come together to see if there's a possibility or a pathway for them to stay housed. And it's not intended to be a burden. It's intended for us as, the, as a state to be good Samaritans, for people who are struggling. And this conversation is about all of the housing bills that are out there. I am not here to advocate for those. Those bills have passed. They may have been signed by the governor. And it is what it is. But if we can just focus on the policy that we have in front of us, and it's really to provide mediation for those who are most vulnerable in our state, and having a conversation to address that so it's not about all the other bills. I have no control over those other bills. I would like for us to frame the discussion and talk about the bill that's in front of us that we have an opportunity to, um, to vote on. It already passed the House, and it's now in the second chamber, and so we need to keep the conversation about this bill. I think that's appropriate and fair request. Thank you. Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, members, um, and to the good Senator Aurora, um, you know, we just have a um, uh, honest disagreement. Uh, you know, I, I, I do realize that, uh, you know, we all want to help people who, who need help, and some of these people do need help. But put, your, put yourself in the place of a landlord, uh, because they do feel like they're under attack. Uh, they have invested their life savings, uh, whether, they're, whether they're a small... Uh, so-called mom and pop, or that they're a major company that is in, that has invested uh, uh, millions of dollars in a in a modest size rental um, facility or a large rental facility, uh, they are uh, they are at risk, which I'll get into here in a minute. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a, a good example here in a, in a minute of a, uh, of a landlord that I know. He's a, 
uh, who's a constituent of mine, and when he heard about this bill, as well as some of the other landlord-tenant bills, he came to me and expressed his dismay, and I'll explain that why. Um, I was looking through the, um, and I have the bill in front of me, the uh, re-engrossed bill. So I want to take a, take a bit and go through the uh, legislative declaration and, and so that we all understand what is uh, going on here under uh, Section 1, uh, Part A. It says there is a wide disparity in access to legal representation between landlords and people experiencing eviction in Colorado. Um, you know, that's, that's probably somebody's opinion. It says a, a 20, uh, 2021 study found that renters are represented by legal counsel in only 1% of eviction cases, while landlords are represented in 77%. Well, that, that may be true because uh, the landlords are the people that uh, they have 100% of the risk. They own the property, they have to pay the taxes, they have to pay the insurance. They, uh, if, if something uh, goes, uh, goes wrong, a plumbing or electrical problem or whatever, uh, or legal problems, they have to pay for that, uh, not to mention their mortgage. They have a mortgage that they have to pay. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, they, they have to hire legal representation because they have 100% of the risk. If something goes wrong, it's not the tenant, whether it's the, uh, the uh, uh, unfortunate uh, tenant or the lower income tenant, it can be any tenant. Uh, they also have 100% uh, of the equity in the sense that it's their money that is paying down that mortgage. They, they have the debt and they have the equity. So of course they want to protect their equity interest uh, because if they don't, the property will devalue. They want to have that property, that's why they're owning it, is they want that property to hopefully over a period of time appreciate. They're not uh, uh, investing uh, hundreds of thousands or tens of millions of dollars with the idea that they put all of their, uh, their time and energy and everything that, uh, that is involved in it, and after 10 years or 15 years that they sell it for what they put into it or that they sell it at a loss. Excuse me, this is... <clears throat> Um, so, um, and they also have 100% of the problems. If something goes wrong, uh, like I say, if there's, uh, if there's a plumbing problem, you know, like right now, um, I'm, I'm renting a place uh, while I'm up here. And uh, uh, when I checked in, the landlord was there with me, and uh, she said, if you have a problem with the plumbing, be sure and contact me as soon as possible. If you have a problem with anything else, be sure and contact me so that I can fix it. Don't ignore it. This is a major investment for this, uh, for this young lady. First time I've met her. You know, I respect property rights and, uh, 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 and I understand where she's coming from. This was a major investment for her. She took this apartment uh, that, that, that she owns, and uh, she got it in foreclosure. And uh, she kind of told me a little bit about it. The place was a wreck. Uh, uh, there were holes in the wall. There were uh, plumbing problems, uh, you name it. And she put in, I'm sure, thousands and thousands of dollars of her money uh, uh, for plumbing and electrical. Uh, she... Uh, put in a washer and dryer in the unit at her own cost because apparently when the uh, not all of these units have their own washer and dryer so she had a special space that was made for her washer and dryer brand new washer and dryer brand new appliances so before day one ever even occurred she uh, had sunk in uh, probably tens of thousands of dollars before she even starts getting a nickel 
in rent. And I don't know how long I think she's owned it for four or five years. So as it relates just to section one under the legislative declaration, part A is that uh, yes, um, uh, it's true that that uh, legal counsel only, you know, it may be true, uh, that, uh, that renters are only paying 1% of the eviction cases, but they're paying for nothing else. They're not paying for, uh, uh, for the risk that, it, that is involved. They don't have any equity in it. If something goes wrong, quite frankly, they don't care. I mean, actually, some may care, but uh, some don't. They go, geez, if there's a plumbing problem, you know, uh, something could be leaking, uh, a, a slow drip gets all over the rugs or whatever, and a month later, uh, they, uh, they tell the, uh, the landlord, oh, by the way, there's this plumbing problem. Oh, my gosh. And so by the time that the, uh, that the uh, landlord can get to it, uh, it's created immense and caused thousands of dollars. There goes their profit uh, margin for the whole year, just because maybe the tenant really didn't care or think about it. Uh, so, like I say, they've got 100% of the problems. Going on to Part B, it says this disparity in access to legal representation creates an imbalance in power during the eviction proceedings. Well, if this, uh, that, that may be the case, that's somebody's opinion, but if this piece of legislation, 1120, passes, that balance is going to be shifting to the, uh, to the tenants. It's, uh, or at least in my opinion, is that uh, for the tenants who, uh, who have to potentially be evicted, uh, much less the ones who are already paying their rent, but for the eviction, the eviction process is very expensive for the landlord. Uh, my good colleague, the country lawyer from, uh, from, from uh, Colorado Springs, I don't know what, uh, what legal fees are. Uh, I know that there are certain attorneys that uh, I think specialize in this area of law, uh, and quote me if I'm wrong, but I think their legal fees are maybe uh, uh, three to $400 an hour, and the legal process for an eviction uh, can cost uh, uh, certainly more than hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. So uh, under Part B of this, the balance of power may very easily shift from, uh, you know, uh, from the landlord who, is, who has invested their energy and their money and their resources and taking all the risk. Now it's shifting or will shift to the, uh, uh, to the tenant who's decided uh, not to uh, pay their rent. Then uh, uh, down to I'll skip C, uh, it talks about pre-litigation mediation and so forth. Uh, they talk about skilled neutral uh, mediators can help guide the parties, and that may or may not be true. Uh, uh, so, you know, that's in Part C. Uh, part D, it says Colorado is experiencing a housing shortage. A 2022 report from the General Assembly's Affordable Housing and Transformational Task Force found that the state needs an additional 325,000 rental units to meet current demand. Well, uh, that's probably true, uh, even if they're off by 100,000 each way. You know, we look uh, where I sit, I look right down Sherman Street, and there is a big crane that I can see and maybe uh, the good senator from, uh, from uh, uh, Mesa County can also see that crane. Maybe the good senator from uh, Woodland Park can see that crane. Well, that crane is down there. Uh, I see it day in and day out uh, 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 building apartment units. And then right down off of Broadway, we see uh, there's a couple of cranes, big cranes, that are building more apartment units. So yes, they're trying to meet the demand, but I can tell you what's gonna happen is if, uh, if this bill goes through, is that uh, there's gonna be a real shortage because these uh, uh, companies that are willing to build right now, taking that risk, investing that capital, taking on uh, mortgages, by the way, 
the cost of mortgages are going up. The Fed just raised interest rates a couple of days ago. So the cost of financing is going up. Every time it goes up, what do you think that does? That depresses the housing market and the rental market. So if you think we have a problem now with a slowing economy, which it is, and rising interest rates, which they are, uh, wait till, till the uh, investment community and the apartment uh, people who are willing to invest in apartments find out that we passed this here in Colorado. That's going to dry up capital uh, very quickly. Uh, builders are, are going to quit building. Uh, the other thing that's, uh, that's going to happen, uh, the law of unintended consequences, uh, if the, if the uh, uh, builders and apartment owners, whether large or small, if they get a sense that, uh, that there's going to be higher litigation costs, uh, you just think about it. They go, well, do I raise the rents? I don't know. It's a tough environment, so, and I don't want to raise them as I don't want to kick out uh, inadvertently or, or uh, price out my, uh, my, my good tenants. So what they're going to start doing is they're going to raise the, the deposits. They're going to say, look, uh, uh, instead of the deposit being uh, one month's rent or, or the first or last month's rent or, or $500, they're going to find a, uh, they're going to think of a creative way to, uh, to raise that deposit. Well, who is that going to hurt the most? That's going to hurt the very people that this bill is trying to help because those uh, unfortunate people have a tough enough time paying for the rent, and now then they're going to have to come up with an extraordinarily large or ever-increasing uh, uh, damage deposit. So, uh, 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 and there again, I can just speak for myself. I'll tell you what I had to put down for a damage deposit before I ever moved in. It was $2,100. $2,100. Uh, uh, and I had to pay that out of my own money. Not complaining. I understand where the, uh, where the landlord was coming from. She's got an investment that she wants to protect. She, she had never met me until the very first day when I moved in in January. And she was willing to give me the keys. She took me through the complex, took me to the apartment. She even, she even took off her shoes and made me take off my shoes because it, the, it was clean and neat and tidy. And there's uh, all kinds of, uh, she has her own vacuum cleaner in there, though I brought my own. I have a little one, a little uh, shark, you know, so I, I vacuum, you know, because I was brought up that way to keep it neat and tidy. Uh, I mean, the bottom line is she's a neat neck, uh, uh, and I don't blame her, but she doesn't know me from Adam, and she wants to protect her investment. So she made me put down a $2,100 deposit, plus I had to prepay everything. I mean, it was a hunk of change. Uh, so uh, uh, you can just imagine, um, and, there, and I'm not in the rental business. So going on to Section E of um, the Legislative Declaration, the Ledge Deck, I think, is now the, what people call it, the Ledge Deck. Uh, so it says, people with disabilities face an additional barrier to finding housing that meets the accessibility requirements. Well, uh, that uh, is what I had said. Uh, the uh, prices of rent uh, are going to definitely go up. So there again, if people with disabilities uh, have, a, have a barrier now, what are they going to have when this goes into effect and the landlord and the owner of the building has got to take in account uh, higher, uh, uh, higher litigation costs that they have to pay under this bill, by the way. They have to pay it. Uh, so they're going to say, geez, how can I compensate for that? Don't want to raise the rent uh, because I have good tenants uh, and so forth. So when new tenants come in, I'm going to make everybody put down an extra because my, my litigation costs are going to go up by, uh, uh, you know, two, three thousand dollars or more. So I'm going to price that in to, uh, for, for everybody. 
if I own five units, if I'm a mom and pop and I own five units, which is under this bill, uh, I'm going to have to raise it significantly to compensate for those uh, increased costs. On to Section F, people who receive cash assistance face an additional barrier to find housing that is affordable on a fixed income. Well, it's going to be even more so. It's going to be even more so for the people that this bill purports to help. It's going to be uh, more difficult, more expensive, more frustrating for the people uh, to try and find that affordable unit that they want. Uh, uh, so it's going to be uh, even harder. Uh, on to G. Uh, once again, I'm uh, on section one of the legislative declaration. So on to G, uh, extending the period of time before law enforcement can execute a writ of restitution gives a renter with disabilities or a renter who receives cash assistance more time to find new housing and improves the renter's likelihood of remaining housed. Well, quite frankly, it won't be if this, uh, if this bill passes. It's going to be the opposite. Uh, it's, going to, it's, going to flip, it's going to flip the environment. It's going to make it more difficult for that person who is on the edge, who uh, is having a tough time trying to find a rental unit. Um, 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 so, so it's going to be a mess. Um, then, that, uh, then it goes on to Section 2. It says the General Assembly further finds that Evictions threaten existing affordable housing by creating additional burdens for independent property owners, including legal fees, unpaid rent, and utility fees, additional vacancies, and resident turnover. Well, that's, uh, if, if I understand this right, uh, uh, that's, that's what's going to happen. There's going to be higher rents, as I said, you know, it bears uh, worth repeating uh, that there's going to be higher damage deposits because all of their costs are going up. So, um, going on to page five of the re-engrossed bill, um, and this is something that I'm, that I'm very concerned about that I've heard from, uh, I mentioned a while ago when I started, that um, I have a, a good constituent. I've known him for several years. Uh, his name is, uh, uh, well, I'll just say his last name because I don't want to get anybody into trouble. I don't think he would mind, but his last name is Miller. Uh, and he's a, he's a nice fellow. Uh, and when he heard about this legislation, he pulled me aside. This was about uh, a month or more ago. And uh, he said, Larry, uh, I, I, I mean, he was just apoplectic. He says, I can't believe what, what's going on up there. I own uh, uh, several, I think he said uh, six, six or seven rental units uh, up around the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, UCCS, which is in my district. And he, he rents to college students and to uh, low and middle income families. And he said, uh, my units are, are paid for, or at least some of them. I, I can't vouch that all of them. But he said, I intentionally keep my rents low so that I can keep, uh, so I can work with the, with the tenants, keep them in there, uh, and keep it affordable. I don't need to make a lot of money, a ton of money, and gouge them. That's my words, not his. You know, I, I'm not trying to gouge anybody. I'm trying to just get a fair return and give, it's my way, he said this, this is my way of giving back to the community. I could rent this for $1,500 a month, and, but instead I'll rent it for $1,000 a month or whatever. He didn't say that exact figure, but he said that's my way of giving back to the community, people who can't afford it. Uh, and it saves them hundreds of dollars a month. But if a bill like this goes through, he's going to have to definitely reevaluate uh, because if I read in here on page five of the re bill, 
under Part B, Section, I'm assuming this is Section uh, 2, Section 2, uh, Part uh, Part uh, B, uh, uh, small parenthesis B under, um, it, says a, uh, uh, it says a landlord with five or fewer single family rental units and no more than five total rental units, uh, including family homes. Uh, under B, uh, it says mandatory mediation may be conducted by a trained neutral third party. And then this is what's changed party and may be provided at no cost to the residential tenant. So there's no cost and the landlord is only required to pay for the landlord's portion of the mandatory mediation. Well that goes back, oh my gosh I'm the landlord and I've got all these, medi uh, I've got this mediation and uh, eviction fees and I've got to go back to my attorney who's going to be charging me three or four hundred dollars an hour and I've done this before and it costs ten hours of his legal time or even five five times three hundred I think that's fifteen hundred dollars five times four hundred that's uh, that's uh, two hundred uh, that's uh, two thousand uh, dollars or five, uh, whatever anyways you get the point it, it gets very expensive so, um, uh, on behalf of, of uh, Mr. Miller, I wish he was listening in. He may be tonight, for all I know, Mr. Miller, um, who is a, 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 a good landlord. You know, he knows construction. He's from the construction industry. Uh, I know how well he keeps his house, because I, I, I don't live very far away from him. And if he keeps his rental units anything like his own house, and he takes very, very good care of uh, of his uh, of his um, buildings, of his uh, rentals, and um, so there's a real problem there. And with that in mind, uh, Mr. Chair, I think I've got an amendment. If we could have a uh, uh, senatorial five for a second. Senatorial Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so with that in mind, um, members, um, there's an amendment at the desk. <clears throat> Will the cl clerk please read L040. L040 by Senator Liston, amend ring gross bill, page five, line eight, after four, insert one half of page five, line nine, strike Senator Liston. Thank you. Yes, so uh, members, uh, with that in mind, w um, uh, first of all, Sir, listen, would you like to leave, yes, move the amendment yes, first? Yes, Mr. Chair, yes. I move uh, L040 Thank to you. House Bill 1120, House Bill, House Bill 23 1120. To um, the amendment. So, uh, what this amendment does is that um, I have no qualms, members, of giving a uh, break uh, or whatever. I understand that the uh, residential tenant, particularly if they're, you know, kind of struggling to pay their rent, uh, that, their, um, that their legal fees are paid for. In fact, I think we set up a uh, legal defense fund, but I'll speak more about that later. Um, so what, what L040 does, under the current bill, it says that the uh, landlord is required to pay for the landlord's portion of the mandatory mediation. And what L040 does is that they will only have to pay for one half, one half of the uh, uh, 
um, mediation, mandatory mediation. So, you know, if it's, if it's okay for the tenant, which I'm not squabbling about, I understand that, uh, the landlord uh, uh, should be given a little bit of consideration also because the landlord, like I say, I've already talked about this, the landlord has, uh, uh, and especially if they're small, you know, five units or less, they've had to uh, absorb uh, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of dollars of legal fees. So I think it's only fair and reasonable that they get a little bit uh, of, uh, of consideration uh, that, that they should only have to pay for one half of the mandatory mediation fees. So I think that's fair and I would ask for an I vote on L040 of House Bill 1120. Senator Fields. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and we're asking for a no vote on this. Um, it's, it's indicated by the, the sponsor that this is fair. Um, it's, it's not a fair approach. Once again, this is eviction protection for the most vulnerable people in the state of Colorado. So we're asking a no vote on L040. Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, members, I'm not squabbling uh, with the fact that it's, uh, um, that, uh, that, it's not, that it's not fair to the, uh, to the tenant. I'm, I'm trying to find a little bit of middle ground to what is uh, fair and reasonable for the landlord. Say the landlord has uh, has now found out that he's got to go through this uh, very complex, convoluted uh, legal proceedings for eviction. Which you know, there's a lot of landlords. You know, in a perfect world, they really don't want to go through an eviction either. They they would really prefer to keep their tenant in place. But now then, they've they've been. Uh, They've realized that, that they're going to have to go through mediation. And um, so, so what's wrong with paying one half? You know, and maybe, maybe I didn't make this clear, but I think that that one half uh, should come out of, the, uh, of this legal defense fund. If it's good enough for the, for the tenant, well, why, why can't we give a little bit of consideration to the landlord um, who has put so much at stake and has still got to pay that mortgage. Uh, uh, he's got to go in there ultimately and uh, clean the property. He's got to inspect the property. He's got to advertise for the property. It may, it may sit empty for two or three months or more before he can re-rent it. So all of a sudden, uh, he's had to pay these these legal fees uh, for mandatory mediation that he wasn't that he wasn't looking forward to, and uh, he, and he has no guarantee that he's going to be able to re-rent his uh, property out. So uh, um, I think that Amendment uh, L040 to House Bill 23-1120 uh, is a very fair. Uh, amendment, and I would ask for an I vote on this amendment. Seeing no further discussion on L040, the question before us is the adoption of L040. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Yeah. The noes have it. L040 fails. <laughs> Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let me go to the next part here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, members, uh, we were speaking about um, um, that uh, it, it says in the bill that there, uh, it, it, it talks about uh, Subsection 2.5 just says, does not apply to a landlord 
with five or fewer single family rental homes and so forth. I get it. I think that is for the, for the mom and pop, uh, the landlords, which, uh, uh, which I get. Uh, but there's a lot of S landlords. Senator really Liston, are you speaking to another amendment? Um, I will, uh, but, but I'm trying to lay the, lay the groundwork for it first uh, before I get to the amendment. I, in case people are a little bit confused, I want them. Um, so on page, uh, excuse me, my eyes, on page 8, uh, on lines 26, 27 of the reengrossed version, uh, it talks about uh, that it mainly applies to five uh, landlords that have five single-family rental homes are more, are no more than five total rental, rental units, including any single-family homes. But, you know, what about that, uh, what about that uh, person? In fact, my constituent, uh, Mr. Miller, I think he told me that he owns six or seven units, so this would not apply to him. Uh, he'd really be upside down. Uh, and I can well imagine that there that there are other um, uh, landlords, mom and pop, that, that own more than five. They might own six or seven or whatever. So with that in mind, uh, I do have a potential amendment, a good amendment. There we go. There's an amendment at the desk. <clears throat> Will the clerk please read amendment L041. Amendment L041 by Senator DeListon, <clears throat> amend reengrossed bill, page 7, line 9, strike 5, and substitute 10, page 7, line 10, strike 5, and substitute 10, page 8, strike line 27, and substitute Senator Liston. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. <clears throat> Chair, um, I move uh, L041 to House Bill 23 1120. And what it does, members, is that uh, um, is that it changes five to ten because there's a lot of uh, landlords out there that they're not multinational, they're not uh, big uh, 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 REITs that own a lot of apartment buildings, whatever. They're they're uh, mom and pop operators that uh, you know it's kind of like Monopoly. You know, I think we've all played Monopoly before, and. You know, so they, they own one unit and then two, now they got five, and then they, and now then they've got six or seven. So under this, um, this would uh, uh, just kind of broaden uh, and not, not uh, uh, snare that uh, uh, mom and pop, that small operator that owns six or seven or up to 10, uh, 10 units. Uh, so, you know, 10 is not very many, and uh, if we can do five, I would think it would be entirely reasonable to do 10. So with that, I would ask for an aye vote on L041 of House Bill 23-1120. Senator Winner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I encourage a no vote on L041. Um, this bill is already very limited in who qualifies, and this is, again, 14 days, 14 days of mediation to only people that are on SSI, SSD, or TANF. So this is a very limited population, and making sure that we're accommodating them is important, and I encourage no vote on this. Senator Rich. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I rise in uh, support of L041. Uh, when we heard this uh, bill in, test, uh, in committee, there was testimony from a woman from Fort Collins who uh, had one of these, these units, that, and she worked with the disability community, but she had 24 units. She was not a corporate uh, owner of apartments. She was one individual and she was barely breaking even because she was trying to help these people. And all this, this amendment is asking for, it won't help her, but it's all that uh, th this amendment is asking for is to change it from five to 10 units. Uh, and I know that you were talking again about how many days this, this is going to take, but if you watch, if you look at that bill, 
It might only take 14 days to do mediation, but then you have to get that order, and it can't even be executed for 30 days. This thing is taking longer than, than uh, what the sponsors would have you believe. But back to the amendment, uh, L041 would really help these smaller uh, mom and pop uh, people that have properties. Like I said, the lady from Fort Collins has 24. It won't hurt her or help her. And she's doing everything she can just to stay afloat. But those that would maybe have 10 or less, it, it could really help. I urge and I vote. Senator Winter. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chair. Uh, this five unit carve out is a standard that we already have precedent on. It was taken from the source of income non-discrimination law which is already in Colorado law, and since we this is a source of income law about mediation, we think that it should mirror, and that is at five units. And I encourage a no vote on this amendment. Seeing, seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of L041. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The no's have it. L041 fails. Senator List, or Senator Lundeen, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, colleagues, I'm going to rise again to urge a no vote on 1120, and here's the reason why. This bill is another example of the forgotten person. The bill seeks to solve a problem for people facing evictions. And it argues that because they are people who are on government support, either for income-based or disability-based reasons, they shouldn't have to deal with the normal eviction process. They should get an extra eviction time frame. They should get an extra two months, essentially. The challenge and problem is that it's a, a small percent, a very, very small percent of the people with income-based or dis disability-based government assistance who need housing that this bill would affect positively. It will affect the largest percentage of people who are receiving government assistance for income-based or disability-based reasons. This bill will have a negative impact on all of those people. Is Senator Gardner trying to give me the hook? <laughs> I, I, I urge your opposition to Senate Bill 1120 on behalf of the 98 or 99 or 99.7% of the people who would qualify, who will lose access to available rental properties if this sort of policy continues to advance. Mr. Chair, thank you for your attention. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1120. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1120 is adopted. <laughs> Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the committee rise and report. The motion is to rise and report. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Rise and report. Senate will come to order. Senator Priola. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, the committee has met and had one bill under consideration. Will the clerk pre please read the report? Mr. President, your committee of the whole votes leave to report. It has had under consideration the following attached bills, being the second reading thereof, and makes the following recommendations thereon. House Bill 1120, as amended, passed on second reading and ordered revised and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Senator Priola. Mr. President, I move the report. The motion is adopted the committee of the whole report. Are there any no votes? 
Senator Liston. Senator Baisley. Senator Peltonar. With a vote of 31 ayes, 3 noes, 0 absent, and was that? Oh, there are more noes. We're voting on the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Minority Leader, Senator Gardner, Smallwood, Kirk Meyer, Will, Simpson, Pelton B. With a vote of 24 ayes, 10 noes, 0 absent, 1 excuse, the Committee of the Whole Report is adopted. It's okay. Thank you, Senator. House Bill 1120 is amended, passed in second reading in order to revise and place on the counter for third reading and final passage. Senator Dora Gonzalez. Thank you, Senator. Mr. President. I request that the Conference Committee on House Bill 1019 be given permission to go beyond. Isn't it both? Excuse me. Withdraw. The Senator five. Senator five. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I request that the Conference Committee on House Concurrent Re Resolution 1001 be given permission to go beyond the scope of the differences between the two houses. The motion of the body is to grant permission to the conferees on the first Conference Committee on HCR 1001 to go beyond the scope of the differences between the two houses. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it and permission is granted. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. President. I request that the conference committee on the accompanying bill, um, HB 1019, also be given permission to go beyond the scope of the differences between the two houses. The motion of the body is to grant permission to conferees in the first conference committee on HB 1019 to go beyond the scope of the differences between the two houses. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it and permission is granted. <laughs> Senator. Danielson. Thank you, Mr. President. I, room, I request that the Conference Committee on House Bill 1216 be, permission, be given permission to go beyond the scope of the differences between the two houses. The motion of the body is to grant permission to conferees on the first Conference Committee on House Bill 1216 to go beyond the scope of the differences between the two houses. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it and permission is granted. Introduction to bills. House Bill 1048, Representatives Luck and Bazenacre, Senators Pelton, R. and Janal concerning delineator posts on a two-lane state highway. Appropriations. House Bill 1066, Representatives Bradley and Belasco, Senator Priola concerning authorizing an individual to move between two adjacent parcels of public land that touch at the corners and in connection therewith, creating a task force to study the issue of access to public lands that are blocked by privately owned lands and making an appropriation. Appropriations. House Bill 1084, Representatives Bradfield and Ortiz, Senator Gardner, concerning the continuation of the income tax deduction for military retirement benefits. 
Appropriations. House Bill 1194, Representatives McLaughlin and Pugliese, Senators Simpson and Janal, concerning efforts to remediate risks associated with certain closed landfills and in connection therewith, creating the Closed Landfill Remediation Grant Program and making an appropriation. Appropriations. House Bill 1200, Representatives Ricks and Bradfield, Senator Mullica, concerning improved outcomes for persons with behavioral health disorders. Stay better, I'm just joking, appropriations. House Bill 1220, Representatives Holtorf and McCormick, Senators Pelton R. and Pelton B. concerning study, a study regarding the economic impact of the elimination of large capacity groundwater withdrawal within the Republican River Basin and in connection therewith requiring the Colorado Water Center to conduct the study and report its findings and conclusions to certain legislative committees in making an appropriation. Appropriations. Announcements. Senator Bridges. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, with all those bills assigned to appropriations, I guess we better meet. Uh, we will do that tomorrow at 9.15 a.m. What? what? So appropriations will meet at 9.15 a.m. tomorrow morning. Uh, we will be hearing House Bills 1084, 1146, 1174, 1194, 1200, 1220, 1258, 1294, 1309, and potentially any other bills that have been assigned to the Appropriations Committee, but for sure those. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow at 915 Appropriations Committee. Mm -hmm. Senator Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, colleagues, just uh, many of you may have not remembered earlier this morning we had the Cinco de Mayo celebration. As that's, that's right. Um, tomorrow, the Civic Center will be shut down for the, the Cinco de Mayo party that they do all weekend. So just to everybody to know that you might come in on the back roads to get in because Broadway and them will probably be closed. So just an FYI. Lisa? Lisa? In response to a request from the House for a conference committee on House Bill 1105, the Senate conferees are Senators Cutter, Chair, Fields, and Pelton R. on the first conference committee on House Bill 1105. Senator Cutter. Thank you, Mr. President. I request that the conference committee on House Bill 1105 be given permission to go beyond the scope of the differences between the two houses. The motion of the body is to grant permission to the conferees on the first conference committee on House Bill 1105 to go beyond the scope of the differences between the two houses. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Aye. The ayes have it and permission is granted. <laughs> Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the balance of the calendar layover until tomorrow, Saturday, May 6th. The motion is for the balance of the calendar delivered until tomorrow, Saturday, May 6th. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The balance of the calendar will deliver until tomorrow, Saturday, May 6th. Dora Leader Moreno. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, uh, 
In a second here, I'm going to make a motion to adjourn until tomorrow at 10 a.m. But before I do that, just wanted to announce that uh, we will have a relaxed dress code as well tomorrow. Uh, so you can wear casual but reasonable, please, Senator Priola. Casual but reasonable. Business casual, sure. Uh, with that, Mr. President, seeing no further announcements, I move that the Senate adjourn until tomorrow, Saturday, May 6th at 10 a.m. You heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The Senate will adjourn until 10 a.m. Majority Leader Moreno. You heard the motion. Um, all those in favor say aye. You already said aye. We will adjourn until 10 a.m. Saturday, May 6, 2023.